Good morning. We are live from Chamber. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It's uh, Monday again. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would like to call this meeting back to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands, and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors have marked this set, uh, this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, the Kurasu, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. We'll start with roll call as well. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay, right here. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans is running a bit behind. He sent me a note. Uh, so we, on Friday, we dealt with the uh, referral motion and uh, that was not approved. And uh, so at this time, uh, I would now invite a council member to put first reading of Charter Bylaw 20001 and 21001 on the floor. I will move first reading of Charter Bylaw 20001 and Charter Bylaw 21001. Second. Thank you. And now that we have Charter bylaws on the floor for first reading. I recommend that we move to deal with any potential amendments, uh, questions of administration, and hold on, hold off voting on each amendment until council is aware of all potential amendments. So now floor is open for uh, anyone to have any amendments. or questions on amendments that they are thinking of making. Please, go ahead. Councilor Nack. So I just yeah, wanted to, you, I think you answered it, so I could ask questions right now about amendments I'm thinking of making, yeah. potentially yeah. as amendment or subsequent, just yeah. to get Absolute. clarification. Absolute. Absolute. I, Absolute. I know I've been hypothetically asking questions, the yeah. questions of amendment, I think I wanted to yeah. be able so to So we that. can ask questions now about the, if you're thinking of making amendments, you can ask questions around those, or if you're thinking of making subsequent uh, emotions, you can ask about those and process Great. thank it. you. So yeah. um, I had th uh, a couple things that I wanted to ask specifics about. One related to height, we've talked a, a lot about height already. So if I were, I've been debating a, a, an amendment that would look, and I've tweaked it in the last little bit based off the discussion, is that we were hoping to have some type of contextual height conversation. So for example, if somebody's looking to build a single family home beside a bungalow, maybe we set that at, so here's the draft of what I would have written and then I'll let you share your thoughts. So the administration provide draft amendments on subsection 4.1.6 of section 2.10 uh, of Charter Bylaw 2001 to consider, number one, a maximum building height of 8.9 meters for a single family home when adjacent to an existing bungalow. Number two, a maximum building height of 10 meters for all other residential uses in the RS zone when adjacent to an existing bungalow. And number three, a maximum building height of, t of 12 meters in the RS zone when adjacent to a home with a height of 8.9 meters or more. So appreciate contextual is something you've been less excited about. Um, my big question is, 
when would that work be able to come back? Because uh, to me, that's the biggest one, and can that come back in the first quarter if I were to make it as a subsequent versus as an amendment? Yes, Councillor Neck, we could bring something like that in the first quarter and, and would suggest as a subsequent motion would allow the opportunity to provide some analysis yeah, and which, options related to, to the motion. Which is, yeah, what I was going to ask, because I mean, I, I use the term bungalow, but you might want to put in a height number, because if you have a seven meter high bungalow, probably less relevant than a four and a half meter high bungalow. Um, this would come back to a committee meeting first still as well, would it, would any of these types of things? Yeah, I think that would be um, what we would do in terms of a report like that that would have options and analysis around uh, addressing the motion. Okay. Um, I would suggest if there was something a little bit more definitive in terms of the clarity on direction, that's maybe one that we could bring directly to public hearing. Okay, yeah, and I think that one I'd almost rather have a bit of conversation to understand your feedback and, and thought, uh, thoughts on that. Um, so it's flipping then to one if I was going to be more specific, like on the uh, requirements for minimum tree requirements for a narrow lot, if I wanted to keep it at two instead of one, you probably wouldn't need to do a separate report. You could bring that as an amendment if, if council was willing to agree to that. Yeah, I think that would be the case. Okay. And again, that one would be fairly simple. One could be in the first quarter, I'm thinking. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, then the other, the other one I was thinking of it related to notice on Class A permits. Um, essentially, what, if something is being a permitted development, still providing notification. I'm torn on whether we should actually go to sort of explore what options are or if we should just move to doing it. it uh, so I, I wouldn't mind your feedback. I appreciate you're trying to you know, remove red tape and trying to simplify. At the same time, I, I think I have heard from folks the desire to to be aware, even if they can't affect change, that they would rather hear. So your thought on, on a report to say, give us options versus just go do it. <laughs> That's so the report um, would allow the opportunity for us to further the work we're doing around the technology okay. solution to opt in on notifications. So that might be worthwhile information for consideration before uh, doing an amendment to say notices are required for all development permits. I get it, because that work is happening right now as we speak. There's more to, so by next year, somebody should be able to opt in to notifications, not just next door, but in their neighborhood in a certain geographic area. So that might influence, A, how much it would actually be of an impact to even introduce it, and just a full, more full understanding? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Those were my three main things that jumped to mind. So I'm pretty much out of time anyways. Okay, thank you. I'm Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Any other questions, colleagues, about uh, the uh, amendments or subsequent you are thinking about uh, making? Uh, uh, sorry. Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry. Can you sign up, Councillor uh, uh, Paquette? I have not. I, I'm doing my best. I'm just letting you know. Oh, you're trying to sign up? Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. <coughs> Yeah, I just I have a very quick question related to Councillor Nack's question for the heights uh, of the building. Um, so I guess based on what answer I heard and to the question of Councillor Nax, for the for the like the lot and the internal lots and in the middle of the street, uh, yes, we can uh, in like a if there's some height change um, to the current bylaw, and uh, also for the uh, just the difference between the corner lot and the internal lot for the heights, so that type of change could be come to as an amendment or the uh, yes, uh, Council Rice, that could be a subsequent motion. Yes, subsequent to motion consider well. height and the context of a corner versus what's mid block. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, that's one question. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So another one is about uh, the um, uh, limit, limit of the lumber uh, or the percentage uh, for the certain like social services, uh, because we talk about decentralized some social services for that type of limited of the lumber. So that could be the subsequent or the amendment. Yes, I think that would be most appropriately as a, as a subsequent motion so that we could bring a report with options and analysis on the approach to uh, uh, further regulating those uses. 
Uh, okay. I think that's all from me right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have a, a quick question um, because I'm not sure it's clear in my mind uh, when it comes to development permits um, near, so I'll just back it up. So we've got the Ross apartments that were built and uh, they weren't really in keeping with uh, preserving uh, historical uh, heritage or historical resources and uh then we've got a few other things in the river valley that did the same now uh mayor so he made a motion about um indigenous consultation for development in the river valley especially um i think the concern was around archaeological sites and things like that or arche or uh, historical preservation of sites and so i'm just wondering if uh with that motion that the mayor made we need an added layer of protection in the bylaw, or if that motion essentially serves as that added layer of protection in the bylaw. Councillor, I think uh, when it comes to Indigenous uh, engagement and participation in the River Valley, it's clear that uh, it's needed um, and expected uh, for any project within it. Uh, not only that, uh, there is additional layers uh, and requirements uh, for historical resource impact assessments, which includes Indigenous engagement through the provincial process, which would come forth also be before the Council for any uh, private development uh, within the River Valley, uh, if there is. Uh, so in, in terms of that additional protection in the, the zoning bylaw itself, I, I don't think it's needed. Okay, just because um, I think it's uh, Section 3.16, A6 River Crossing Zone, um, item 6.4 states, and then it goes on, but it's only specified for the river crossing zone in the bylaw. That's correct, uh, Councillor. That, that's uh, a carry forward with, with some change to an existing regulation that, that uh, is in the current bylaw. Yeah, so uh, um, I, I guess that's my question. Does it make a material difference whether we expand it in the bylaw or is that all already covered with the mayor's motion? It's already covered with the mayor's motion. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Anyone else? Okay. So we, uh, that's it. I just hold on, hold on. I just want to make sure, so that, that concludes the questions to uh, administration on possible uh, uh, amendments, but we'll go to subsequent after the, if the reading, all third reading, three readings are passed. So at this time, uh, I will invite council members, if they have any clarifying questions to the members of the public or administration, members of the public that made presentations to council. If you do, please identify the speaker that you wanna ask a clarifying question to. Seeing none, I will open the floor at this time for members of council to speak. Am I right, Councillor? I uh, just want to. Uh, this is the process, right, Clerk? Mr. Mayor, you're you're on track. That's correct. Okay. You would speak to the to the motion on the floor if that's yeah. the yeah the will. Okay. So we uh -huh. have first reading. Or any any clarifying questions, Councillor Nack? Yeah, sorry. Just because I know this isn't uh, the the normal order. We've normally done it um, because the public hearing still isn't closed. So can I? Is it better to speak to it now or speak to it at second reading? I guess is the because the public hearing hasn't officially been, does it matter? Yeah, there's no issue either way, Councillor. You're, you're welcome to speak to emotions on the floor even during the public hearing. Okay, yeah. Um, if, if you desire, of course, you could you could pass this stage so you can close public hearing and then you could speak to the item. I just uh, didn't know if there first was. Reading on, uh, first reading doesn't determine your vote on second, so it, it's fine either way. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
All right, so we will speak to the uh, to the bylaws now, right? And once after that, we'll vote on the first reading. Then we'll close the public hearing. Then go to second reading and third reading, uh, or consideration for third reading. Correct. Okay. Yes. So you have to close public hearing before second reading. Yes. So got we it. Just find a work on your process. Got it. Okay. Time. All right. Okay. Okay. Now to speak, colleagues to speak. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rice. I do, I do, yeah, I do have one question to head administration, clarify questions. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, so I just wondering, and then for, from procedure perspective, because you and your uh, public hearing is close, public hearing first, then go to the first reading. So what is the specific the rationale or any procedure documents to support this? We do the first reading first and before close the public hearing. So maybe we can get some clarification and need the public records and for our public understand why is it different from normal process. So, so the, the normal process is to follow the requirements within the Municipal Government Act. It's a requirement of the act to close the public hearing prior to second reading. So my recommendation to council last week and through the previous memos is that council considers first reading. If first reading for any reason fails, then there's no need to discuss amendments. If first reading does pass and the public hearing is open, you still have the opportunity to make amendments. But again, it's up to council at what point they want to close the, excuse me, close the public hearing. It has to be before second reading. So the benefit is for for council members to make amendments if we do first reading first, not close the public hearing. The benefit right. is following the Municipal Government Act as the recommended process, and as long as the public hearing is closed before second reading, you are complying with the requirements within the Act. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, okay. Now to speak. Go ahead. All right. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, after we finished our four and a half long days last week, um, we had the opportunity to participate in a pipe ceremony and, and speak with some of our Indigenous elders. And, and that made me think of the, the seven generations. So looking back seven generations and looking forward seven generations, and I think I think we have to recognize what has gone in, the, got on in the past, um, and that just brings to mind um, my my own family, um, how my parents bought a home in, in 1957 in Fulton Place. They, um, I think it was just under fifteen thousand dollars. Now those properties around there are valued around somewhere around uh, five or six hundred thousand. And things have changed in that neighborhood. Um, where I used to run down the alley to go to my local school, where I used to be able to go swim at Hardesty Pool, um, go to go to the, the community rink and that. And but over time, um, there's been subtle densification in that area. There's been um, retirement residences uh, put up. There's um, there's there's nursing homes and lodges and that. So people can can you know, age in place, um, at least in the neighborhood that, that they're in. And I think, and, and, and even now there's becoming more um, densification with uh, multi-use uh, multi uh, buildings as well going in, uh, where, where we've got some commercial on the, the street level and, and residences above. Um, and, and so it, subtly over time that's been changing. And I think over that time as well, we've had some urban sprawl out into the southeast. Um, now kids are no longer able to run down the street to their local school. They're being bussed over into, into Fulton Place area um, to McNally and Austin O'Brien to go to high school. And only now we're, we're getting a new high school. 
Um, and, and it costs us money to also service those areas. Um, we're looking at snow removal now. Uh, we're looking at, um, you know, further further construction in that on our and, and maintaining our city roads. So I think now we have to look to the future, to those seven generations that are that are coming um, ahead or coming in, in, in line. So I think that this bylaw, along with the substantial completion that's being considered as well in the future, um, will help to reduce those costs, will help to reinvigorate um, those uh, those maturing neighborhoods and uh, so I am voting in favor of this bylaw thank you thank you councillor Wright councillor Tang great thank you very much uh, mr. mayor it has been a privilege to hear from so many Edmontonians of diverse backgrounds with your varying perspectives throughout this public hearing and from many of you who have written in, phoned in, had coffee conversations, heard your comments in passing, whatever that is, thank you. Our current zoning bylaw is outdated. So outdated that we are now finally getting a much needed upgrade on say the digital signage on public land with a renewal, which I have heard a lot of struggles about from leaks in my ward. Digital signage did not, exi did not exist 60 years ago, uh, which was the last time the bylaw had a major overhaul and now we're finally getting a policy that is up to date with 2023 standards. I think the same can be said about other aspects of this new zoning bylaw as well. It is a change, a major update, but it brings us in line with where we need to be today based on the future we want to see. A lot has been said this week, which has provided a basis for my decision, and I want to use my closing to address a few things. There were a lot of comments about zoning bylaw renewal being a developer-driven initiative. However, reflecting only on those who have come in to speak in support, and this last week was a snapshot in the five years of engagement. We saw a lot of students, uh, new homeowners and renters, newcomers to, Edmontonian, uh, to Edmonton, um, and we've also had some longtime homeowners as well, and all kinds of people, and I think this is significant. You know, in the last two years since the election, I have never seen this type of participation in support of something at council, not just zoning, but on anything. And I think it's unprecedented, and I think that says something. When it comes to hearing Edmontonians' perspectives, there is no singular voice we've learned. We have Edmontonians from all walks of life coming out to speak, and that is something to shine a light on rather than the common narrative that we have been hearing. This last week, we have also heard a lot about issues that I and Edmontonians are passionate about. Topophilia, as we've learned from one speaker, is about the love for a place, and I think that's something we all share, whether you support or don't support this bylaw renewal. Things like affordable housing, the climate, heritage, or even parking and green spaces, these are all important. However, zoning bylaw renewal is not a silver bullet solution for all of these, or necessarily even the best tool to address them. I am grateful for the diverse perspectives shared and the great ideas that people have brought forward that we have all noted. My key takeaway is that these are important to Edmontonians. There is urgency to take action and as a council, we will continue to prioritize policy advocacy to other um, levels of investment and investments here and to listen to the community to continue that amendment process that will be ongoing. The actions on these does not end today. Instead, I think myself and many of my council colleagues are committed to continuing to pick up the threats and seeing some of the expedited actions, which I hope many of you will continue to lend your voice to and share your thoughts on. And I wanna talk a little bit about this point around um, a juxtaposition between density and sprawl, which came up a lot. Um, and I wanna comment on that a little bit as a counselor who represents established neighborhoods in Millwoods, but also many new greenfield development neighborhoods south of the Hende. You know, in my conversations with residents in those communities, um, people are moving not just because of the availability of housing in these neighborhoods, but also because of affordability, of greater opportunities for intergenerational living, of a proximity to amenities and services, and in some cases where their community is, whether it's faith-based or ethnocultural. And I'm not sure some all of our Edmontonians are seeing these kinds of opportunities right now in our redeveloping areas. So I don't see this discussion as good or bad, or, um, but I do think it's about growth. Um, and at the rate we're growing, we need smarter development and land use policy. And it's not about doing one thing over another, for example, densifying only in Expo land or Blatchford. 
uh, or leveraging the tools and plans we have outlined in the city plan. I think this zoning bylaw renewal is an opening to that, to make our zoning more inclu inclusionary um, and see what many have referenced as a character of na neighborhoods to grow, to diversify, and to continue to welcome people in. And so in closing, this is the first major project of city plan imp implementation, and there will be several more like it, like district planning. It's not a silver bullet. Um, however, we will continue to explore the other options, whether through policy, through funding, through advocacy, to address all of the issues that, that have come up. Um, so thank you to all who have joined us this week, to all who have listened, uh, who have engaged with ZBR prior to this hearing, and also to our amazing administration for their tireless efforts and expertise. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I wanna start with, with gratitude as well. Uh, gratitude for administration in, in their work in this. I know it's been very, very challenging over the last four years and to take such a daunting legal document and try to make it accessible to the public and try to help the public, bring the public along on this journey. And I think the conversations that I've had in the last few months around zoning, and especially even since I would say the tipping point was the last urban planning committee in June, has demonstrated to me that Edmontons really do care about the use of their of, of land in Edmonton and how we grow and how we develop. And it's often not uncommon in a public engagement process for people to get more involved once it becomes more real and less conceptual. And that's the reality of engagement in anything. You see it with major capital projects just as much as, as this. So I'm not surprised to have seen more people become aware closer to this hearing, more people to become engaged closer to this hearing, and for a diversity of perspectives to continue to be shared. I also wanna provide gratitude to all of the people that took the time to come to the public hearing and share their thoughts, all of the people that engaged with administration in any format that they were able to prior to the public hearing, because we know as well as anyone, it is a legislative process, but it is not the most accessible legislative process for people, especially when you're talking about four days of 12 hour meetings. Most people do not have that kind of time and capacity. To, to wait their turn within that context. But a lot of people engaged online. We heard the stats about the number of people that engaged in the Engage Edmonton website, about the amount of people that in, engaged through uh, targeted workshops, through one-on-one -on -one, uh, calls to our planners, because I think we're forgetting that too. There was a lot of calls and emails that this team also fielded on a one-on-one -on -one basis. and all of the people that emailed or called my office or other council's offices throughout this process. I'm just so grateful for everybody that took the time to share their perspective because it just shows how much Edmontonians truly do care about the city and want the best for the city. And I was really awestruck in, in both all of the conversations I've had leading up to and during the public hearing uh, with the commonality amongst people that were both in support or opposition to the the bylaw. I think there's a lot of strong, clear vision and direction around making sure that this is a city that grows sustainably, whatever sustainably means, and that's a, late, a laden word, but that's definitely something that came up, that we are um, creating an equitable city, a city where everyone can have opportunity and opportunity throughout the city, uh, not just on the margins, but throughout. And I was really humbled by how much people shared their personal stories as well. Uh, their personal stories of uh, challenges with finding housing, of, of transportation because they have to live farther away, stories of living in their home for 70 
60 years and loving their neighborhood and that neighborhood is especially don't want to leave and every other story in between that tapestry that was shared um you know, I, I think for me, I will support this bylaw and I'll support this bylaw because one of the things that uh, really, for me, stood out was within these stories is an, that what is the Edmonton that we want to be and what is the Edmonton we want to grow up in. And we also heard that this isn't perfect. There can always be improvements. And I get the lack of trust because traditionally administration and public bodies haven't been the most iterative in nature. Uh, but there is a commitment from us to be iterative in this. I think you'll see through subsequent coming up, the work that will continue as a result of this bylaw, but also you will be able to share some of the work that's already uh, progressed that br were brought up about concerns. So I think for those reasons, I'm comfortable with this at this point and, and would encourage my colleagues to support. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you so much. This bylaw in front of us represents a radical simplification of our development regulations. The bylaw has removed dozens of redundant rules that didn't add value to our communities, but did create a lot of headaches. And that's not just for builders, but for any homeowner who has tried to add an extension, build a deck, or add a basement suite to their home. Everyone investing in Edmonton now, whether that investment is big or small, will find a much more streamlined set of rules to do so. Not only does this simplification help during the application process, it will also make it easier to continue to evolve the zoning bylaw, something we know from the past week uh, is very important. The current bylaw has so many overlaps and complexity that even making simple changes can pose huge challenges. The proposed bylaw provides a much more nimble and responsive framework allowing us to respond to the challenges and opportunities we might not have even see now. The new, by, the new structure of the bylaw alone is enough to celebrate, but the content is also very exciting. For the first time in decades, Edmontonians wishing to invest in our community can see a straight line between the vision we've set for ourselves in city plan and the rules that manage how we grow as a city. For too long, we've developed aspirational policy documents, uh, but not done the work of embedding those into our regulatory framework. I think that that's changed with this new proposed bylaw. There's now a clear logic between the future we want to see and the rules we have in place to build it. Now, none of this is to say that the work is done and there are a number of elements that I personally think we need to evolve sooner rather than later. Um, and there, there's some sub subsequent motions that I have prepared uh, to help to ensure that we continue to move our regulations uh, in line with our vision of the city. But as pointed out by my colleague, Councillor Paquette, passing the bylaw today will ensure that we actually have a bylaw that's, that's easy to amend and evolve, um, one that's much easier to work with as we continue this ongoing work. Now, I spoke initially about the radical simplification of the regulations, but I as expect a much more incremental impact in our community. Change in our neighborhoods moves at the pace of individual property owners choosing to sell or redevelop their properties. The transform transformational change that we want to see is just the accumulation of many small steps taken over many years. This zoning bylaw provides us a starting point that will make these steps easier to take, less likely to have stumbles, um, and hopefully encourage even more. Uh, I you know, truly want to thank each and every speaker who came out not only last week, but to all of the engagement events, who have written in, called in, um, and participated in a variety of ways over the past five years. Um, your insights and concerns have already made the bylaw better in terms of you know, even just the changes we saw from May until now, and I know we'll continue to do so. Uh, for me personally, it was incredibly heartening to hear the broad, consistent, and strident passion shared by so many last week about the imperative of climate action and housing affordability. Not only are these issues something we continue to look to embed further into our zoning regulations, uh, I'll really carry that forward with the other levers that we have to affect change in those areas. Uh, what I've heard over the past week is a reminder to me that we are on the right track and we just need to go further and faster. Lastly, I want to share my heartfelt appreciation and congratulations with the team who brought this significant piece of work forward. It is truly a generational accomplishment. Um, and I applaud the exceptional work that you have all uh, so diligently done over the past five years. Huge congratulations. 
um, and I encourage all my colleagues to support this important change. Um, and thank you again to everyone who made this possible. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you. I'm not going to speak very long. I'll just be repeating what others have said. I, I uh, did want to say, though, that entering in this exercise, uh, I had heard a lot of the concerns that were expressed through the public hearing. I think what we heard through the public hearing was color, was anecdote, was the sand around the pebbles, but we, it, essentially it boiled down to a number of um, fairly common concerns about what's going to happen in the small residential zone. There is so much more at work here in this renewal. Uh, and the analogy I've been using is that if you imagine this 800 page tome where the cover has been torn off and some of the pages are dog-eared and there's pages glued over pages and there's yellow stickies hanging out and folded over pages and some of them are torn out, that's our zoning bylaw. It's unworkable. It's been a frustration here for several years where uh, it's, it's almost been pick your overlay, depending on whether you liked the project or you didn't like the project, because there's been so many conflicting policies and, and works that have um, been around for so long. So we needed to do this. We needed to streamline uh, how we're going to manage development in the city of Edmonton. And this, as has been mentioned, this is the first piece. This is not the last piece. This is the end of the beginning, but it's certainly not the beginning of the end. We've got a, a many year journey that is going to continue to, as Councillor um, Rutherford said, you know, be this iterative process of, of ever renewing and ever updating and ever enhancing. But we've got to get started. Uh, and, and, and this isn't the perfect analogy, but Henry Ford once said that if he had asked people what uh, he should build for a car, people would have said a faster horse. You know, we've got, to, we've got to move to a different paradigm. We've got to move to a different set of analogies. We've got to move to a different mindset. There are subsequent that, uh, that I want to see moved, whether I move them or other people move them, that are going to tweak and enhance and perhaps slow the pace, if they're passed, of just what this uh, zoning bylaw has in store for the small residential zone. Uh, I think we might pull back on a few little things and, and just, you know, ease our way into it instead of jumping in. But for all the concerns that I heard, very generally speaking, maybe not necessarily the specific you know, photo or the specific zone or the specific lot, but generally speaking, the concerns that were raised when we asked questions on Friday about them, the answer came back, well, we're already working on that. Well, we already have a report coming on that. Well, we've already started the analysis of that. Well, we've already, we've already, we've already, we've already. Um, you know, the idea of going back and doing more engagement and delaying a year, we just went through a massive five day, five very long day public engagement process. Uh, I'm not sure what else there is to learn and what else uh, there is to be offered. So let's get going on the work now. That's, uh, that's very much my philosophy. I, I don't, this isn't perfect. There are some tweaks, but, uh, but it's time to get on with it. And uh, I think that what this does in terms of red tape reduction frees up some resources and some time and some opportunity to actually go and do that work in a more meaningful way. So uh, I know not everybody is going to be happy with that. Not everybody is going to be happy that, uh, that this first piece passes. To those, I say, you know, continue to engage. There will be other opportunities to raise your specific particular point. Uh, we heard about, you know, concerns about district planning. Well, we're going to talk about that. We heard, th you know, questions about ecological responsibility. We're going to talk about that. This isn't the end. This is the beginning. And uh, I really uh, encourage my colleagues to pass it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. So I spent a lot of time this weekend uh, reflecting on things. It was a very nostalgic weekend for me. Um, but, but why I enjoyed that opportunity is I, I reminded myself that when we're making major decisions like this, we can't just focus on what we talked about at the last week. We can't just look at the you know, number of speakers for or against and make a decision based off what that was. We have to actually go through what have we been hearing from people over the years. And we have to remember that our decision is, that we're here today is what is the best decision for all Edmontonians? Not just one community, not just one ward for what is best across the city. And so I'm thinking back over the years of, of the conversations that I've had. I think about the conversations that I've had with seniors, as an example, who live in mature neighborhoods and many who 
um, we've talked about what will happen when they can't maintain their home anymore and where they're going to move to if they wanted to live within the community that they've raised their families in. And there's not a lot of choice for those folks in most of the mature neighborhoods, for sure the ones that I represent. Um, I think about when I have the chats at seniors' residences and how those, the, the seniors in those buildings feel very differently about the, the, the situation because they've already had to go through that experience. I think about the younger families that live in the ward I represent and how many of them had no choice but to move outside the inner ring road or, or even more likely outside the Hende because there wasn't housing choice for them, for their family needs, similar to what Councillor Tang was talking about. There's different uh, family makeups now that need different things that actually often can't be met in many of the neighborhoods that, uh, that we have today. Um, I've also talked to some who the reason they moved there is because that was the only affordable choice. Trying to buy uh, a newer home, uh, your starter home, your first time home. Um, right now it's, it's a lot easier to do it in the new neighborhoods I represent than in the old neighborhoods I represent. And so I, I keep reflecting on that and how those things can begin to be addressed but not be fully addressed by the work that's before us today. As, as others have said, this will not solve every problem I just listed. Um, this will not change everything overnight, but it begins to provide an opportunity for some of those solutions to start to take effect. I also appreciate, as others have said, you know, I heard from those who have concerns. I heard not just from those in opposition during the public hearing, I received a lot of emails from people who have very specific concerns about what that means for them, particularly in most cases in their mature neighborhood. I didn't really hear anyone, uh, any big issues coming from those in those other neighborhoods. And I think there are very real and very legitimate considerations. It's part of why I just asked about a, a series of subsequents that I think need to be made. Things like height. If you are that bungalow beside a new home, do we have the right mix right now with how the bylaws current written, currently written? And I actually don't think we're, we're the, where we need to be. So I think there do need to be changes. Um, because we can't forget about those very real impacts for somebody living in that type of environment. And, and we're providing more opportunity um, but we have to try to find that, that balance. And it's, it's never gonna be easy because for some, there are some who just don't want more density in their neighborhood. And, and I appreciate that that is a uh, legitimate perspective. It was about 10 to 15% of the emails I got. Um, and I'm gonna just agree to disagree with those folks because I look back to the populations as I was doing throughout the public hearing in 1971 and, and we, our, our mature neighborhoods are far less populated today than they were 50 years ago when our population was a third of the size. And so I think we have that opportunity to create more vibrant mature communities. We even heard some of the stories from people about their mature communities and those businesses that were vibrant and that used to exist and that don't today. And so I, I think about that when I'm reflecting on whether to support this or not. So there's not enough time to talk about everything. I'm running low on time here, but I, I will be supporting this, noting that there's more work to do. I've got subsequent that need to be discussed, need to be discussed soon. Um, but as I reflect on this and I think about all of the people I've talked with over the years, not just those in the public hearing process, um, I think this is going to help make things better. This will begin to move us in a different direction, in a better direction, in a direction that actually returns us a little bit to what we used to have 50 years ago in many of our mature communities. So I'll be supporting this, noting that there's a lot of work to still do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Rice. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Sohi. I, I would like to start uh, to thank um, everyone and who participates this important process, and no matter uh, is from our public members and also uh, our administration and the team work on this. So your hard work and definitely highly appreciate and recognized. Um, so I think for me, uh, this is a really, really difficult decision. Um, like Councilor Nack mentions in the weekend, uh, reflect all the uh, what we heard. And I, I would like to say, and then in the past weekend, I actually, I put lots, lots of effort 
and to reflect not only and from public hear, uh, hearing what we heard, also reflect past to my personal experience, what I heard, and as a counselor, and either and from the word constituents I spoke to in the past two years, or, or the emails and the people phone calls. So I, re I, I really want to say, I understand the importance and why we are doing these exercises. Why this five years work we are doing here. We have a specific purpose and that purpose is actually is aligned with our city's plan and also aligned and we want this city as everyone's city to be built and to for all people, for all the people and for everyone. So last week and we heard 293 speakers and in those two, 293 speakers, we have 159 uh, want to have more meaningful engagement. Yeah, we have 134 people in favor for this bylaw, but still um, identify some, some gaps. And in this bylaw, I would like to see some improvement before we get into, into the procession to implement or even to approve. And we heard very clear, um, maybe we can do something like gradually instead of the big step. And because the goal, we all have the same goal. We want our city move forward to be built and everybody and it feels happy to live in this city and we call the home. And then also we, we heard lots of concerns, uh, also lots of um, the gaps and in the bylaw, we still want to make amendments or change and before we approve. And to me, that is actually refract. Do we take the proactive approach or we take reactive approach? I strongly believe as a representative, as a policy maker and a governor here, any policy change is not to create a possible program, problems and is more intentionally to resolve the problems. So I'm a little bit afraid. So if we move forward right away right now, and some gap and may cause certain risks and without the mitigation strategy already identified or developed in the place, I'm a little bit afraid about that. And also I think this is actually also is responsible steps our public expect our council to take to refract that. See, here is some gaps and how we fill those gaps and before the problem raised. So that is a proactive approach. And, and also I consider as a representative, that is a responsible approach to address our public concerns, to heard their voice, to make sure they feel like, yes, we build our city together. So I want to end that, but thank you everyone. I want to say one more time. Thank you, Councilor Reyes. Councilor Hamilton. Thank you, um, I'll be brief. Uh, in part because I think some of my colleagues have said, uh, sort of encapsulated the last week and the last five years so well. Um, I think on a very technical level, this zoning bylaw renewal is about the size of the box and the uses that go in the box and how that box essentially conforms to the, or relates to the land around it. Um, and I, uh, I'm eager to hear the subsequent that um, my colleagues may have with respect to 
how you find out about the box or how you um, uh, how you provide utilities to the box, so to speak. Um, and and I also uh, appreciate the conversation the conversation that's happened around built heritage, and that's that's always really tricky. Believe me, I understand um, because we can cherish a look and feel to our neighborhoods that um, may or may not represent the architectural history of, of our city um, and sometimes represents the architectural history of another city or another time when, before our city existed. But I digress. I think um, having listened with an open mind and I emphasize that over the last week, there were moments where you know, uh, some of the speakers got me where I wondered if this was the correct direction for us to go in at this time. But one of the most persuasive things um, that that I made note of over the last week was that some of the areas in our city have been zoned RF3 for decades and that those neighborhoods don't look like Oliver or Garneau. They look like Grosvenor and Ritchie. And those are neighborhoods where there's still street parking, there's still single detached homes, and the schools are full of students. And there's also townhouses and uh, low rise apartments and duplexes, and there's local cafes and doctor's offices and pubs. Um, and I recognize that not everybody wants to live in Ritchie and not everyone wants to live in Grosvenor, um, nor does everyone want to live in Oliver or Garneau or, I don't know, the Hamptons or uh, Summerside. Um, but there is a neighborhood for everyone, uh, I think. And so much of this conversation in the last week has been about making sure that there's a neighborhood for everyone. We also heard about people who um, have been, who, who are afraid. And they're afraid for a number of reasons. But I think something that struck me is that there's people for whom development doesn't mean new and fresh. It means that they get rent evicted um, and that their rent goes up. And I also don't know that the affordable housing argument is, is that good when it comes to zoning. Um, I actually think it's, it's a distraction, but I don't think we get to housing affordability without the optionality that comes with um, less restrictive zoning. So the last thing I'll say is that good neighborhoods are not made up by setbacks and separation distances, but by people who make that neighborhood worth living in. And uh, I do appreciate so much over the last week hearing from people who genuinely love their neighborhood. Um, I don't know that this is going to produce the best results for everyone. But I do know that the system that we have isn't working. Um, and it's not working for our goals around climate. And it's not working for our goals around housing affordability. Um, and it's time to start that process fresh. So with that, uh, obviously, I'm supporting the zoning bylaw renewal. But I felt it was important to acknowledge that um, a lot of people came and shared their concerns about where we're taking them. and. Um, and I think that all of us will be keeping that in mind going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, the really ironic thing is I agree with so much of everything everyone said. You know, this this is very difficult because I agree with so much that I'm hearing, yet I, I seem to have a different opinion. Uh, and, you know, I see land development as one of the most important duties that we have as council. And uh, that's why I've always liked the team effort with developers, with builders, with council. I felt more council had more of an oversight. Um, and even though I know a lot of work went into this and I know you did a really good job, there are still parts missing that I feel are really important that I would like to support this, but there are aspects I need to see in there in order to give my full support. Um, and, you know, I heard about uh, communities losing vibrancy. Uh, even though the infrastructure is the same, the populations have decreased, but that's because times change, right? Family structures change, 
uh, mindsets change. So I realize that we have to change with that as well and that, that will include uh, having different choices of housing. And uh, so I, I understand that. But unfortunately, I, I won't be able to support this, although I would like to. There are just too many aspects at this point for me to be able to support it. So thank you very much for the work you did. I appreciate it. Thank you, Constable Principe. Constable Jans. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the Assembly for um, tolerating my uh, tr my lack of punctuality this morning. Um, it's uh, I want to give a special shout out to ETS for getting us alive on time. I was sitting up close near the driver and was hearing about you know jackknife bus here, stuck bus here, etc. And seeing all of the people gliding through intersections this morning, it uh, it really was quite chaotic. And uh, I hats off to the ETS team for for all that they do every day in and day out, especially on snow days. Which is my segue to this: what fundamentally we're talking about is a more compact, a more sustainable, a more efficient land use pattern for the city of Edmonton. And initially, I have to admit, when I read what was proposed here, I thought it was um, a huge change. And more and more as we've gone through this and we've dug into it, it seems much more truly like a, a status quo change that I think one of my colleagues just said, the city could end up looking a little bit more Bonnie Dune, a little bit more Richie. And when you look at those communities and how, how uh, they have turned over going from you know, 20, 20 years ago when I moved to Edmonton, we were told, don't cross the tracks, don't go to Ritchie. It's, you know, the, the closed school sits there like a tombstone. It's a it's a dying neighborhood. And now to see it's one of our most thriving and animated community leagues is, is quite excited. So um, when I think about uh, having our city services and a more efficient service delivery, a more sustainable city financially for all of us, when I think about the climate, the impact that we can have by giving people options to drive less and to have more housing choices. Uh, when I think about the ability to have a more affordable cost of life because your your utilities are lower when you live in a you know a triplex or a, a different uh, a different housing form than just a single family detached homes. Uh, that's that's quite exciting. So overall, I would I would acknowledge like my colleagues, there's still some things I'd certainly like to look at um, as further work over the next um, few years and maybe even few decades. I think we we um, have a uh, a piece here that. Um, we're improving our zoning, but we still have a long way to go in terms of enforcement, in terms of our building code, in terms of our um, uh, our work with the, prov the province and the federal government to electrify everything and to move away from burning fossil fuels. Um, but these are not things that we cannot, we can contemplate here today. This isn't first reading. This is this is after work. So there's no no need to let this after work get in the way of what we're doing here today. So, um, you know, I I got into really got into civic politics around 2007 with the Don Iveson City Council campaign. And at the time, the slogan was smart growth for Ward 5. And then in 2010, when I was running for the school board, it was all about stopping school closures. And fundamentally, we're talking about we need to fill in our mature neighborhoods again and bring, and you know, you can't do that if you don't have a regulatory framework that makes sense and makes it a little bit easier to bring in the kinds of choices and development that people want. So. Um, Really, I I, uh, I see this going back, and even before before dawn, we had councillors kicking tires about smart growth in the 90s and 2000s. So really, this is part of a long journey of the city of Edmonton to try and change our land use pattern. And and uh, it may feel very sudden, but um, as as I look back at the the history and the writing here, it's been it's it's been a long way to date. So um, what's that saying about something? It's you know it's not the end of the beginning, it's the beginning of the beginning, and that's kind of where we are now. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Paquette. Well, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I was uh, not going to speak to this, but uh, apparently uh, everyone else is. So, uh, it may be important for me to add my voice to uh, the conversation uh, just for the sake of uh, representation. So we've had an incredibly robust engagement process um, and with something that uh, has garnered as much um, interest as the zoning bylaw renewal, that's a good thing. That's a great thing actually. Um, and in that engagement, it's going to be very difficult for everyone to feel like exactly what they want 
is exactly what's going to happen. Um, we've heard of uh, the phrase, you know, blanket zoning. Um, it's not uh, not preferred, but the the alternative is um, creating bespoke blankets for every single person who has come to speak and they have their individual concerns, which I think in the aggregate are really, really important and have actually served to change this bylaw and will change it further over time. Um, in two election cycles, the number one ask I received from residents was simply this, I want a walkable neighborhood. I wish we had a bakery or a cafe on the corner. I wish we could have a small town feel here. In a city of over a million people, that can sometimes be hard to accommodate. But the city plan was the move toward that and had incredible amount of support. The next step obviously has been the zoning bylaw renewal that will make the city plan actionable. And after this, there will be uh, further bylaw uh, reviews and on this particular bylaw, there will be a number of amendments that come forward, um, or at least subsequent to amend the bylaw. And that won't stop at the end of these proceedings. That will go on year after year after year. Um, there's been a number of analogies already made about the old zoning bylaw, but I would say it's akin to having an outlet. In 19, you know, in the 1960s, and it's a good outlet. You, you know, you you want that outlet because you've got a lamp and a TV to plug in. But over time, you know, as things mature and evolve, you, you need more plug-ins. So you put on an attachment to that outlet and then more and more and more. And finally, you've got like this like monster of attachments all over the place for that one outlet. Something's got to give. And so we're basically redesigning that to accommodate modern needs. The alternative is not to do that. And what we end up with is uh, a system that is increasingly difficult to navigate, increasingly unsure. And what the CBR does is it provides surety for everyone and a new template on which to grow a better city. We have additional issues. We've got climate change to contend with and greenhouse gas emissions. We've got the cost of growth. One thing that we can continue to do, but we can't because the, the, the city plan, but one of the th real dangers was just growing and growing and growing into our agricultural land. Problem with that is once you remove that topsoil, it's gone, it's done. It will never come back. 10,000 years of soil development wiped away. And I also heard from the residents I represent, they want that to stop. We have, there's also the cost of service delivery. And the more we spread, the more those costs increase. We've got to take responsible action on that growing cost. This is one of the ways to do it. Is the CBR a catch-all and a cure-all for all our ills? No, absolutely not. But it's one piece of the puzzle. There are a lot of fears about this zoning bylaw. But again, we've had RF3 for a number of years in different areas. We know what to expect. This will be a change, but a slow-moving change. <clears throat> and I'll support it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Picard. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Yes, I have the chair. Thank you. Uh, I am so appreciative of uh, all the speakers that signed up to uh, share their perspectives and the, uh, and the thousands of Edmontonians that have engaged in the, uh, in the city plan process as well as the zoning bylaw renewal process. Uh, I want to, want to say that your voices and perspe perspectives are important. And I'm so inspired to see the passion and love for this city that we are so fortunate to call home. Uh, I appreciate that some Edmontonians feel unsure about this change. I heard several speakers express their concerns during the public hearing. 
I want to say that I hear you. To me, this is not one and done policy. There must be strong accountabilities to ensure the concerns that Mentonians raised are consistently addressed. I also want to appreciate the hard work and commitment of our city administration. The passion and the care that you have put into this proposed zoning bylaw is evident. And I want to use this opportunity to express my deep gratitude to the thought, energy, and the hard work that you have invested into this project. I'm going to support the zoning bylaw renewal for the following reasons. This bylaw supports affordability. It makes it easier for affordable housing developers and seniors housing developers to build the housing our community needs by reducing unnecessary red tape. It provides the opportunity for Edmontonians to attain different housing types for their needs across the city. Whether it's a backyard suite, apartment, duplex, single family home, or any other innovative housing design. I recognize this bylaw is only one tool to influence housing affordability. We have other policies and initiatives that we have been using over the last two and more years to build more affordable housing in our city. This bylaw also promotes fiscal responsibility. Increasing density throughout the city helps us to optimize existing city infrastructure like public transit, public libraries, roads, and recreation centers. This helps your taxes go further and reduces pressures on property taxes as our city grows. This bylaw furthers our commitment to climate change and supports what our city's youth are asking us to do to ensure a livable future. A compact urban form reduces overall emissions and provides better connectivity to active transportation and public transit. Ultimately, this bylaw supports building compact, inclusive, and healthy communities where residents have access to various housing options and amenities to achieve a vibrant neighborhood and local economy. I can't wait to live in a city that this bylaw will help us create. It will be one where families can grow, youth can thrive, and seniors can age in place. I look forward to hearing the subsequent motions that I suspect will address some of the gaps we have heard identified in the last few days of this hearing. Once again, thank you to everyone for your participation. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and, uh, and views with us. And, uh, and we will continue to work with you to, to ensure that we're building a community for everyone, that we're building an element for all of us. Okay. With that, I will go to Councilor Salvador to close. Sure. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I want to start by thanking administration for your hard work and dedication. I hope you take a moment to pause and reflect on what you've accomplished. Uh, renewing a zoning bylaw, quite frankly, seems like an impossible task. Um, and it's not often that you get to contribute to a, such a significant body of work over your career, uh, but you've done it. And you should be very proud of the contribution that you've made to our city and the lasting legacy um, that you will leave. I also want to thank all of the Edmontonians who took the time to participate in this conversation, whether that's been over the last five years or five days. I especially want to thank those individuals and groups who work to enhance civic literacy and understanding in a thoughtful, engaging way that generated meaningful dialogue. The turnout that we experienced last week was remarkable. Uh, it was truly inspiring and speaks to the young, educated and growing nature of our city. That was a rare sight here at City Hall and I think it's also a reflection of the excellent work the Zoning Bylaw Renewal Team has put in to engage broadly and reach those who might not have otherwise participated in this process and who might have actually been historically marginalized by this very bylaw. It's an embodiment of the equity-centered approach that you took to the zoning bylaw renewal from the beginning. Now, when I think about some of the themes that came through during the public hearing, we heard over and over from speakers that zoning and density is not a silver bullet. It won't solve climate change, housing affordability, or the city's infrastructure deficit. And yeah, it won't solve these deeply entrenched problems, but will it help? Absolutely. There is no single tool that will fully tackle these issues. And I think it's unrealistic and, and unwise to wait for perfection while students are sleeping in cars because they can't find housing, while record numbers of newcomers are trying to find their footing, while higher emissions continue to be baked in by the current bylaw, while our vacancy rate is set to hit record lows, 
and while more and more Edmontonians fall into core housing need. We have a known policy solution to implement right here, right now in front of us that will start to achieve better results compared to the status quo. As one of our speakers said, imperfect action is better than inaction and the proposed bylaw is a massive improvement. Turning to affordable housing, we know that increasing housing supply reduces the market price of housing overall. Will it uniformly resolve housing affordability across the spectrum? No, which is why we need to continue investing in true social housing alongside all orders of government. And while Edmonton might not be facing the same pressures as Toronto, Vancouver, or Calgary, uh, we are not immune. And we are in a unique position to be able to take proactive steps to mitigate that. Looking at climate, we know that land use is one of the biggest levers we have to fight climate change. Is it enough? No, which is why this council is already funding work that will take us closer to our climate goals and why we continue to advocate for collective action. And it's been interesting to hear some of the back and forth on whether this change is revolution or evolution, transformational or incremental. And what I have landed on is that it's possible to take bold and transformative policy and regulatory steps and still have to wait generations for those changes to fully bear fruit. The new zoning bylaw is simultaneously bold and transformative while being incremental and measured. That is the nature of land use planning and that tells me we're on the right track. It really is a process of constantly making and remaking the city that we all love. I would encourage everyone who was engaged in this conversation to get involved in related conversations like growth management, River Valley modernization, district planning, substantial completion, um, as that, that is a place where a lot of the concerns we heard can be directly addressed. Finally, as many have pointed out, this bylaw is not, not perfect, but perfect was never the goal. It's simply not achievable. Uh, we will never have consensus on every element of this bylaw. We will never reach a point where everyone is satisfied. And that is just the uncomfortable reality of municipal governance and city building. What we've asked administration to do is to move forward with focus through that discomfort to arrive at a destination that is better than the last and to set a foundation from which we can build a more urban, healthy, prosperous and climate resilient city. That foundation will enable us to make iterative changes and improvements as we go. And in that sense, I think administration has more than delivered on what they've been asked to do as we journey towards the vision outlined in the city plan. Uh, so I look forward to seeing us grow closer towards that vision and we'll be supporting this bylaw today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Salvador. So please vote. we go. We have all the votes. Display the votes please. That has passed 11 to 2. Uh, Council Salvador, can you please move the closing of the public hearing? I'll move closure of public hearing. Second. Thank you. Please vote. Sorry, I was looking down. Can I just confirm that was Councilor Stevenson? Councilor Stevenson, yes. Seconded it. Sorry. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councilor Salvador. I'll move second reading. Councillor Stevenson, Second. please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of Charter Bylaw 2001 and Charter Bylaw 21001. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the consideration for third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. All right. Uh, consideration is granted. I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw. 2001 and Charter Bylaw 21001. Second. 
you please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Final reading is carried. Okay. Now we are going to go to subsequent motions. Okay. Councillor, please sign up. Okay, somebody here. Oh, here you go. There's a big list. <laughs> Councillor. May I just ask, may you please go slowly? We have a number that we just want to make sure that we're on the right page. Okay, and can you clarify the process? So the process be that uh, uh, all, I'll actually refer to my speaking notes. <laughs> just hold on. Okay, so the, uh, uh, I, we would, each council will make, members will make their uh, subsequent motions and we will uh, uh, discuss those and uh, debate those, then we put them on hold, right? Or uh, then we'll go to the next subsequent motion, do the same process, uh, put them on hold. When all the amendments, uh, subsequent motions have been made and debated, then we'll bring them back all together and we will speak to all of them at once. Is that good? Uh, one, yeah, one subsequent at a time, debate, discuss, pause, then go to the next one, debate, pause, next one, next one, next one. Once we've done all of them, then we'll bring them forward all together. Then we will uh, we'll speak to them only once, but we'll vote separately on each one of them. Okay, Councillor Nack. So sorry, just I'm only picking one of my four to start, and then I will come back for yep. a second round. Yeah, yep. I just wanted to make sure. That's fine. I just yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, that's yep. perfect. One, that's, yeah, come back. Good. Then I think I'll start with the height change one, uh, which is number three on the list. So I'll move that administration provide draft amendments on subsection 4.1.6 of section 2.10 of Charter Bylaw 20001 to consider a maximum building height of 8.9 meters for a single family home when adjacent to an existing bungalow, a maximum building height of 10 meters for all other residential uses in the RS zone when adjacent to an existing bungalow, and a maximum building height of 12 meters in the RS zone when adjacent to a home with a height of 8.9 meters or more. Second. Okay, it's been seconded by Councillor Cardinal. Okay, can you make the introduction, please? You have two minutes. Yes. Um, worked on this a little bit in, with Councillor Cartmel to figure out what would be the right um, way to try to address what I think was one of the bigger issues that I heard, which is that that's how la large something can be beside someone's home. I think it is important to, to try to have a bit of a contextual design. And I, I think for those that are living in a small bungalow, the notion of an 8.9 meter high home is even a lot, but I appreciate that's been allowed for now, you know, essentially 20 years, and this 8.6 is now 8.9. Um, and, and so I, I looked at the total height, and, and so you would argue, well, 8.9 meters to 10 or 10.5, that, that is not in itself a big change. From 8.9 to 10.5, we're talking about five and a half feet, five and a quarter feet, that's not a big change. But if you are beside that larger home and you have a smaller home, I think it's important that we have a serious chat about what that impact is. Because if, speaking of solar panels, the solar panels can be an additional 1.5 meters high. So if you're the home immediately to the north of that, suddenly that becomes even more of an impact. But I also heard, um, and part of the point of the third bullet point is to say, well, if you're beside a large home already, why don't we allow even more? So is there a way to accomplish a better, uh, even, even more development, the same flexibility that is currently being provided in the new neighborhoods 
um, beside those homes that are taller because that is something that I think could provide value. So um, I, I decided to make this as a go provide draft amendments versus a report because I think this is one of the biggest things I've heard concerns about and I don't want to wait um, but I appreciate we're going to have a report that would still allow us to debate the specifics. We'll get some administrative feedback. Um, but I'd like to see this conversation come back in the first quarter. So that's why I'm making them as draft amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Now questions on this subsequent motion to administration or to the mover? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, just maybe to start with administration, wondering if you've had a chance to do any uh, modeling in terms of, of shadow impacts on different heights? We have a little bit of that, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Um, we've provided some uh, backup slides to clerks uh, that we could share if you're, sure. if you're looking at that. I think that might be helpful. Maybe while those are coming up. Um, Maybe just to the mover, you know, I, I really appreciate the consideration of, um, you know, impacts to adjacent neighbours. I think those those are undeniable for sure, and I, I think you're right to point out that they, they're there, they do have an impact. I think, I think where I'm struggling is that um, it's, it's sort of the diminishing impacts or the diminishing return. I think that if you're in a bungalow, um, you know, I, I appreciate that having a two-story building next to you uh, impacts uh, you. I just don't know if sort of a, a two and a half story, like if that next half story or that next story has the same marginal impact as that, that second story. Um, sorry, is that That, that is sure. a question. question. What, what do you think? So, you're right that that next half story, I would, I would agree, doesn't have as much of an impact, but I am very much thinking about the cumulative impact of the changes we've had uh, and the cumulative piece of, of what this means for those, those neighbors. And so you're right, again, I, when I break it down, five and a quarter feet, that might not seem like a, a massive change, but for the person who's lived in that neighborhood for 30 or 40 years, who is dealing with you know, what we heard in the public hearing, I think there is, I haven't seen a lot, I'll put it this way, on this change in our zoning bylaw that responds to that real impact in a meaningful way. And have you heard from people that you've spoken with that that would be meaningful to them, that the, the 1.6 meter change would help them feel more comfortable with the, the amendments or the new by bylaw? I think it's trying to find that balance that we've been working on and, and there's a, the reason we specifically broke it down to the two bullet points is that you could still do a 10 meter high home if you're doing anything but a single family home beside a bungalow. Um, but we're trying to, so it's that trade off of we're trying to encourage density but at the same time recognize that there are real impacts and so it's, it's it will never be perfect, <laughs> not unlike mm -hmm. our, entire, our entire last conversation, but I do believe this, this does have a potential to help address some of what I've heard. But that's not necessarily something you've heard directly. Oh, yeah, yeah, it sorry. Is? Oh, okay. absolutely, okay. yes, yes, that, yes. That people would yeah. be satisfied with this, that they would then be supportive of the, of the bylaw. I, I mean, there will be some who will be satisfied by that, but frankly, there will be some who want lower than 8.9 meters. Yeah. And, and I mean, that option hasn't existed for decades, but, but yeah. I, I don't want to suggest this will make everyone happy, but I think this, this will make, this will address those who I think had legitimate feedback who are meaningfully engaged and, and do meaningfully believe in, in the goals that the city are trying to achieve and trying to cross balance that against the okay. other pieces. And then just to clarify, the second bullet would would decrease from the current provision of 10.5 to 10. Again, that, that half meter, some thoughts there. And sorry, I, I do have some questions of administration, so I'm gonna. So that one's a short yes, but also we can debate that when it comes back to PE. Okay, maybe just to administration, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to bring those slides up, um, but just, just also thinking that there may see, be some challenges in terms of you know, the instance of being next to an empty lot, having different sized buildings on either side of a lot, um, would that add some complexity, do you anticipate? It, it would add some complexity and, and clerks could bring up the, uh, the slide if you'd, if you'd like, um, just 
and I can I can just very briefly speak to what we're looking at here. So it's we're looking at March, um, uh, different times of the day. Uh, the different this is showing the difference between a 10.5 meter height and an 8.9 meter height. So you know not anticipating the specifics of this motion. Obviously, we, we it doesn't reflect what's being discussed exactly, but this shows the uh, again the difference of those heights. Um, yeah, in terms of the. Um, uh, the challenges, you know, that's one thing that we would certainly have to look into and report back on because I think that there are a little bit of, you know, there's some devils in the details here. Um, one thing, yeah, you're right, uh, that you could have a vacant lot, so we'd have to consider a rule for what happens when next to a vacant lot. You'd need to consider, um, you know, a, a specific height uh, attached to a bungalow. I think that you'd also need to look at whether, um, you know, what are the challenges with providing the technical and precise information of the house next door right. um, so we wouldn't have their their plans for example right. um, yeah and I'm so sorry I'm, I, I can't see the time I'm 23 seconds over my time so I'll oh. end it here thank you okay, okay. thank you councillor Stevenson questions uh, on this amendment so subsequent councillor Rutherford Councillor Jans on this one no, Councillor Rutherford. So why don't we just, I, I, I would encourage that everyone remove yourself from the from the list, because we have to go through this or, all the time, or right? Can the, or can the clerk keep yeah, if this clerk list could, for could, the primary could, could keep this order, order then we come back to it, right? So, uh, or the yeah. subsequent, I mean? You know, here, I'll take a picture of it. What? Just told no, them. No, I'm just on a Google Doc, I was thinking. Um, okay. I took a picture of it, so I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. 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 So All right. I have so a everybody remove your uh, uh, only remove yourself and sign up if you have questions on this subsequent. I, I will just say that this is not the list that was originally up for when we called for amendments, and I do have that list. Okay. okay good. That's great. Okay, Councilor Rutherford. Okay. So I, I guess I have a process question to the clerk. So now I had a, a, a subsequent that I was contemplating about generating a report on some of these same things. So if we ask questions of this one, this one gets tabled. Is it going to be called out of order for me to put that motion, that subsequent on the floor? So I think the reason that we've come up with this process is we've been working with your offices individually and we know that there's overlap. And so while we've provided drafts to your office, we don't know exactly what you're going to be moving. So the order that these are made still stands in a regular debate. So if you want to make amendments to this, um, I would suggest now would be the time. Or if you're going to make a subsequent motion that's similar to this, we'd have to see the exact wording and it's possible that it would be out of order because this is already on the floor. That's why we're suggesting yeah. to the mayor that nothing gets voted on until council has all the So what if, will there be an opportunity after we vote on these subsequents for additional subsequents? Because let's say this fails. So if I can't put my subsequent on and this fails, can I then have the opportunity to put that subsequent on? I would say yes, depending on what your subsequent is but I mean like it's hard for it's hard for me to give advice and, and on information that's not already made public yeah but absolutely, no I, if this fails I mean I, mine was I mean I can be more more broad mine didn't talk about anything related to point two and three but I did uh, mine is generating a report on disincentivizing single-family homes through height setback and our RA like floor area ratio If maybe I could help. So yeah, your, your easiest solution would be that you would propose an amendment to this because the amendment, of course, would get voted on before the main motion does. Okay. Um, if you don't like the alternative, then the, the key is to make it generic enough where you, if the purpose of yours is about is about disincentivizing single-family home, I think you are now getting away from the intent of this I, motion and probably well, and, and okay. Th th this is the problem is, is that, yeah, this is, this is a tricky governance conundrum because as it stands, I wouldn't support this motion, <laughs> and I'm not sure unless I like strike the entire. Th can I strike the entire thing and put it? No. So <laughs> this is where I'm in a tricky situation. So even amendments wouldn't necessarily help. Okay, I think. I guess to the mover, like what, like we have heard so much. I'm just going to focus on point one. 
we have heard so much about the nuance in terms of multifamily. We, we heard from Mr. Lee about cultural appropriateness around where those bedrooms can be for families. There's a lot of, I think, I'm concerned about the unintended impacts of asking for a direct amendment to point one, especially when I just think there's so much contextually and um, that we need to consider in, in that. So I had had a, I think you've seen my pretend, potential motion around this one. Uh, what are your, why, why directing the amendment and not a report, especially on point one? So the short answer, and I don't want to, you can cross verify, but my understanding when asking questions of admin is that they would still include an analysis of these points. So it wasn't going to be that, that we have to do it. It's here's the draft amendments and here's our analysis on whether or not we would recommend this or the considerations that we would have. So that was how I've interpreted their, okay. their answers to me. Okay, well, I think given the advice from legal and the clerk and given where we are, I'm going to move to strike point one from this um, this subsequent. Okay, so need, are you moving that? Yes. Okay, need a seconder? Second. Okay, to strike down bullet one, first one, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, so now we, uh, clerk, uh, we are talking about the amendment to the subsequent, right? That's where we need to focus our efforts. Yes, that's right. Okay, so on the amendments only, please. Questions on the amendment. I can put the text of the original in the chat for you so you can see what has been struck. I just see some, perhaps, questions about it. Okay. So now just from a process clarity perspective, people are asking questions about- Only on the amendment. Only on the amendment yes. to the subsequent. Amendment. Yes, amendment to the subsequent. So somebody only. says to the mover, they're talking to me. Yes, you're, they're talking to <laughs> Councillor Rutherford. So questions to the mover, Councillor Rutherford, or to administration on the amendment only. Councillor Salvador questions amendment? No. Councillor Rice questions on amendment? No. Councillor Wright questions on amendment? No, but I, no, no. Councilor Cartmel, questions on amendment? No. Okay, all right, we have amendment on the floor, no questions on the amendment, please Mr. Mayor, we're having a debate here, so go ahead. So, trying to be really helpful because we can't debate what we don't know, just to be really clear, the reason we're recommending the process that we have is so that council has all the information before it votes on anything. Yeah. So if you start voting on amendments to subsequent motions, oh, okay, so. I would say my advice is get everything out in the okay, table. We got can't it. give advice okay, got on it. information so we'll wait. that's we'll not wait. public. So what we, then we can still carry on with questions 100%. on the subsequent. Yeah. Okay, okay yeah. got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Stay through the process. I, I, you know, I, 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 I think I said that uh, second day into the into the public hearing that if we have amendments or subsequent start sharing with each other, but here we are. We were told not to. We were told not to? Oh, yeah, we were told not to because of the public hearing public process. Oh yeah, okay, got it. Okay, here you go. So that's another process that we have to follow. Okay, uh, now Costa Salvador, go ahead please. So back to the original yes. mover of the subsequent. Yeah. Um, you or know, you know, can, I'll go to Clerk. Can I, be, can I be broad enough to ask questions on both? Yes, please. Okay, that's okay. okay. Stay great. broad enough. Great, yeah. great. Um, okay, so when I when I look at this subsequent, it actually reminds me of the restrictions that used to be in place for garden suites, uh, where it was very contextual, um, and the, the height of the garden suite was restricted based on the height of the primary dwelling. Um, and I'm wondering, like we, we ended up moving away from that approach. Um, can you help me understand why this would be different? That's a great question. For me, there's there's a few things. Because of the other changes and the other expansion of rights, I would argue, that has been approved through the zoning bylaw, additional site coverage, other factors like that, I think there is a, a building footprint consideration that, that does need to take into account something. And I don't, th my personal view is that using the reduced setbacks, using some of the additional site coverage it doesn't feel like there's been any additional consideration on the other side. It feels like all of the changes are solely about expanding the building right. 
um, without any type of reflection on, on certain parts of the impact. So that's why I haven't done amendments on side setbacks or anything like that. The height felt like the best way to try to deal with the expanded rights that now exist while still trying to address that one concern. Okay. Okay, I appreciate that answer, and I might I might ask the same thing to administration. I mean, we seem to have been moving away from contextual restrictions, where the height of one building is determined by the height of the next. Um, why why have we been moving away from that type of approach? That those that type of approach, uh, Councillor Salvador, um, contributes to some general uncertainty with even explaining the rules for people understanding on any given site. You know, what are the rules when I have to talk to people about the front setback requirement in the mature neighborhood overlay, for example? It's this, but this, but this, but this. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I think that it it tends to generate a lot of. Um, considerations for variances uh, so they're you know like looking at this particular case maybe we consider it a little differently um, height doesn't give us that opportunity because of the restriction around height so it wouldn't be variable um, um, but however you know like once you and, and just getting back to the previous question around you know some of the constraints here um, you would have to have a, a bunch of subsets of rules for you know what if there's a bungalow on one side and a three-story building on the other what's the rule there um, so there's, it does add a lot of complexity that tends to compound once uh, you, you start to put it all together. Right, and that's a good point. I mean, existing bungalows are kind of called out in this, but I can imagine a scenario where there's diverse housing typologies that we could run into where it would be unclear. Is that the correct understanding? It, it would require, yeah, that's, that's correct. Okay. It would require us to get clear on a lot of variables. Okay. Okay, um, and then just back to the mover, the, I wanted to ask about the 10 versus 10.5 as well. Uh, so in the questions and answers that we received from an administration, um, going from 10.5 to 10, as I recall, would uh, potentially compromise livability as well as some of the energy efficiency um, gains that can be made through, you know, higher insulation value between, between floors, um, et cetera. So, Thoughts there? What would we be compromising, I guess, going to 10? Yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Uh, that, that was a question that was asked in the written Q&A as well. Uh, we heard from a few people in, in support where they were worried about how much that would impact. The written Q&A, when I read through it, felt like it didn't have quite as much of the same concerns registered. So I, I've, I've wanted to bring that forward, recognizing that I think part of that analysis specifically for that one might be whether we should stick with the 10.5 or bring it down to 10. Um, once we can do a little bit more of a deeper dive than, than what was presented both in the public hearing and through the written responses. Okay, and then just to administration, I just need to understand what we would be receiving back from this motion. So what is the difference between how this is worded to bring back draft amendments versus how, bringing back a report with options? We would bring this to Urban Planning Committee that would include a report um, with the analysis and then the motion is providing for asking for draft amendments. So then should committee wish to proceed with those amendments, we'd, we'd indicate what that could look like in a bylaw. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, I'm running out of time, but it sounds like there are other subsequents that might also uh, have consequences for height or questions about height um, and it might be better to loop that into one report but I'm out of time. Okay. Thank you Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rice. <clears throat> A question to, to the mover. Because in this bylaw we just passed and we have two new uh, zones, neighborhood mixed use and the neighborhood commercial and then for this height limited right now as a amendment for the future does not apply to these two zones, right? That's correct, yes, specifically focused on the RS zone. So it's my understanding, if it's a neighborhood mixed zone, that means we still have that opportunity, or we still have that opportunity and for the building and then achieve the proposed height and with the same impact and for the residential uh, existing houses. So how we, so this amendment is not address that concern we heard from many public speakers. 
Yeah, the reason I didn't include that is because since the like-for-like like swap is essentially RF1, 2, 3, and 4 to RS, the vast majority of the homes are now zoned RS. And that is, and, and so I wanted to make sure we were taking into account the zone that is the one that's most directly likely to be adjacent to somebody else right now. Um, open for other conversations another time, but that was the biggest concern I heard around the RS zone, and I, and I wanted to focus my time and, uh, and resources on that. Okay, and so because to me, if we limit it, only focus RS zone, that means we still open the door for other zones can achieve the same heights with this results the same concern. And for the for the uh, existing residential houses adjacent to this new development. It's true that there will be a handful of properties that are now adjacent to uh, MUN zone, but n about, I, I would, I M think it's safe to say that 99% of, of, of what is now, what were previously RF1 zoned homes are now beside an RS zone home, whereas if you wanted to go to this zone, in most situations, you would have to rezone, which would trigger a separate public hearing process, a separate conversation. And so because this isn't the standard zone throughout neighborhoods, the RS zone is the standard, I, I felt we should focus our time on the RS zone. Uh, so then my question to administration, what, what is the ma maximum height for this MEU and, and uh, neighborhoods mixed use and the neighborhoods commercial? Because you heard, were waiting, you find that information. I really, I really have the concern if we miss this two zones in the height limited limitation, and that means we still can go that zone to build the building adjacent to the existing residential houses and to. The, the height of the mi mixed use na uh, neighborhood mixed use zone is uh, uh, sixteen meters. Sixteen meters. Yeah. And uh, how about commercial, uh, neighborhood commercial, because it's two new zones. It's the same, 16 meters. Six, both the same. Sorry, okay. correction Thank there. You. It's actually 12 meters for Sorry. the neighborhood Thank commercial. A uh, neighborhood commercial is 12, but the neighborhood mixed use is six meters. And then those can be built adjacent to the single house or bungalows, right? Because it's in the neighborhood. Yes, if there's uh, one of those type of zones in, beside an RS zone, yes, that would be the height, 12 and 16. So they, they are permitted and to build in the neighborhood. It would be required, uh, rezoning would be required. Rezoning uh, will counselors. be, additional rezon rezoning will be required. Um, yeah, that's correct. Unless there's a, an, an equivalent zone already there, so an equivalent commercial zone already in place, Okay. then uh, a rezoning would be required. So it's not automatically Permit. Correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, before I go to Councillor Rice, I just want to understand the, when will this come back if this is approved by uh, Council? And it, just because that's it's not included there, really. I just need to understand the timing. We would suggest um, Q1 or Q2 of, of to Urban Planning Committee in 2024. Q1 or Q2? Yeah, I think March is when we can bring this forward, and that's what we had talked about through the public hearing, okay. uh, which would be Q1, uh, okay. Urban Planning Committee. Can we please put that in the, as part of it? Uh, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, to administration, what's, what's the standard height of a bungalow? It's around six meters. Six meters? Okay. Okay. Um, I've got six two stories and a raised bungalow looking into my backyard, which is a bungalow. Um, so I don't know what the difference is, really, whether it's a, a two or a three story, um, would it matter to me? But I just wanna understand, um, so if, okay, so if there is a bungalow on the street, and so then you're wanting no higher than a, like a two story next to it, correct? Two and a half, which is, two and a half. One, which okay. is what you can currently do. Yeah. Okay, um, but then, couple of years down the line, I can take that bungalow and either renovate or demolish and, and rebuild something that's 12 meters high because now I have a house that's 8.9 beside it. 
Correct. Okay. So are we really be are we really preserving the idea of the single family bungalow? No, I, I and that, that's actually not the intent of the motion. It's okay. it's it's really not to try to preserve say a single family home for the sake of having a single family home. It's really about trying to address the concern that we heard around how redevelopment occurs in the neighborhood, what that means for the impact aside. But I'm great, you know, the, the whole point of I think approving this is to have more housing choice. And I'm not looking, and I, and I think part of why bullet three exists is that provides even more opportunity than currently exists in the bylaw that was just approved. So you could actually do more, more housing choices, more potentially more density than what you would actually see under the under the current bylaw that was just approved. Okay, and so, so if I want to do a single family, it can only go 8.9, but if I want to go higher, then I'd have to do like a duplex. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can do a smaller duplex if you want, still you're not forced to right. have a taller okay. one, but, but yeah, the idea is to, if we're gonna try to incent a little bit more in terms of density, allow the density to have the taller heights, uh, while at the same time trying to address the, the impact for those who have been in the neighborhood. In the, for a long time. Okay, thank you. And and I just want to ask the question of the clerk. Didn't you say we could put all the motions on the floor right now, now that public hearing is closed? Yep. But I think not just to list out perhaps 10, 20, or 30 of them. It might work best if you want to work through them methodically one at a time. But not knowing what other councillors have. Yeah, that's a great question for the chair. Happy to augment the process, but that was what we discussed so that there would be clarity um, as we move forward. Because so, I know, Councillor Rutherford, you're trying to yeah. amend this maybe to be closer to what your is it yeah. is gonna, yeah. yes yeah. yeah. So my the reason I I moved to strike that one is so that if if we're only voting on all of them at the end. I didn't want this to pass and then my motion to be out of order and we don't vote on my motion. I wanted to be able to, to let this pass or fail on its own without interfering with the motion that I'll be putting on the floor was the, in, was the intent, which is, it's just different than this because it, it includes more than just height, more, con, more context than just height. So I, yeah. Maybe I can seek some guidance from clerk now that the the statutory public hearing is closed, right? Your advice was based on statutory public hearing and we have to be transparent with the public. So anything that needs to be put forward needs to be put forward on the floor that everybody sees at the same time, right? Now that that process is closed, is it a way for everyone to share what is their subsequent motions yeah. are? Absolutely. So you're what? right. The statutory public hearing process is over. And so yeah. I just consider this as a regular council meeting. Yeah. If it would be helpful to all of council, we could do what we've done during budget, yeah. which is very slowly and very helpfully to clerks. If you want to take a pause, Mayor Sohi, and ask each councillor in the order that they originally clicked on to yeah. at least Brim. state their subsequent motions publicly. Yeah. That way we have something to react to. Because again, it's hard to give advice to I think that is, that will be more workable. If you go uh, nice and slowly, because yeah. we, we are not sure what all will be made, but we have a number of tracking documents. So we're yeah. happy to, to do this as easily as works for council. Okay, I think that's a good Do you suggest that we pause on this then? Uh, yeah, obvious, obviously, because you're trying to debate something yeah. that's not on the floor yeah. yet, which is okay. difficult. Okay. So we will pause on this and maybe we can take about a uh, uh, 10 minute break. Sorry, I have a question Sorry. that affects the what amendments or motions we put on the floor. Can I ask a process question? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. So I was really confused by the answer from administration that this one would generate a report to committee because my understanding was in, in my crafting of subsequence, if I said generate that, that administration bring back a report, it would go to committee, but if administration provide amendments, it would go to public hearing. So if the, um, if the draft motion was really specific on what the change was, um, for example, a building height from, you know, changing the building height from 10.5 to 10 meters, that's a really direct motion in terms of the change, but the this is pretty direct, right? Like if we well, say like a maximum height of 10 meters in the RS zone. For the second bullet, yes. That is that is direct. Um, but this first motion, 
um, requires some analysis of how we would yeah, actually but even in that. a public hearing you administration always provides a report with analysis on and their recommendation yes so I'm just trying to make be clear and the reason I'm asking this now is not to debate this one but just if we're putting motions on the floor or if we're putting subsequent on the floor I think it's really clear if 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 administration is to if we're directing administration to provide an amendment or and it does exactly the same as directing administration to provide a report I'm just not clear as to how I should word my subsequent I think it should be a report and so if we are saying amendment we are we are directing administration to bring this back to public hearing well this one we've recommended it go to urban planning committee so there can be a wholesome discussion around the amendment so we would have to add administrative provide a report on draft amendments yes okay good okay yeah all right okay. I, just I, to I, be I think that's friendly okay good okay okay, okay. all right that helps so, clarify got Thank it you. so Sorry process is clear now so we're going to pause here we'll take 10 minute break then everyone please share your uh subsequent with the so, so, so mayor so he i we are prepared i don't think sending individual emails to the clerk right now is the most helpful we are as prepared as we can be. so i can follow the list of them okay, and it. just okay. if the counselors can be specific because we might have multiple versions of the same thing okay. that's all we and need. if someone is not ready then they can come back okay yeah, and mayor so the question again and that was Councillor rutherford's question was my question asking for amendments we need to be clear are you asking for amendments to come back to a statutory public hearing or are you asking for a report to come to committee please be really clear and okay. are you making these subsequent motions one by one each counselor gets to put their one to ten or are you doing these one at a time and working around the table what would be easiest for council it's possible that some counselors have multiple subsequent motions do you want everybody to just list them i'll go through the order one at a okay, time so right everybody can pick their favorite and we go pick your favorite the and we will we'll create that order the way we do with the budget yep. yeah we'll follow that process Okay, so Mayor, may I please just confirm what the friendly was to that to Councillor? A report to be general, like uh, administration provide a report on draft amendments to committee. So if a report comes to committee, if it's a if a draft if it's just draft amendments, it goes through public hearing. We need to be really clear yeah. because I had read this as administration prepares amendments, amendments go to staff public hearings. Yeah. But the clarity that's just been provided is so very helpful. Easy process would be that anything you propose should generate our report instead of unless you really want go through the statutory republic here okay all right okay now key all right councillor stevenson please state your subsequent your favorite one now that's a very hard task um I will start. Oh, I apologize. I had to change my password this morning. Um, if you're not ready, I can go to the next one, then come back. Sure. Oh, I've got it right here. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? I don't. You can go to the next one. I apologize. Okay. Who's next? I had Councillor Jans as next. Councillor Jans, please, subsequent. Awesome. Thank you. So, just one. Yeah, just one now. I'll come back. Okay, this one is uh, amenity contributions. Um, just read it out. Yep. Yep. That administration provided report outlining options for the provision of public and private amenities and building enhancements, such as but not limited to green building and additional bedrooms through the rezoning process, including updates to Charlie 599A community amenity contributions in direct control provisions, and that the report include potential amendments to zoning bylaw. Charter bylaw 2001, uh, 2001 uh, due date Q4 2024. Okay. Need a seconder. Second. Second. Okay. Consider right. Okay. All right. So next, Consular Stevenson. Thank you. In no particular order, I'll move that administration as part of the City of Edmonton Minimum Emergency Shelter Standards Review in 2024 include an investigation into the appropriate size of shelters and provide any recommendations as necessary to regulate future shelters. The due date of Q4 2024 Community and Public Services Committee. Second. Okay. Oh. Uh, okay. Who's next? Sorry, Mary, was that you a second? Yeah. Thank I'll you. Consider, 
the concert tanks acting red, so yeah. I had Councillor Rutherford as Councillor Rutherford, go ahead please. Okay, um, I guess due to the discussion, I'll put the one that's parallel. So that administration provide a report outlining options to disincentivize the development of single detached housing through modification, modification to built form regulations such as site coverage, height and building length from the small scale residential zones. Due date Q2 2024, Urban Planning Committee. Second. Second by <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Neck seconded it. Who's next, please? Councillor Salvador. Councillor Salvador, please, please go ahead. Uh, the administration provide as part of the report on climate resilience planning and development framework as identified in attachment eight of the June 20th, 2023 Urban Planning and Economy Report, UPE 01636, an outline of scope of work, including specific timelines for integrating climate action throughout the planning continuum this should include how climate adaptation and mitigation can be further embedded in the zoning bylaw as part of the post zoning bylaw renewal work plan, including but not limited to solar and EV readiness in alignment with the community energy transition strategy and climate adaptation strategy and action plan. Second. Oh, Councillor Paquette seconded, good. Okay. Who is next? Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Cartmel, go ahead please. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move that um, administration bring back a report, including bylaw amendments, uh, to amend Charter Bylaw 20001 by increasing the minimum site area per dwelling from 75 meters squared to 100 meters squared in the RS small scale residential zone. Need a second? Second. Councillor Rice. Okay. Who is next? Councillor Tang. Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Oh boy, okay. Um, that administration provide a report on the status of city policy C601 affordable housing investment guidelines and the target of 16% affordable units of all units in each neighborhood due date Q1 2025. Second. Uh, Okay, who is next? Councillor Rice. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, that administration provided a report, um, including um, the, uh, amendments and outline options to further regulate location and separation distance of supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services through zoning bylaw, chat bylaw 20001 or other tools. In addition, chart bylaw 20001, including the statement to the effect that in the absence of further regulation, any application for new uh, supervised consumption services or overdose prevention services required requires city council approval. Second. Second by Councillor Principe. Thank you. And who's next, please? Just one moment, let me just catch up. Next is Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, uh, this is a draft, but I'll be moving something in the spirit of this. That administration provide a report outlining the allocation of development uh, enforcement or compliance resources, including but not limited to the infill compliance team, including uh, including processes and metrics to receive, triage, and resolve residential development complaints uh, due in Q2 2024. Okay, second by Councillor Paquette. Thank you so much. Uh, next, please. That is all that I had on the list that went up before we moved to questions of Councillor Knack's motion. Okay, can I, can I have some, Councillor Yeah, I have the floor, okay. not the floor, the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that administration engage with post-secondary organizations, housing developers, youth, student groups, and other stakeholders to identify opportunities to increase the supply and affordability of housing options 
for students and youth in Edmonton. Second. That is seconded by Councillor Rice. Okay. And I will return the chair. I'll take the chair back. Now we'll go to the second round of subsequence. Councillor, I'll follow the list that is on the on the deck now. Is that okay? Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Nope. 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 Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, I will move that administration bring back a report including amendments to reduce the maximum floor area per individual establishment from 300 meters squared to 100 meters squared in the RS small scale residential zone. Need a seconder. Second. Councillor Knack. Okay, please. Uh, next is Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'll just go in the order that I have. I have seven subsequent, just for the record. Uh, but others might put similar stuff. So the, my next subsequent is that administration provide as part of UPE 1993 construction site safety and accountability impact assessment report options to provide greater or increased protection of heritage homes adjacent, adjacent to sites undergoing construction or demolition. Due Second. Date Q2 2024. Second by Councillor Paquette. Thank you so much. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Again, just going in the order that I have uh, that administration as part of the zoning bylaw, Charter Bylaw 20001, one year review report, include analysis on the child care services provision since enactment of Charter Bylaw 20001 and provide options for amendments to further expand opportunities for child care services if required. Due date Q2 2025. Second. Second. Oh, you second. I second it. I thought you were calling for a second. <laughs> I was going to end out. Uh, was that, okay. Sorry, was that Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, Councillor Rutherford Thank seconded it. That's fine. Uh, that's okay. We all want team, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just thought you were asking for second. Okay, then uh, next is Councillor Rice. Sorry, sorry. No, no, Councillor Cardinal. No, 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 sorry. Councillor Rice, Councillor Rice. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor Salhi. Um, that administration provides the report outlining options to regulate and limit of the numbers of supportive housing shelters, so supervised consumption services, and overdose prevention services that can operate in neighborhood mixed use and the neighborhood commercial zones through zoning bylaw chart by law 20001 or other tools. Second. Thank you. Uh, that was seconded by Councillor Prince Bay. Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. This is the uh, Heritage Preservation one. Uh, this is that an unfunded service package be created to, bullet point one, advance the heritage management inventory work as identified in the City Auditor Historic Resources Manage, uh, Management Program Audit. Number two, complete the direct control de uh, zoning for the Glenora Heritage Character Area in alignment with the City Plan and draft district planning goals of increased density while encouraging the retention of heritage resources and ensuring the new development respects the form and mass of the Garden City Suburb. Bullet point three, develop a list and begin preliminary work for other areas in the city that would need similar heritage preservation work. Second. Second. I think Councilor Cardinal. Cardinal. Yeah, thank you. Councilor Cardinal seconded it. Uh, Councilor Jans. Thank you. I. Sorry, I just lost it. Please come back to me. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. It's my third round. Third. Yeah, third. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I will move that administration bring a report uh, on amendments to subsection 6.2 of section 2.10 of the zoning bylaw 2001, 2001, by deleting 6.2 in its entirety and replacing it with the following 
rear attached garages are not permitted except where existing as of January 1st, 2024. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councillor. I've got it now. Jens, go ahead, please. Thank you. I move landscaping and climate that uh, administration as part of the zoning bylaw charter bylaw 200001 one year review report include analysis on the landscaping provision. Am I? Uh, no. I include analysis on the landscaping provisions since enactment of Charter Bylaw 2 uh, 2001 and provide options for amendments to further implement the climate resilience planning and development framework if required. Due date Q2 2025. Second. Okay. Second by Councillor Rutherford. Next is Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, the administration prepare amendments to zoning bylaw, charter bylaw 20001 that address the requirement that all ground floor dwellings in multi unit housing buildings greater than 10 meters in length that face a street, shared use path, or park provide an individual ground floor entrance in applicable residential or mixed use zones. Due date Q3 2024. Second. Second by Councillor Neck. Okay. Uh, next is Councillor. Rutherford. Oh, it's Councillor Neck, sorry. You did, Councillor Rutherford then? Yep, so uh, I will move that administration prepare amendments to subsection 3.1.1 of section 5.6 of Charter Bylaw 2001 by am be amended by deleting where the site width is less than eight meters, one tree and four shrubs, and replacing it with when the site width is less than eight meters, two trees and four shrubs. Second. Looks very simple. Thank you. That's Councillor uh, Knack seconded. Okay. Councillor Knack. Well, now that that one's done, um, <laughs> perfect word. It's excellent written motion. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to scrap that one because it was word for word the same. Um, so I only have one left that administration provide a report detailing the following bullet point one related to the section 20.2 class a permitted development notification requirement of zoning bylaw uh, 12800 the total number of uh, individual mail outs and the associated cost for administering said mail outs for the past three years 2021 22 and 23 Bullet point two, opportunities and options to introduce new, new notification requirements for development permits for permitted development in redeveloping areas as depicted in the city plan due date quarter three, 2024 urban planning committee. Second. Thank you, Councilor Carmel. Uh, next is Councilor Rice. Uh, that administration provided a report that provides analysis of the outcome of the chart by law 19275 approved on June 23, 2020 regarding transition, transitioning from minimal parking requirements to open option parking and outlined the options on how to provide sufficient quantity of parking that meets the preference of Edmontonians as part of this analysis, obtain the view points of Edmontonians and the due date Q3 2024. Second. Second, Councillor Prince Bay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Sorry, con yeah, Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, that administration is part of City Operations Report C00195, Trees and Public Private. Public and private property explore opportunities on private land to continue the advancement of achieving the city's tree canopy goals, including but not limited to enhanced tree retention incentivization in bylaw 2001. Thank Due you. Due date Q3 2024. Need a second. Second to Councillor Salvador. Uh, Councillor Rice. The administration prepared a report including options and analysis for separation distance between cannabis retail stores and child care services as part of the cannabis store, um, retail store and liquid store separation distance review report. Second. Thank you, Councillor Wright seconded that. Okay, next, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. This is a one two-part motion. 
Uh, so part one, that administration prepare amendments to Charter Bylaw 2001 to delete the following from sections, section 5.120, subsection 4.1.4, and renumber the remaining subsections accordingly, due date Q2 2024. And part two, that administration provide a memo outlining the review of vehicle access paths to waste storage areas as part of the waste services developer standards review scheduled in 2024 with the objective of minimizing the area allocated for vehicle access paths. <laughs> I can, yeah. Second. Councillor Rutherford. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. So that administration implement opportunities to share information with the public on the processes available for the development of rear attached grads within the zoning bylaw charter bylaw 2001 during the first year of implementation. Due date Q1 2024. Second. Councillor Principe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dice. Oh, this is my last one. Uh, the administration provided a report on how to plan infrastructure improvements that will be needed as a result of the implementation of the new zoning bylaw, chart bylaw 2001. Second. Thank you. Second by Councilor Cardinal. Okay, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Can, oh, your next is Councilor Rutherford. No. No, Councilor Stevenson. Last one. That. Administration as part of the Zoning Bylaw Charter Bylaw 2001 one year review report include analysis on the eight dwelling maximum in the RS small scale residential zone and provide options for amendments to remove or expand this regulation if required. Due date Q2 2025. Second. Thank you. Councillor Rice. That's it? That was the Councillor Principal. Oh, no, Councillor Principal seconded that. Sorry, thank you. Uh, but I was going to call the rice for next one. You have one more? That's it. That is it. That is it. All right. So if everything passes, we might have to triple Kim's budget. It's so. Okay. Okay. Huh? Huh? Okay. Okay. So, Mayor Sohi, if we're going to need <clears throat> a tiny opportunity to consolidate the list and yes. make sure that councillors have it, as well as the public and administration, any chance of an early recess? Okay, of course. We'll take a break now. We'll be back at 1.30. Okay, until then, we are on the recess.
Good afternoon, we are live from Chamber. Okay, I would like to call this meeting back to order, and I'll do a roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. All right. So we have the order of, uh, I'll go to clerk to kind of walk us through the process. We have the sequence of all the subsequents. Yes. Um, so, Mayor, so we, we have provided online to administration and to members of council 
uh, the list of subsequent uh, motions that were made in the order that they were received by us. Uh, we did have to get a little bit of clarification over the break, so we've done the best we can based on watching the recordings. Um, I would suggest as Council moves through these amendments from 1 to 29, um, that we make sure that everybody understands the full intention of the motion, where the report comes back to and at what time, and just to clarify with administration that they have capacity to do the work within the timelines requested by Council. Okay, so we will start with the uh, motion one, then work our way down, right? I think that would probably be the easiest. Okay, and we'll go to Councillor <coughs> to re reinstate that, move that, and second it. Or, but okay, so they're already moved. They're yeah. already technically oh. all on the floor, so okay. I think you can just go back to number one, uh, okay. which was Councillor Knack and Cartmel, and then remember that Councillor Rutherford has an amendment to the motion. So we'll, so then we will be voting on them as as they come, right, instead of not we, we're not tabling them right i don't think we need to table we'd end up tabling 29 so okay, i think it's it. probably easier okay. just move Good. one after the other okay got it okay all right counselor uh, we were on so number uh should point of order yes. i think council principe did indicate that she might have a potential subsequent too and wanted to ask some clarifying questions before we proceed where is it sorry sorry just uh in the, the yeah, Councillor Principe uh, did call me. She's just having some technical difficulties, and she just asked if she, if she could, if if you would let her ask her questions in public, because um, she might have a subsequent. But she needs to get some clarification from administration before she states it. Okay, she. Uh, uh, we can go to her now, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that, and sorry about uh, uh, this last minute request. Uh, administration, I just wanted to ask, I know this is something that we did discuss over the few days, uh, and it was about adequate green space, uh, especially in, in areas that are um, will see a, an increase in infill, just to ensure that there's adequate green space for the population. And I just wanted to ensure, or to see if that was something that we could incorporate somehow into the zoning bylaw. So, Councillor Principe, it's Kent Snyder. Um, so, I believe you're talking about the community open space, public open space. Um, and yes, that is work that is underway. It's called the uh, implementing the breathe. Um, so, that is looking at all of our uh, park space, determining what is needed in every district based on current population and where we're going to grow. So, that will set out the strategy for our open space and park needs as we grow. Um, and from there, then, that will help Council make uh, decisions for acquisition or for surplus lands um, into the future. So that work is undergoing uh, currently. Okay, yes, I am aware of that. My concern is the um, possible development that could occur. We might be seeing a greater development in, in specific areas and maybe not as much development in other areas. I just... I understand that we are um, w with our breathe. I do understand that, but I want to see. I just want to ensure that we have enough green space with the possible development that could be occurring. So, Councillor, that that assessment, that breathe assessment, is is trying to um, address that specific question, making sure that. Um, at a district scale, not an individual park scale, but at a district neighborhood scale, that we have the appropriate open space um, for folks now and into the future. Okay, so what would we do, let's say, if um, a certain community is at, doesn't have a lot of green space left, and through infill sees an increase, uh, double their population? Yes. So because of the new zoning bylaw. Yes, and so we, we are looking at the zoning bylaw. That is, well, not looking at it, but we're incorporating it into the work and, and incorporating the city plan um, growth pattern. So all of that won't be a surprise. Um, we're definitely looking and monitoring every year and we'll calibrate, but the base level assessment is, is trying to do exactly what you're describing of making sure that we don't um, let open space slip away and that we acquire it where we need to acquire it. Okay, what about the increase in population? Yes, Councillor, that is absolutely what the assessment is looking at. Of our, Do we have enough currently, but then as well as we grow, and specifically at the uh, 
population milestones of 1.25 million, 1.5, and 1.75, and then 2 million as well. Okay, I don't think I'm getting my point across very well. Councillor, um, it's uh, Travis Pollock here. Uh, so I guess just to distill your question is, um, is the right level or the right tool the zoning bylaw to ensure uh, adequate open space throughout the neighborhood? Um, or is there other mechanisms out there? Uh, so the zoning bylaw isn't the right tool to ensure that broader community level uh, of open space provision is adequate. Uh, what Kent is uh, describing, uh, that implementation of breed, the monitoring of the population, and then the actions that would come forth from that monitoring, uh, whether it's the acquisition of land or the changing uh, of the use of the open space to to work within that system um, is that appropriate is the appropriate tool and it's not the zoning bylaw that looks to uh, basically uh, ensure that there's an appropriate level of open space throughout the, the neighborhood that's not the the, uh, the job of the zoning bylaw okay but one of the uh, expected outcomes or desired outcomes is to increase the density my concern is that some areas of the city we'll see a significant increase in density and other areas of the city won't. And my concern is that the areas of the city that will see an increase in density with the new zoning bylaw, my concern is they will not have adequate green space. Yeah, so, so as the, uh, the so population... So I do believe increased. it needs to be addressed I here. think uh, I think the best approach, Councillor Principe, would be instead of debating this here, like you develop a subsequent motion that... Uh, that council can debate and set direction if wish, wish to do so. Okay, yeah, that sounds good, thank you. Yeah, okay, uh, uh, okay, I would like to welcome students from George P. Nicholson School, grade six. They are here with the teacher, Shandell Switzer, and Ward Ipikokinipiaste. Your counselor is Councillor Rice, right over there, so welcome. Nice to see you all. Enjoy your trip here. I know you're here for the whole week, and I understand you have a mock council coming up on uh, on Friday, right? And the topic of discussion is uh, whether to lower the voting age from 18 to 16. Let us know the results of that discussion, okay? All right, okay, enjoy your visit, all right? Okay, so, Council Wright, do you have questions about the process? questions just related to Councillor Principe's uh, potential motion, but I just wanted to get some more clarification on it from it then. I think on that potential motion, on, on a potential yes. subsequent, yes. I, think I, I think we should table that first. I mean, sorry, with that motion should be made first, then ask clarifying, clarifying questions. I think Councillor Principe's intent was to find out whether she should make that or not. Right? Okay. So I think she's going to be thinking about making that. We'll wait for that. Okay. Otherwise, we'll I, go to a... I just had some questions that maybe might help her think about it. <laughs> we'll come to that okay. When, okay. When, she, when she makes it. Okay. All right. Now we are on motion one. Uh, did We had a speaking order on that, right? I think Councillor Cartmill was uh, uh, to ask questions on that. Councillor Cartmill, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I've lost track. I'm asking questions on what? Uh, motion one. Motion, motion one, yeah, uh, which is Councillor uh, oh, Nack's motion, and you second No, all the questions I had were asked by Councillor Rutherford in the previous conversation, so okay. I'm fine. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, any more questions on this? Seeing none, so we will be voting on Councillor Rutherford's amendment first, which is to strike first bullet, right? which is uh, to strike down maximum building height of 8.9 meter for single family home when adjacent to, exist, to an existing bungalow. Okay, so please, okay, anyone to speak on the amendment? Are we gonna speak to all of them all at once? I'd rather see that, otherwise we'll be. I don't know how you could speak I know. to 30, di 29 I know. different So please, let's vote separately on that. Once we're done, speak your mind. So I know it's a, it's, it's a process that uh, is pretty chaotic and uh, 
out. Well, like, I think this I is something we have to follow, right? This is the process we have to follow. This is what it is. I think we've created a hybrid here where this is a bit like how budget's been done. So it's been great that all councillors have been able to state their subsequent motions. Yeah. I don't know how you could possibly ask questions on the breadth of the subsequent motions and speak to it all at once unless that's what you so want So we to. have to speak to individually? I think it'd be great to get clarity right now because I think that's what everybody's asking. I'd okay. suggest you do it one so at budget, a time and if, follow the rules so of the So if we follow budget process, then we will be speaking to amendments separately and motions separately on each one, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll do I think that. we should follow the rules of okay. debate, well, otherwise. Okay, we will follow that then, okay. All right, now to speak to the amendment. Anyone to speak to the amendment? Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, so I'm gonna actually make a point that hopefully can carry over to most of the other motions uh, that, that we'll be discussing today so that I don't have to speak to, to all of them. Um, I think with the exception of about one or two of the motions, um, most of what I've seen put on the floor by members of council respond to feedback that we've heard throughout the public hearing process leading up to the public hearing process and over the course of a number of years. Therefore, my plan is to support pretty much every motion that's been made as a subsequent. Um, and the reason for it is not because I agree with all of them, um, but because I think they were raised in most, in most scenarios, they were raised as important issues that I think still require a bit more public engagement. So whether it's this one here and this specific bullet point or, or other pieces, I'd like the opportunity to make sure that we're not um, closing off that discussion too early. We've heard that in the case of this particular amendment and motion, and I won't speak to the main motion uh, because it's sort of one and the same at this point, that this would come back with a report with additional analysis and a chance for the community to speak at a uh, committee meeting. Um, I think it's, it's very important that we don't rush that as much as I appreciate, and I didn't get a chance in my five minutes to thank administration for all of their incredible work over the last five years to help create the zoning bylaw, so I'm gonna take advantage of that now. And noting that a lot of those subsequent motions mean you get to keep doing work, <laughs> um, which is a challenge, I know, and you wanna keep doing other work as well, and there's a lot of important work happening at this time. But if these are items that, that genuinely are based off feedback from those who I heard fairly often talk about, yes, they support change in their community, yes, they want to see that, um, the, the broader goals that we, we've sort of set out. Um, I'd like to still debate some of these specifics. So that's part of why, and, and I don't want to see this deleted, um, Noting Councilor Rutherford's subsequent, which I think is an excellent subsequent as well. Like to me, the, uh, I, would, I would be happy to get that additional information uh, in addition to this piece. Um, that's for me what I would like to see and, and maybe not the case for everyone. But I am, again, I've touched on this in a few of the answers, uh, a bit worried that if we don't get some of these subsequent motions in the form of a report coming back to committee, um, that it will feel like we, we didn't maybe fully hear everyone's, and not everyone had, had legitimate concerns, but I think some absolutely had legitimate concerns about what that change means in their neighborhood and, and their desire to have a bit more uh, opportunity to, to examine the pros and cons and understand what we're dealing with. So for me, again, the few, th the few subsequents that I have additional questions on, I'm gonna ask questions about, but, um, and if I can get those answered in a thoughtful way, I think the rest of the motions I'll support. So I, I wanna save myself the time of speaking to every other amendment, um, uh, except, yeah, and, and, and just hope that we can still have these conversations and noting fully well that you approving this does not result in the change actually being made, it results in it coming back to a committee meeting first, and then if we desire, sending it to a public hearing for a final decision. Uh, and I think this particular one on height is, is 
one of the most common concerns I heard from those uh, in, in many of the neighborhoods I represent. And I should add again, the third bullet point actually would provide increased development rights beyond what was just approved. So that's part of why I'd wanna have the consideration of all of those together. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am also going to just in general speak uh, to this motion specifically, but also just in, in the spirit of uh, clear communication, even though I may not agree with some of the subsequent that have come up is immaterial. Uh, again, as Councillor Nack has indicated, this is in response to the community and this is an opportunity for that further conversation and engagement that people were worried wasn't going to happen. And so that is why I'll be supporting um, the subsequent so long the day, simply for the sake of being able to have that open conversation um, with uh, potentially new ideas coming forward. Um, that I think that's fairly important. I think that it's uh, what the community wants, um, especially everyone who came out to speak um, would want to have a say in this one way or another. And so that's what's going to happen. And uh, hopefully, uh, at least that's where my vote will be to uh, be able to have the final conversation on a lot of these things, even though the zoning bylaw itself may not be a final iteration, and it won't be as time goes on, obviously. So um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, hopefully that means that's the last time I have to speak today. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Wright. Thank you. I I'm just concerned that some of this work has already been done and already informed um, the new zoning bylaw and that now we're getting a little more specific than than sort of the standard that um, was was intended I think from the zoning bylaw renewal initiative so I will be and I and I'm also concerned about budget um, requirements as well to complete some additional work maybe some of the work is already on record um, and it's just a matter of putting it into a report for us um, so I will I will vary my decisions on um, on all of these motions I guess based on what I think information is on record and um, whether it's just duplication of work that's already been done. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, just speaking to the subsequent, um, the reason I wanted to strike this from the original motion was because I won't be able to support the original motion. I think that the, our, the <laughs> there was one speaker that said, don't be like Toronto, and they gave a very specific example of some of that fine tuning, which seemed very inconsequential. It was changing something ever so slightly and how it sterilized some of those things. So, but I also know that I have a, a future one that's a little bit more holistic in looking at single family homes because I am concerned about, you know, we talk about affordability, we talk about climate. So, you know, having giant single family homes doesn't really support that. It is a little bit disheartening to hear some of my colleagues say that they're already just planning to, to support all of the motions because I don't necessarily think that's procedurally fair because the people that have made those subsequents haven't had a chance to introduce them. We haven't had a chance to debate those items. So I feel like that's not really fair to the, the spirit of debate. Uh, I just wanna put that out there. So I, I do hope that, and I, I know we're, we're just trying to save time and be brev with, have brevity of time, but I do think there are some considerations that we should look at each subsequent and debate it on its, its merits and in its totality. So that's what I would encourage my colleagues to think about as we go through the, the litany of subsequents to come. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote Point on the- of privilege, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councillor Paquette. Uh, when a councillor says that they intend to do something, that is their intent. But as we know, in all of our council debates, we are completely open to persuasion should new information arise that can change our opinion. And that is, I think, the standard by which I have always operated. And I cannot speak for my colleague, Councillor Knack, but that is the standard by which I know through his example, he has always emulated. So just uh, we, that is important to put on the record. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, please vote on the amendment, sorry. Councillor Rutherford's amendment.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Okay. We are back on the original subsequent now. And was that the order of speakers on that? No. Uh, Just give us a moment. We'll see if I, we can get it back up. Oh, we won't have the original okay. order of speakers. Before we go to the speakers, I'll be asking this question to administration because I think more procedurally, uh, not procedurally, I think uh, just for a better understanding, what can be done in existing? Do I have to seat the chair to ask that question or can I just do that as a chair? Well, the resource. As the, I'm sorry? I think you can just ask clarifications as the chair because okay. you're yeah. asking on behalf of council. Okay. So on, I'm going to be asking on all of them, right? The, the resource required, can they be done within existing budgets or do they require service package? And whether the timing of returning back is can be doable or not. So on, I'll ask this question on, on this motion first. So we do have capacity uh, to do this. I think when the motion was originally put on the floor, it identified a due date of March 2024. Um, after reflecting on the 27 motions over the lunch hour, um, it would be, uh, in terms of our capacity to be able to deliver on this, would be suggesting a change, date, change the due date to Q2 of 2024 and with the understanding that we wouldn't be conducting engagement on this work. Okay, so. is that your understanding, Councillor Nack? Yes. Good, okay, thank you. Now, uh, okay, uh, anyone to, any further questions on this? Seeing none, to speak. To close. Oops, sorry, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to, to quickly speak to um, the fact that I won't be able to support this motion. I think that uh, this discussion has been ongoing for, for many, many years, and I think what we have before us is, is the best, uh, or sorry, the, cur the, the new zoning bylaw has um, the best, best technical advice. I think, um, you know, having, having seen the impacts of some of the contextual zoning regulations in the past, I think it offers a huge amount of, of challenges and costs uh, that to me work against the spirit of, of the bylaw that we, we just passed. Um, I think that I, the concerns around height, the concerns around height have existed at 8.9 meters. I don't know that, um, that, that, that uh, 10 meters um, will specifically help address those challenges um, while it will have significant impacts on, um, on those trying to build. So I think, again, it will be a living document. Uh, the team, I believe, is preparing a one-year review, open to continuing to, to review this, but at this time I don't uh, think that it is in the spirit of, of the bylaw that we just passed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll just be brief as well. I understand the intent of the motion, uh, but in my view, it is counter to the spirit of many of the changes in the bylaw that we just passed uh, and will create additional complexity and barriers to housing diversity, uh, which is um, the opposite of the direction that we're, we're really trying to go. Um, and yeah, for me, I, I mean, I don't intend to necessarily support all of the subsequent, um, just to receive more information. I think um, we need to be thoughtful in um, the work that we're directing, given that there's already a lot on, on the table and, and on administration's plate. Um, I think we need to <clears throat> really ensure that the work we're directing is truly in line with city plan. Um, yeah, and, and from my perspective, this, this reads as a down zoning, essentially, from what we what we just passed, um, and the actual structure of of the subsequent is problematic for me as well. If we're going to be discussing height, I think there's um, better ways to go about that um, instead of being uh, so prescriptive in uh, in the way we're going about it. So I'll leave it there, but I can't support this. Thank you, Councillor Salvador, Councillor Reyes. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I, I really appreciate Councilor Nak put this motion on the floor, and then I am go I'm going to fully support it. Uh, there are a few reasons. Uh, I had my own um, amendment regarding the heights uh, for the building and in the residential RA zone. Um, but I look at this motion actually covered what I was going and to put on the floor. Um, I think, yes, there are some technical uh, factors change rega regarding the, the heights. Uh, but if you look at there are some increase and decrease and actually provide a very balanced approach to address the each neighborhood's specific situation. And I thought this, uh, this motion actually wording in the way can cover so many different diversity uh, neighborhood characters and based on what existing already and for in the neighborhood. Uh, I think that's provided the opportunity and for um, for us as a council to address the concern we heard from many speakers and also provide the future opportunity and f for us to look at and to make any adjustment when we implement this new bylaw. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, well, I, I was hoping I wouldn't say anything else, Mr. Mayor, but uh, um, I will be voting for this and not because I uh, agree with uh, the core uh, ask, um, uh, uh, well, let's get it straight. The core ask is just for information. Um, and I agree with that. And that's why I will be voting for this. Um, unless there is some, you know, incredibly uh, compelling new information that comes forward in this report, I don't see myself changing my stance on uh, how I supported uh, the original provisions in the ZBR. So again, it's simply because uh, if we can get all of that information about uh, why it is the way it is written in the CBR and have that in one spot that we can point to, that it's actually going to be incredibly helpful over the next few years. Um, and for that reason, I will be supporting this because I am uh, generally very supportive of getting more information in an organized fashion that I can share with residents. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? Yep, I have the chair. I will not be voting for this because we just went through a lengthy five-day-long, six-day-long, sorry, uh, process of, uh, you know, debating the, these changes, uh, uh, heights and setbacks and everything else, right? So a report that will kind of generate something different six months from now when we would not even know the effect of the bylaw, right, I think. So that's the reason. I also don't want to give false hope to the people who made presentations. Now it's very clear to them what will be built, what the height be. Now if we're opening it up again, I think we give them hope that may not be realistic uh, in, the, in the future. And third one is that, which main one, that administration has a process in place to review and evaluate the bylaw. And through that process, they will identify what is working, what is not working, what needs to be changed. I think we need to trust that process. And through, um, uh, you know, our officials are professional in their fields, right? And uh, they have committed to under ongoing undertaking of that uh, that evaluation, we I think that is the better process instead of us being more prescriptive on uh, on what to do, what not to do. So for that reason, I will not be uh, supporting similar type of uh, proposed changes uh, in the uh, in the uh, in in the subsequent as well. Right. So yeah. Uh, with that, I will take the chair back. Return. And I will. Good? Okay. I'll call the vote.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Next one. is Councillor Jans, second by Councillor Wright, amenity contributions. Councillor Jans to introduce. Yeah, very quickly, this is just trying to get at, um, we used to get a lot of value capture through DCs, especially around playgrounds and, and uh, small amenities when a new building went in. With this new move, um, with the new bylaw, there will be fewer DCs. This is trying to uh, have administration take a look at are there areas where we can um, get greater public amenity um, support through uh, some of the areas uh, that are uh, would would formerly be DCs now now could be contemplated through other zoning. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Before we go to open up questions again, similar question to. Uh, administration is it doable within the existing budget does it require service package and the timing uh, the motion is clear and administration has capacity to do this with the due date listed okay got it okay questions now please okay so councillor rice go ahead please uh, so to the mover what does that mean, the green building, and not limited to the green building, and it, with the, and additional bedroom? Can you explain a little bit more about the public and the private, and the private amenities related to this? Uh, it's an open-ended uh, opportunity to look at, and and you see, it's it's not limited to, um, so. I'm thinking of an example of a building that that uh, the applicant would be looking at um, in a couple of years ago where they would want say slightly higher height and in exchange they would say well we'll put this much money towards the playground or maybe we'll do uh, a, a a green amenity like it could it could be it could be some uh, uh, they could be going net zero passive house or solar or something like that, or it could be something like additional trees or some other some other sustainability type green in terms of sustainability type um, trade. It could also be looking at more three or four bedroom units. It could be uh, a number of different pieces there. The the idea being, okay, well, we as the regulator are saying yes, you can go higher in density, but in exchange, these are some of the things we would like to see. So. I, I'm trying not to be too specific, like, oh, you, you agree to get off gas or fully electrify or have heat pumps or something. I'm trying to, I'm trying to just be uh, more, more open-ended so admin can take a more thorough look at this. Uh, so do we have that, uh, this pilot, does this pilot has that uh, authority and to look, at, look into some regulation and for the private amenities? Because right now we covered both public, public and private. As I was wondering for the private piece. If I could offer some assistance here, it's, uh, Jamie Johnson up here on the second row. Okay. So yes, um, because it talks about doing it through the rezoning process, it would be a matter of bringing up back suggestions that would contemplate what you would write into the zones as requirements, and and within that, private amenities is completely appropriate, as is community contributions could be linked into that as needed. So this would be about additional green space on site, for example, would be a private amenity as compared to contribution to a community league park or something, which would be a public amenity. Both of those can be written in. It would have to be specifically written in, but, but the authority is there. So then the, the last question, thank you for that. That's helpful. Um, so last question about the community amenity contribution. Contribution is a direct control. And so it's my understanding we have the report will come back in December and specific talk about the community amenities. And then I just want to say what's the difference between these two work, is there a need repeat work and uh, with the work is already ongoing. Uh, so Councillor, uh, this work uh, would be separate from what's coming back in December. This is about private development uh, in terms of, well this motion is about private development in terms of uh, upzoning uh, and any amenities that can be gained through that process. So is it is different from what our community amenities, specifically we have the framework is 
underway, and then to talk about that community amenities. So I just wondering, is there overlap there? Because this motion specifically includes updates to that city policy. Councilor Rice, are you considering the developer contributed uh, to affordable housing report that is coming in December? No, it's not that one. It's about when the community is the different reports we discussed back to earlier in summer about the community amenities. So I couldn't remember exactly the report name. I just wondering, and then if there anybody online and could comment on that because this to me is a little bit confusing and also overlap to the work. Councilor, it would be different. Um, I'm not entirely certain what's coming back in December, but I, I do know that it's not dealing with policy C599 uh, and that developer uh, community amenity contributions. Uh, so this would be separate and different than that work. So the outcome for this amendment is we will get more green spaces and during de development? Not necessarily. Uh, the outcome of this work will be providing options on the possibility of uh, gaining contributions of amenities through the rezoning process. That it could include green space, it could include uh, green building, it could include family units uh, or affordable housing for that matter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So that concludes the questions on uh, motion subsequent number two. Now to speak. Seeing none, to close, Councillor Jans? Nothing to add. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we are on to number three, Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Tang, sec second by Councillor Tang, sorry. Councillor Stevenson to uh, introduce, please. Thank you. Uh, this motion is in response to some of the concerns we heard uh, from uh, members of my community in particular who, who have concerns around the concentration of some services in our, in our neighborhood. I, I see things a bit differently. I think, um, I think that there's a broad range of, of services and, and housing that can really be a huge part of the solution. Um, however, we, we certainly have seen some challenges with, uh, you know, the, 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 the impact on surrounding businesses and residents of large footprint uh, congregate shelter spaces. So this motion would provide an opportunity as the city is reviewing our minimum emergency shelter standards to see what um, could be incorporated or included as a, as a future zoning bylaw renewal. Recognizing the zoning bylaw can't um, solve all those problems, I think it is a tool that's worth exploring for how we can strengthen uh, regulations moving forward. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So same similar question, Kim, on uh, capacity, does it require additional resources and the timing? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to pass it to Stacy from our housing team who would be leading this work. Okay. Good afternoon, Council. It's Stacey Galatly, branch manager for social development. Uh, I believe this uh, motion is clear uh, and the fourth quarter 2024, uh, while perhaps uh, tight in alignment with other housing initiatives that we have going on, uh, will certainly be doable for administration. Sorry, you can do that within existing resources, right? Sorry, that, was, that part wasn't clear to me. Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't able to hear you. Are you able to uh, complete this work within the exist, existing work plan, sorry, existing resources? Yes. Okay, got it. Questions? No questions to speak. Councilor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Very quickly, I think, you know, this uh, one thing that we hear over and over again, and we heard that during uh, uh, the discussion on the bylaw as well, that city's ability or lack of ability to decentralize services uh, uh, from the core to other areas of the city, and also looking for other ways, like if we're going to be providing services within those existing 
areas where services are now, the standards are, are not appropriate sometimes, they're lower. And uh, any, any way we can explore that to improve the quality of life and, uh, and, and, the, and not only for those who actually use those, uh, the shelters and uh, uh, services, but also for the residents in that area and business in that area. I hope this will allow us to uh, have further discussion on uh, on on that very important goal of uh, of uh, of the city. So I'll be supporting this. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll take the chair back. Return. And to close, Councilor Stevenson. Okay. Okay. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And now we are on to subsequent number four, moved by Councillor Rutherford, second by Councillor Knack. Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead and introduce the item. Yeah, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot through the conversation. We've talked about, you know, climate, we've talked about housing affordability, even heritage preservation and as I've been walking through a few neighborhoods I even in our previous to what we just passed there's so many ginormous houses that I'm seeing built as single-family homes that don't really help with climate don't really help with affordability and we do have a lot of us incentives built into the current bylaw that we just approved in terms of floor area ratio so I wanted to just have uh, administration look at what are the opportunities for something that would disincentivize, not prevent or stop, but really asking the question of do single family homes, should they have the same developmental rights as multi-unit housing is really what I'm getting at in terms of the same, should they have the same box in which to play? And, and so that's really the heart of this is to, to get a report that will, will talk about what could be done around that and what considerations and also give opportunity for uh, you know, when it comes to committee for, for folks to, to tell us what are some of the, the, the other things. And, and the reason I also wanted to report, sorry, just quickly, is uh, that I do know there's a lot of nuance to this. Single, single detached housing doesn't mean single family. And so what does that look like in practice? And so I think there is a bit more nuance to this that needs to be parsed out uh, within a report, but it's definitely something that I think, given what we've heard, through this public hearing, we, we, we owe it to have a conversation about do they get the same developmental rights to play within that same box. Um, so that's what this would generate. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cardwell. Thank you. So I'm thinking of um, not just infill development, but greenfield development. Is, is it fair to say that um, almost all of the housing, maybe not the um, the larger multi-unit residential apartments, but in a suburban context, almost all of the greenfield development will consist of the small scale residential zone? There's a mix, I would say, in developing communities. Um, those scale or small scale residential would be maybe 50%. Travis, do you want to comment? Uh, but by land area, it'll be a little bit more than that. Um, but so the the new residential small scale flex zone uh, would be applied broadly. Uh, that'll basically take the place of I think six to seven zones that we use right now, um, and there'll be a mix of housing in there uh, depending on uh, the velocity of market sales within it, whether it's singles, duplexes, um, or, or semis, sorry, triplex or rows. In single family home, or pardon me. I'll trying to use the same vernacular. Single attached housing includes things like zero lot line homes, that kind of a thing. Correct. Uh, it also includes the potential of secondary suites or garden suites uh, as accessory. So I will, I'll go to the speaker in a, or to the mover in a minute, but depending on just how far this disincentivizes, this would potentially severely limit or remove single detached homes from being built across the city? Am I reading that correctly? Or are you reading that the same way? It would uh, 
potentially, um, I guess, one of the outcomes. We don't want to predict outcomes. Um, but yeah, there would be restrictions on uh, that, that use type uh, while allowing uh, either today's standards or, or other types of standards uh, in the zone for the other types of uses in that, the multi-unit area. Have we not been consistently getting feedback, at least recently, that a significant portion of market demand is for single detached homes in the 60 to 70 percent? Is that, is that reasonable to say? I think we've seen significant innovation in that in the, the single family housing area, um, just in terms of the types of product that they can build on that zero lot line uh, with the potential of three stories uh, without a basement um, and how that affects affordability. You lost me there, how that affects affordability. Uh, the different types of options on whether or not you can use less land or you don't have to dig a basement, which would require additional height uh, to get the same amount of floor area. Um, than if you were less expensive? Is that the thinking? Or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think I understood, I'll go to the mover. I think I understood you to say that your intent is to make the box in which single detached homes can be built smaller, a smaller box that it has to fit in. Is that right? I would say that no, my intent isn't necessarily to do that. It's to have a conversation about what would be the impacts of doing this and what do we, what could we or potentially should we consider, if anything at all. That's the intent of this, right? So I think there's just a lot of nuance around this that I wasn't prepared to make an amendment, but I think it was a conversation that we have to have. This is simply generating that report, as, we, as we've mentioned before, to exactly parse out some of those, those nuances that I think exist with this. Maybe the, it will simply be a height reduction, as was uh, mentioned in the first one, but maybe it will be a floor area ratio, or maybe it will be nothing at all, or different context contemplated for RSF versus RS zone. So I, I really am leaving it open to, to what what could we consider within that? I don't so, know if that answers your question. Well, kind of, but I, I guess what I, I'm not seeing what you're saying reflected in this motion. So uh, with respect to the, the mm -hmm. motions just previously uh, discussed, the notion was offered that we don't want to offer false hope or we don't want to put yeah. something out there that might not actually happen. And I'm wondering yeah. about the contrary here, that if yeah. we start talking about quote unquote, disincentivizing yeah. uh, single detached homes that, you know, the home, the home building market, which runs across Canada, starts saying Edmonton doesn't want single detached homes and how is that going yeah. to play? I, I, I hear what you're saying and I think for me the, the intention was we have incentives built in, we don't have any disincentives and I have seen a lot of uh, really expensive single detached housing in mature neighbourhoods. So I've that was the intent, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Wright. To the mover, what's the technical specifications of ginormous? <laughs> but seriously. Well, no, like, ser no, no, well, as per what we just approved, somebody could have a three-story, 10.5, 45% site coverage, single detached house for one family of four. But what if it's a multi-generational family? Well, and that's exactly why I felt like there needed to be some more nuance to this. That's why I said I wasn't prepared to just make an amendment on height or floor area ratio or any of those things uh, to the bylaw before we did third reading because I feel like there is a lot of nuance to this. There is a lot of context that we need to consider. And so, you know, again, if we do continue on the path with what we have laid out in the bylaw currently, at least this report would be able to allow me to go back to my constituents that I represent and say this is why, yes, there can be this bill, but these are considerations that we need to, con that, that were taken into when we made that intentional decision. Okay. So I guess to administration, were these already taken into consideration when developing what the, 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 the coverage and, and, and height would be? I mean, there were a lot of factors taken into consideration, Councillor. Um, the the sort of broader s simplicity of, you know, here's your residential use and here's the box that it, it can fit within was sort of a prevailing direction that we 
uh, landed on uh, fairly early into the project. Um, and again, as, as was raised before, yes, things, things about, um, you know, multi-generational living was, was a consideration that factored into it as well. Um, as well as things like in the, in the developing area, um, you know, we get a lot of direct control zones, for example, for um, different types of housing products and, and um, you know, it, looking at some of the trends behind those direct control zones um, also help to inform like that zone and, and the, the rules around single detached housing there as well. Okay, so, and you said the decision was made fairly early on. Was any adjustments made based on the public's feedback or feedback from any other stakeholders? Y yes, of course. Yeah, like so. So when I say the decision was made early on, what I mean is the the de decision to take the approach of you know what development can fit within the box um, when it comes to the specifics around what is the box around things like site coverage and setbacks. Yes, there were adjustments made based on engagement throughout the process. Okay, but not with the line of sight of disincentivizing. That single family. No, that wasn't one of our uh, of our approaches. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I think mainly mainly I have some questions to the mover, um, who is currently occupied. Um, thank you. The. Um, you know, I, I think I think what I'm what I'm hearing your general intent was is that, you know, we were creating some additional allowances through the renewed zoning bylaw to um, encourage some of our strategic objectives around compact development and mix of housing types, um, and that your your thinking was maybe, you know do additional single detached homes meet our objectives in the same way as some of these other housing types? Is that the general? Yeah, thing? and I would, I would argue or contend that it's easier for me to say, okay, yeah, that's that, that three-story building that's now being built next to you and Im impacting your, your sun shadowing is gonna allow eight more f people or families to call it home rather than one. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is going to be a hard, like, that is what I'm trying to, to, to understand, right? Like they're not, right. yeah. Well, and, and you know, and I think, I mean, I think there's, there's multiple dimensions to this because I think you're right. Part of the strategic objective is, you know, housing more people than were maybe previously housed. I think the other case may be, you know, this, this house coming next to you that has these impacts is happening next to you instead of on the outskirts where we're having to pay for, for more infrastructure and, um, those pieces. So I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, you know, one, one piece that I had heard was, uh, you know, maybe at some point maintaining the existing allowances for single detached homes that currently, that, or that previously existed in bylaw 12800, and then allowing that, that additional site coverage or height for some of the other forms of housing. Is that sort of the, the extent to which you mean disincentivize, or do you mean sort of going further than that? Yeah, and I mean, Definitely not an urban planner. So, w in the many iterations of the bylaw that I read, we had incentives on mat retaining mature trees. We had incentives right. on floor area ratio for family oriented housing, uh, as examples. And so, this was just okay. So we're 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 incentivizing the built form we want to see. How are we disincentivizing built form that maybe doesn't cre create those same city plan goals? Right, and I think, and I mean, I think that's that's truly what I'm hearing. It's it's about just ensuring that we're we're incentivizing the things that we want, and you know, maybe just to bounce an idea around, because I, I would assume to the mover, you know, a single detached home that had a secondary suite or a garden suite, that that wouldn't necessarily be problematic on a on a single lot, for example. Yeah, that was that was the the intent that I was getting at, and I just used the wording that was provided to sure. me by administration, but I don't think it's it's the same thing if you have Other like suites. a house and then a secondary suite and, a, and then a garden suite. That's, that's three units to me on a single lot as opposed to one unit on a lot. Yeah, and maybe again, just to administration, uh, would, 
again, for me, it seems just all around the framing. I think there's a lot of agreement in terms of what, what the outcome that we might want to be achieving is. <clears throat> but just wondering, again, how that's, how that's being framed. I think Councillor Cartmel raised some good points. I, I mean, this also maybe seems like a density minimum that we'd be looking for or some sort of... I don't know if that's an easier way to look at it or if that introduces its own complexities. One of the challenges that I see with, you know, what's being contemplated here is that you might build a single attached house today, but later you might choose to add a, a secondary, secondary suite, suite and you might choose to add a backyard house. It doesn't always come at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, any, any other challenges that you see or, or like other approaches, again, recognizing the strategic objectives that we want to see that strategic alignment, like any, any variations on this theme that you could see being a bit more workable? So, so Councillor, uh, I, th I think the struggle here for us right now is that it's getting away from that general philosophy of the zoning bylaw in which that we looked at basically the box uh, and yeah. not necessarily the users within it when it comes to this RS zone. Uh, so whether it's single, semis, uh, row housing, uh, that box or that impact uh, on shadowing in the neighboring property is the same regardless. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but yep. that's a good reminder of the form-based approach of the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I guess hearing some of the flags from colleagues and administration, I wonder almost to get to the same intent of what I see being put forward here, which I which I agree with. Um, I wonder just a bit of a flip of the wording instead of options to disincentivize, if it, ha uh, if it said options to further incentivize the development of multi-unit housing through modifications to build form, um, site coverage height, et cetera, if that would be friendly, because I think we'd end up in the same, like we'd, we'd end up with similar information in front of us. Um, I just think the language of, of a disincentivizing can become a little problematic, um, as, was, as was pointed out. So I wonder if that would be friendly, just flipping, flipping that wording to further incentivize the development of multi-unit housing. Um, and if not, I, and that's to the mover, and I guess to the assembly if that would be friendly or not, and if not, I can put that forward as an amendment. I, I think that that remains the intent as long as the report would still cover cover you know all those forms of housing but yes is that a friendly can we just uh, restate yes. that so that we can uh, put it into the motion if it is friendly can you reinstate yes. that, please? Yes, and I just put it in the chat as well. That administration provide a report outlining options to further incentivize the development of multi-unit housing through modifications to build form regulations, such as site coverage, height, and building length, and uh, for the small-scale residential zones. Okay. Is that a friendly to the house? I need to know. Okay, yeah. Councillor... Paquette and Councillor Principe. Yes, that's friendly. Sure. Yes? Yep, that's friendly. Okay. Councillor Hamilton, everyone good? Okay. All right. Carry on with questions. More questions, Councillor Salvador? No. Okay. Uh, Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Um, so if I'm... I guess just one, I think then, if we're gonna go with the this version of the wording, I'm assuming, Clerk, that you'll also modify the, the heading, because the heading right now is still the language around disincentivize, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, just give us a moment. No and problem. We'll fix that up. Yeah, and, and just so I understand, based on the line of questioning with Councillor Stevenson then, the zoning bylaw that we just passed already is there with a premise of encouraging diverse forms and diverse housing types, right? Correct? I see lots of- Yes. Right. So this is just, what more do we need to do? Right. 
Right. I think that's what the contents of the report would have to look at. And I would just add, because um, Mr. Mayor may ask me about resources and capacity oh, yeah. to, to do this. Uh, yes, I didn't ask about this, so that's thank okay. you for the reminder, yeah. Um, something like this might be one that we take a little bit more time to co consider um, versus the second quarter of 2024. And one other comment I would add that, um, and maybe this is just, um, it's referencing multi-unit housing, but there are other housing types such as mm -hmm. semi-detached row housing. So I just wanted to highlight that distinction in terms of multi-unit housing as being the one thing we're trying to incentivize through this motion, or is it mm -hmm. just the range of um, units that are maybe higher than one in terms of a single detached house? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a that's a great point, and. Um, and so if, if that second, so it sounds like second quarter 2024 will be challenging, um, what would be a more realistic timeline for you then? If this is about kind of that added layer, never mind the other things that we do need to address as part of the existing proposed. I would suggest Q2, Q4 of 2024 in, in being able to do a more robust analysis and options around an approach to incentivizing multi-unit housing. I guess to the mover, would that timeline be more sufficient to you? Oh yeah, like whatever okay. administration needs, I, yep, yeah, I have no problem with. Okay. So fourth quarter 2024, good. Great, yeah, thank you very much. That's all the questions I had, I thought you Thank you, can you move the second round please? Sure, second round. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson. Well, on, on the question of timelines, I was wondering if it might even make sense to wait um, for a full year of implementation to see what the stats are in terms of the, the balance of single detached home versus other forms of housing. Is, would that be friendly to the mover? And then would that fit with administration? I, I think that makes a lot of sense in terms of a year reflection on what has happened through the zoning bylaw renewal in terms of development outcomes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm not sure if we just need to change the date or uh, if we just added the wording that is part of the one year update. Or just change for first quarter 2025. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And Rutherford is okay so with that. So the quarterly report, or sorry, the um, annual report we've identified as a Q2 of 2025. Great. Q2. Q2 2025, okay, good. All right, so we'll change that to Q2 2025. Uh, Councillor Wright. I, I'm just trying to think what sort of incentives would be available, like are we talking like financial grants or like beyond, you know, allowing the builder to, to sell four homes in a row house rather than just one house? I think that's part of the work, um, but it could take the form of uh, not many things, whether it's a financial incentive, faster permitting timelines, um, regulations within the zone that provide an incentive in some way. Uh, those are just off the top of my head, but that's that's part of what we'd want to review. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that question for the intensive house what is the scope for intensive? Because we're, we are talking about the bylaw uh, subsequent motion. And then specific for this zone bylaw, the scope is land use. And so this, I'm a little bit confused. Is there any other policy tool could address this instead of we use bylaw to address it? Because based on original intention is very clear talk about the site coverage heights and building lengths still fall under the scope. So right now with this change, I'm a little bit struggling. And those might be other options, Councillor Rice, in terms of um, different regulations that would allow different development opportunities, whether it's uh, the development box is bigger or, or different from what's contemplated in the zone now. So right now it's, it's bigger. Well, right now it's the same, whether it's a multi-unit house or a single detached house. To me, an intensive life is more look at it from land use perspective, not, not look at it from financial grant or marketing and perspective. This is why the confusing come in. 
I, I'm not sure. I just feel this is not clear to me, and then between the marketing uh, demanding approach or also the uh, land use. The, the wording of the motion uh, says through modification to build form regulations. Um, I would say that if we wanted the scope to be expanded, that that would have to there'd have to be a change to the motion. But what's the scope? Maybe maybe ask the mover because the original scope is clear. I understand that intention, mm -hmm. but with this change, maybe ask. I again not an expert in planning, so you know those those examples. I would be welcoming being included. I think while this does stem from the subsequent to zoning bylaw. I think it's, it also needs to, it, the subsequence can be a bit broader in scope than just the zoning bylaw in terms of after work and, and addressing some of those things we heard as concerns. And then if that is the case, I want to go back to the uh, former one. Do we say uh, if you, you can in increase the site coverage or you can increase the height or you can increase the building lens and based on if you build more unions. Is that understanding correct? Based on the wording right now we have, that could become intensive, uh, in incentive. What's listed here is just some examples. So it could possibly uh, be That increased. could be possible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rice. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, I uh, just need to close the loop on the language of multi-unit housing. I don't want to be exclusively talking about multi-unit as a type, like a typology. I, I guess do we need to change that or is the intent clear that it is above a single unit? Thank you for the question, Councillor. Yeah, I, I agree. If we want it to be other types of housing that are uh, denser forms than single detached housing, we'd have to probably change the wording um, to... Um, we could maybe go with uh, multi-dwelling housing, since the single detached is just one dwelling. Uh, and the moment you add in secondary okay. suites or backyard housing, you'd have multiple dwellings. That works for me if that's friendly. Just, I'm trying to make sure the intent is really clear and that the wording is reflective of that. Okay, fresh to the mover. Okay, friendly to the assembly. I, I'll here see for Councillor Piquet, Councillor Principe, Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, sure. it's friendly. Good. Sure. Okay, got it. Okay. Is that it? Okay, that concludes the questions. All right, then the hiding has been changed as well. Okay. Uh, now to speak. Anyone to speak? One, two, three, to close. Oh, sorry, Constant Tang, go ahead. Um. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the efforts to kind of amend this a bit on the fly, uh, which kind of speaks to a little bit of m my underlying discomfort with this um, from the first version to now th one, two, three versions later. Um, I appreciate the intent and I think it's a good one. I think there is a law already as part of the proposed. Um, while this is still quite a ways away with a, with a new timeline of second quarter 2025, um, you know, I feel like there could be some, especially with, so with the original one, you know, I definitely saw some unintended consequence and the, and the message not only does it send to, uh, whether the market or, or even the public, I, I understand this is an information, but I also think in the next 18 months, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to do some work, um, whether it's talking to industry, talking to communities, and then perhaps come back with better framing of this issue that we're trying to, because we don't know if this is, you know, trying to frame this issue that we're trying to solve, uh, whether as a, t as a notice of motion. I just find amending this on the fly, I, 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 I worry that we're then missing something else here. Um, 
so for that reason, I'm not going to support it right now, but I, I appreciate the intent, and I think there could be a better approach to get at the same outcome. Thank you, Constantine. Constantine Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, uh, before the uh, amendments, it was going to uh, be difficult to vote in favor of this. Now uh, I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rutherford to close. No? All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we are on to number five. Moved by Councillor Salvador, second by Councillor Paquette. Councillor Salvador, can you please make the introduction? Sure, uh, and I don't need to read it in again, do I? No, okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, essentially this this subsequent looks to address a number of the concerns that we heard uh, through the public hearing related to uh, a desire for additional climate action to be uh, embedded into the zoning bylaw itself, uh, recognizing that there is already some work underway related to the climate resilient uh, planning and development framework. Uh, this motion makes it explicit that we will get to have that conversation at that time, um, including things like solar and EV readiness, uh, but not limited to solar and EV readiness, because I think uh, there are a number of other things that uh, may be good fits. Uh, to include as um, as potential amendments. So uh, this is really just asking for an additional report to come back uh, so that we can have that conversation, but not directing anything specifically at this time because I think we do need um, to have a fulsome conversation about it. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, to Kim on uh, resources, timing, ability to, or does it require additional resources? This is ongoing work. Uh, we recognize the importance and have existing resources dedicated to do this work. Um, and the motion is really clear. And the timing? And the timing works. OK, yeah. got it. OK. All right, questions. Councillor Paquette. Yep. No, thank you. And uh, I love this motion. Uh, quick question for administration. Um, so Councillor Salvador did say including but not limited to. Uh, solar and EV readiness. Um, it's the EV readiness that I'm uh, thinking about, and that is uh, in terms of the uh, um, capacity of the grid, but also that EV may not actually be the technology of the future. And so um, a few questions around how that works as far as making it mandatory as a rough end. So um, that's sort of something that you'll be exploring. Councillor Paquette, yes, that is something that we'll take a look at. Um, our transition plans are they're not um, solely linked to one particular form of technology. We want to um, use anything that will get us to uh, meet our goals. Yeah, and, and I think that was the reason why that wasn't already in the ZBR, but after hearing from the community, it sounds like folks at least want this issue explored. And that's your read on this as well? Correct, yes, it is. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any more questions? Seeing none, to speak, to speak. Councillor, Councillor Tang, you want to speak, right? Go, go ahead, please. Just very briefly, yeah. um, I think this is a really good motion. I think uh, there's a lot of these specific issues that came up that I think this particular forum uh, for the framework is the better um, policy tool to address a lot of the concerns that came up during the public hearing. Um, so thank you for putting this forward. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Salvador to close. Nothing further. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next is number six, Councillor Cartmel, and second by Councillor Rice. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I believe, first of all, that this is a reduction from the old zoning bylaw from 150 meters 
squared to some lower number, and the number was picked as 75 meters squared. That's my general understanding. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. correct, Councilor. Okay, thank you. I so I was just doing some math, and because uh, math is fun, uh, and looking at sort of various lot sizes and and just you know single residential lot sizes. Uh, and so I start with the one uh, that I own, uh, which is roughly 55 feet by 110 feet. At the 75 meter squared limit, uh, the number of units on that property would be seven, whereas with a 100 meter squared limit, it would be five. And I just, it just feels better with five instead of seven. I, you know, the home I own has four bedrooms and arguably one in a basement. You could get, you know, a five almost dwelling kind of a house on there, but seven sounds like a lot. So I'm just wondering about, you know, a bit of a, a reduction in that. Now there might be some nuance that needs to be added here. So I'll rely on comments of others to, to offer that perhaps. Uh, if you get smaller uh, to the smaller lots, like 25 by 100 or 30 by 100, the 100 meter limit would limit it to two units instead of three. And so if perhaps this needs to be adjusted to say uh, no less than three, but 100 square meters on a lot size. Uh, at the other end, I wonder about the eight unit limit if more than one somewhat typical uh, residential lot or more than one residential lot were, were consolidated. So you had two or three lots and you would, you would, in consolidating that lot, be limited to eight. So I was sort of playing with the ratios. I'm not sure if the ratio entirely does it, but I, uh, I think 100 is a better number than 75, quite frankly, and open to questions or offerings. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Um, just a clarification of the previous answer from administration. So it was 150 square meters in the in the previous bylaw, but I understand that was for principal unit. Yes, thank you for asking for that clarification, Councillor. I thought about that after my answer. Yes, that it, it, the new the new um, 75 square meters doesn't include uh, secondary suites. Or sorry, it would include secondary suites, but the 150 didn't. So looking at it that way, it is a, it is a fairly Obviously, it's very comparable. Yeah, so maybe maybe to the mover, with that understanding, so previously it was 150 square meters for a principal dwelling, but that could have included a secondary dwelling. So effectively, 75 per dwelling to, to the mover. I'm sorry, I missed that. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so the clarification we just got from administration is that the previous bylaw had the 150 square meters per principal unit. Principal unit, yeah. which could have a secondary unit. So that right. was sort of effectively. My my assumption is that it was taking 150 divided by two because you have two dwellings. Yeah, and I think that um, that's kind of that's why I mentioned maybe there needs to be some evolution of this motion to say three as a minimum because as I understand it right now uh, uh, we don't longer have that distinction between principal dwellings and other mm -hmm. dwellings uh, and you could get a garden suite and a, and a basement or, or suite which would be three on a property mm -hmm. loosely so loosely termed yeah. yeah and I mean I think I think that my hesitation yeah I'm, I'm very hesitant around this one I think that um, you know, with the existing 150 square meter um, restriction, I don't think we saw sort of out of control overdevelopment of, of specific sites. I think, uh, I, I'm supposed to be phrasing this as a question, just wondering, so, th so the intent would be to reduce the number of units on a, on a site. It would be uh, that and bring a bit more proportionality to it. Uh, the 75 meters squared feels to me to be, leads to somewhat of a disproportionality to the number of units that would be reasonably accommodated on some of our typical residential lots. And I guess maybe that, that reasonableness, you know, I would maybe uh, turn to administration and, and assume that, you know, we don't always see a maximization of the allowance. So to fit um, eight units on a, on a smaller site, um, those units would necessarily be smaller um, and as such may not meet a certain market demand. Is that is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And so I guess where I struggle is if, if there were a market, if there were, um, there was a demand or a need 
for, for smaller units. Again, knowing that we want to be providing a diversity of housing, and particularly a diversity of locations of housing, so that someone who maybe wants a micro suite can choose to live, um, you know, in the interior of a neighborhood as opposed to only on the edges. Again, I'm just worried, worried about the, the implications or the restrictions that this change could potentially put on it. So is that to me? Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking at my house and quite, I'm actually looking at my house because we might be empty nest here in, in mm. 18 months or two years. So, uh, you know, a suite in the back, a suite in my basement, a suite over the garage. Sure, okay, that might be two or even three living units in that space. Eight? Eight, eight is wow, uh, right? So, but, but, so. But I wonder again, like what if it was eight units for adults with autism? Um, and so there was a community component, maybe maybe not not communal space, but you know a, a village or a seniors cluster homes that could all be there, right? Like I just think again when we are thinking about the diversity of housing that we want to be at least providing the opportunity for. So I think it becomes a, a question of, you know, what what is that number? Should it be eight? Should it be six? Uh, should it be four? Um, you know, I look at you know the. We talk about the prototypical Golden Girls house, you know, four, like my house has four bedrooms. Four bedrooms with common living areas seems like the right size for a house that fits in the box. Well, or the, the right size for a certain demographic of folks who have certain needs, but, but maybe not for a different demographic of, of folks who have different needs, right? Like, I think that's maybe the tension. But appreciate the responses. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stevenson. Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, I appreciate the clarification around uh, sort of what was in the previous bylaw, new bylaw versus what's being proposed here. Um, so just to be crystal clear, uh, what's being proposed in this subsequent would actually be a reduction in allowable unit density compared to what is allowed under the new bylaw. Compared to what's allowed in the RF3 zone. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, and then maybe just to the mover, you know, you mentioned the form of sort of a single family home plus a basement suite and garden suite, or maybe even like a duplex with basement suites and garden suites in the rear. Um, in terms of form, that seems, uh, from your perspective, appropriate. Um, if the form was the same, but there were more units inside, like is that, because that, that's, I'm, trying, I'm thinking of creative opportunities that might be available that won't actually change the form. And I know we, we often reference this when we're talking about heritage properties, uh, where you can actually retain the, the feel and the facade and the, the form of the building, but it's broken up in a different way inside. Um, thoughts on that piece? So I'm using the analogy of, of the home I own. Uh, if we change it from 100, from 75 meters squared to 100, then the allowable number on my property goes from eight to six it would still be six. It's on some of the, like, it's when you get down to the, like a 40 foot by 100 foot lot that you get down to three, or a 40 foot by 110 lot that you get to four. So um, I'm saying four feels right at my home, but what I'm proposing would see six as a limit. Okay, um, and maybe just to administration, like I, uh, I can appreciate that like, certain numbers might feel right or wrong based on various contexts, but I'm sure you arrived at this number with a fair amount of thought. Um, like, can you help me understand why you arrived at, at this number at 75? It was one of the best balances between negotiating um, the current RF3 being 150 per principal, which enables basement plus garden suite per unit, even in the context of a row house. So if you got a 450 square meter site, you could get not, you could have gotten nine units under twelve eight hundred, but now you're talking about six units under twenty thousand more. So that was the best balance we can come up with in response to no longer differentiating between accessory and principal dwellings, just calling them all dwellings. Right, right. So, in the situation that the mover is describing on their their lot aren't more units allowed, or weren't more units allowed under 12,800? Depending on the context, but generally in the RF3 zone for most lots, yes. It would have been tied to principal dwelling, which enabled two additional accessory units. 
Okay. And just per to principle. The, to the mover, you like were you uncomfortable with that in twelve eight hundred then as well? No, but I, I like let's be clear. Right now, today, on on my lot, you can have three: a principal plus two, secondary. That's three. What well, I'm proposing takes it to six. Multi-unit housing would be allowed under RF three. Correct under the pre under previous twelve hundred. Correct. Yes. So you would have been allowed more than three. You would yes. You would have been allowed six. Depending on the si the the size of your lot, you can you there's you can get up to twelve depending on how big the lot was. Yeah. On bigger lots, yes. Correct. That's why I'm exactly. that's why I'm talking about a ratio and not talking about a number. Okay. Um, well, I think that's it for me. Um, I might speak to this when the time's right. Thank you, Council Servador. That concludes the questions on this. Now to speak. We'll start with Council Salvador. I said I might speak. <laughs> you said, you said, okay, you, you don't want to, okay. No, well, that's okay, I'll speak to it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I am not able to support this subsequent. Um, this is, uh, from my perspective, a reduction in uh, allowable allowable density on um, on on RS sites, and uh, that, from my perspective, is not in line with the direction that we are trying to go with the bylaw, and is not in line with the direction we're trying to go with uh, city plan. I think it's really important that. We remain focused on opening the door to uh, more creative housing typologies uh, that that have not been allowed under the past bylaw, and I think that you know allowing for for smaller units ena enables things like cluster housing that we know uh, is an attractive form uh, for folks who might not be able to afford larger units in our mature neighborhoods. Opening the door for um, more attainable, accessible, seniors friendly housing um, or just more affordable options for young families who are trying to get their footing in some of our mature communities. Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's clear to me that um, even compared to previous bylaw 12800, um, higher densities and higher, higher unit counts were allowed uh, under multi-unit forms. So this really is a down zoning uh, and I, I won't be able to support that. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Similar comments to Councillor Salvador. I won't be able to support this. Um, you know, I think our experience recognizing that this would be a decrease from what was uh, allowed under uh, bylaw 12800 um, I think something that our experience with 12800 showed is that we don't often see sort of the pure maximization of, of zoning allowance. So just because eight units could be fit on a site, we didn't necessarily always see eight units being built. Um, instead, what we see is people building for their needs, and those needs can vary uh, across our community. What I like about the current uh, regulations in the new zoning bylaw is that it at least provides the option to meet those diverse needs. Um, you know, I honestly have concerns with the, the eight unit limit and, and have a subsequent related to that coming up. Um, but I think that the 75 square meters is a really great um, carry forward from the previous bylaw that I think strikes a great balance of, of the various objectives that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Before I go to Councillor Jens, I asked to, forgot to ask Councillor, so not, I forgot to ask Kim about uh, the uh, the timing and the resources. This works. Good for works. Us. Yes, Good. thank okay. you. Yeah. Constant yes. I'm trying to delete my speaking because both the previous speakers made the points I wanted to make. Okay. All right. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. I, I I don't disagree with the the intent of the information and getting that. I I think it's probably in my mind too early. I think we need to wait for the administration to see how the implementation goes and uh, learn from some of the uh, the lessons at that time if certain issues have been identified i think that would be the right time for us to uh, generate some uh, some reports so that same position that i took on the on the previous one on consular consular nax stands with this one too we just need there's a process in place we got to give that time for administration to uh, to to do so and then at that time probably if there's a need to revisit, revisit at that time. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the chair back and got to Councillor Cartman to close. Great, thank you. Um, 
I appreciate the the notion that uh, you know wait to see if there's a problem before you try to solve it. I I get that. It, it's, it's not unreasonable. There's also the question of providing uh, you know some some confidence about what's happening next door. And so when we spoke to the uh, zoning bylaw uh, just this morning, uh, a number of of us made the same comments that I'm about to make. That I we needed to pass that as a starting point, but it wasn't perfect. It needed refinements, and the refinements that what I was most focused on are in the the small residential zone, because the vast majority of comments we got were about what's going to happen next door. I don't want a 30 foot wall right on the fence line next to me. So we talked about a nuance to height. Uh, we heard people talk about eight units on a, on a residential lot that right now has one unit, uh, could create nuisance around parking and noise and, and those kinds of things. Should there be, is there some sort of a middle ground in terms of the maximum number of units and should that middle ground be proportional to the size of the lot? Uh, there's a lot of, of large residential lots in a lot of uh, our neighborhoods that could accommodate many more than eight units. Uh, but there's some that are less, and I think this proportionality is the question. Uh, I just um, look at what we've had uh, for standard residential lots as the city has evolved that have come from, um, you know, the house I, one of the houses I grew up in that was 55 by 130 feet. It had an enormous backyard. You could have, you could put three houses, three literal houses on that lot. Uh, so is there... You know, is there a contextual thing that we should be looking at? And I think there is. And I, uh, you know, on the one hand, I can see where three, in just about any place, three units is rather easily accommodated. But I can see in other places where if you push that to six or seven or eight, that is too many. And so this, I pick this as a middle ground, and I think we should explore a middle ground. Uh, and and understanding the tension around, is there a problem that we need to solve yet? also need to understand that there's a lot of people right now that are really concerned about everything that is in this bylaw and they want to see a bit of a crawl, walk, run uh, approach to some of these things and not, uh, you know, an immediate leap to the ultimate end. So uh, I encourage uh, my colleagues to support this and uh, leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Cardinal. Please vote. No. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Uh, getting on with the motion seven. Councillor Tang and I second that. Go ahead, please. Yes, I like to restate the, the motion. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, that administration provide a report on the status of city policy C601, affordable housing investment guidelines and the target of 16% affordable units of all units in each neighborhood, as well as information about current and additional measures that may be taken to increase affordable housing in areas where access is limited. I think today is still Q1 2025. Please make the introduction. Yes, um, you know, I think many speakers spoke very compellingly about uh, in particular, some of the concentration of housing and social services in some neighborhoods. And indeed, I think concentration um, is a major concern for, for many of these folks, but the fact is there's a need for um, housing across the city. And this policy is specific to housing and not necessarily some of the other uh, other concerns. Um, uh, but you know, I, I I do understand that there is work already kind of planned for this timeline. Um, I believe clarity is kindness, as many people in this room was was say, uh, to ensure that direction is provided. Um, and there's some specific uh, you know questions or specific the specific issues that I want to see addressed. And 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 I think this will actually offer a deeper dive on the policy review. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Before I go to uh Council members to ask questions. Same question, Kim. I'm going to pass it to Stacey Gallatly from Social Development. Okay, please go ahead, Stacey. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I uh, just want to know from you, from your department's uh, capacity point of view, uh, the uh, can this be done within existing resources 
or does it would, would it require a service package and the timing of the reporting back? Yes, thank you for that and my apologies. Uh, yes, we've reviewed uh, the motion is clear uh, and we see no challenge in uh, meeting the recommended timelines and could do so within uh, existing resources as it's uh, quite heavily bundled to some of the work we'll be doing uh, over the next year as this. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions, Council Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Really appreciate uh, this this subsequent. Um, just one one question. Uh, I wonder, in, in my experience, when communities are uh, referencing the sixteen percent affordable units, um, will will the report back offer just some clarity around the methodology for how that sixteen percent is calculated? Um, that's yeah. Some sometimes communities will not um, be reaching that that threshold of 16 percent um, at least based on the city's calculation and they feel that they are so just some additional clarity around um, around that method methodology would be appreciated I wonder if that could maybe to the mover could could that be included um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great point. I, I think I also heard there's some confusion around is it maximum 16%, minimum 16%, um, uh, hopefully, and, you know, what accounts for affordable housing, which we know is on a spectrum. So maybe I'll defer to administration to see if those questions can be answered. Yes, certainly we can include uh, some of that information. There isn't a, a source of truth uh, here. Uh, and so the team utilizes uh, internal processes and additional to data that's available uh, through other sources such as Statistics Canada, but we can certainly include that in the report. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Constance Salvador. Constance Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate this report. Um, I guess to administration, with this report, would you also, would you, do you see in this motion sort of how we're seeing the distribution play out currently within the city. So I do know that there's been a recent like sort of where are some of the city led or city affordable housing projects throughout the city. So how are we just ensuring that we're like, we're not reaching 16% in one neighborhood and then moving on to the next neighborhood and, and, and trying to target 16%, it's sort of more distributed. So would that be something you could cover in that report? Uh, yes, if I think I'm hearing uh, the comment or question correctly, I think that the intent is to give a picture of the current status uh, of what this looks like across and how we incentivize moving towards uh, those targets across the city. Across the city, yeah. Um, and so it would, but it would include sort of a looking back at the last three years of where that ha those new projects have been up up into let's say Q4 of 2024 if this is due Q1. Uh, if there's a desire to include recent investments by the city of Edmonton in that we can certainly achieve that. Yeah and I think this is where it gets confusing right because it's like affordable housing might not only be city-led right as an example like it could be provincial-led projects. Right. Am I correct? That's correct. So some clarity in terms of uh, what uh, council would like to see in that report. Uh, we can certainly have conversations about that. So we have a so we have per neighborhood, or is it at the district level? Do we have the percentage current state per neighborhood? Like yes, from zero percent to sixteen percent, or, yes. or maybe even above for some neighborhoods. Yes, per neighborhood. Okay, okay, that helps. And then my other question is, should this be a separate report or will there be some discussion on this in the context of the housing, the affordable housing strategy that's coming back in 2024? Uh, yes, that's how I, I noted there's a number of different items I think that are very closely linked to this work. Um, my read is that this is a little bit of a deeper dive uh, into this piece uh, that we wouldn't perhaps have gone quite that deep uh, in a strategy that is looking over a particular period of time, um, but is is not so different from the work that we can't uh, do this deeper dive uh, to support this motion. But we will, we would, but it wouldn't limit us from talking about that within the context of that affordable housing strategy. Correct. 
which again, because it was such an important thing that was brought up by Edmontonians both for and opposed to this bylaw that we just passed, this is coming back in 2024, our updated affordable housing strategy, correct? And you don't need any further direction on that. That's in the works. It's in partnership with, I believe, Homer Trust. Yeah, that is coming back this year. The affordable housing. This strategy. year, not even in 2024. That's right. This year, okay. uh, the the Homeward Trust um, is the community fund. Okay, perfect. Nope, that helps. I uh, appreciate it. That's all my questions. Thank you, Costa. The for Costa Rice. Uh, just need a few clarify questions. Uh, when we talk about 16% affordable unions, and then uh, is including all the like supportive housing and the bridge housing or is just a marketing housing, affordable housing? Yeah, so we can clarify uh, in the report how that is brought together, but as noted, uh, affordable housing, there are different ways uh, that affordable housing uh, can be built uh, within the city uh, with our uh, city building partners. And so there are some uh, for which the city is involved through investment uh, or being city led uh, in some cases. Uh, there are some instances where there is affordable housing being developed uh, in partnership with the province and or the federal government. And we also see uh, market affordable housing uh, come forward as well that may not have um, a partnership with any of the government entities. So there's different ways in which um, we come to that. Uh, and so I think it was an excellent recommendation that we help to clarify when when we talk about those numbers, what is the methodology um, in achieving this? So, so what I heard say, to my question, the answer is this affordable housing, including all the supportive housing and the other type of shelters. Is, there, is that correct? It would not include shelters, no. Well, not include shelters, only includes supportable, supportable housing. I will have to confirm that. Yeah, because this is also the question public speakers asked. Um, for the target of person is a minimum requirement or for the, or is the maximum and 60% for the target? So I would say uh, that the 16% is a target uh, it isn't a number where we have said uh, must have a minimum of or uh, may not exceed. I think through the conversations that uh, council has had, uh, there was acknowledgement that we need to have um, an appropriate amount of social infrastructure, which includes affordable housing in each of our communities and each of our neighborhoods. And it was determined uh, that 16% okay, so uh, or less uh, would be uh, that ambitious target that we could aim for. So that, that kind of social um, infrastructure is available in each of the neighborhoods. Okay, so my next question is go to the mover for the intention of the, this motion. So is the intention for this motion is to increase uh, the percentage from 16% six, to the more? Is that one of the intention for, for this motion? Um, not necessarily. There's actually a 2018 report on C601. And if you actually look at the current distribution of affordable housing, it's extremely unevenly distributed. Vast majority of neighborhoods in Edmonton are actually at 0%. And I think that was from 2018. I'll be very, I know part of it is to kind of see what's the distribution now. Um, at this time, I don't, I don't really have any aspiration to increase that number. Um, I would like to see what are some ideas to even just uh, make sure that um, we the housing that is actually more evenly distributed than what it is now. Uh, with the current as rotten and to increase affordable housing in areas where access is limited and could interpret would we want to increase that target from 16% to the higher numbers. That's the how I interpret it. So that's why I'm asking that question. And also in looking at the intention, the entire wording as written right now, um, what outcome we, uh, we are looking for from this report? We are looking for the increase 16 to some, or we are looking for how we allocate this percentage across the entire city. So can you provide a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, I think I don't think, you know, necessarily something like this can just say, oh, we need, 
you know, we, we're gonna start allocating these units here and here. I think part of it is to identify, you know, are we actually achieving some of the goals that are set out in C601? And if okay. affordable housing truly is an issue that many Edmontonians have talked about, both on the in-favor side and as the post side, you know, I think getting a status update on what are we currently doing is an important step. Okay, so that is uh, what I heard here is try to ensure the equitable approach and to make sure an entire city and across neighborhoods and in entire city will have this affordable housing instead of only one area or two areas. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Prince. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was kind of having the same line of questioning as Councillor Rice. I, I was curious if shelters were would be included in this report. Um, and just the reason being is shelters and supportive housing. But sorry, did you say supportive housing would be included? Uh, yes, yeah, so supportive housing is included. Okay. Uh, shelters are not included. Uh, student housing also is not included. And subsidies that are tied to individuals and not tied to units are also not included. Okay, all right. Um, can we ask that uh, shelters be included in this or would that be too difficult? Uh, I perhaps might um, caution against um, social services combining too tightly with affordable housing. Um, though there's sort of two different mechanisms. There are certainly um, mechanisms by which we can have conversations uh, about shelter. That's a very uh, live, active, um, and ever-changing as we look for opportunities to ensure those uh, social services are also available in different areas around the city. Um, uh, but I think the time frame on those is quite different, uh, but I would defer to the mover on preference. Yeah, thank you for that question, Councillor Principe. Um, so at this time, this is a very specific motion related to that particular policy, and it has a very particular definition for affordable housing as defined by uh, Ms. Galatly. Um, so, and you know, I think there's a few other subsequent motions on the docket here related to shelter that I think are better maybe address your question there. Um, so right. at this time, I no, I, I don't want to, I, w I would not want to include that in this motion. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I guess we could compare the two reports then. If they both pass, then we could see a comparison. My concern is that we might be missing some information if we see, oh, look, a community doesn't have any affordable housing, yet they may have a significant amount of supportive housing, or sorry, like shelters, or that's why I, I thought it might be a little bit misinterpreted possibly, but if we have two reports to compare to one another, then uh, maybe, yeah, that would be okay then. I was going to ask some questions about the number of um, uh, communities with uh, more than 60% affordability units, but I guess that this report would, uh, would um, give me that information. So thank you, that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principe. Councilor Wright. Thank you. I'm just wondering, would it include, like I know Métis Housing has their own sort of, or the Métis Nation of Alberta has their own arm, Métis Housing, Does, would it include that as well? Or, or any other organizations like that that provide affordable rental housing? So I will have to uh, look uh, at that. I, I would rather confirm with the data uh, okay. before stating here, but we would certainly take that into consideration. Also. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I had. Thank you. Councillor, 10 questions? Yeah. Yes, I, yes, I had a couple of follow-up questions just to clarify, because I think we've heard a few different, you know, city versus provincial. There's also public and private and not-for-profit housing. Um, and if I recall from this 2018 report, I, I can't remember if those status included all of those types of housing or was it just specifically city? Can you just clarify for me what the, what the what's your understanding from this motion and for this next status update? Uh, so my understanding from this motion is a desire to go more broadly than simply uh, the city investments. And so in addition to, as I noted, looking at uh, Statistics Canada and some of those uh, sources, we also survey all of the major providers uh, to confirm what is in their uh, inventory. So uh, entities such um, as multi urban would be on that, um, but that needs to be subsidized housing. So I think, uh, again, getting into that definition will help 
Mm -hmm. uh, but my read of this is to uh, survey the uh, and to understand the landscape from city and government interrelated to uh, ones that might be happening in the not-for-profit network not related to government funding uh, specifically uh, as well as market housing. Right. At the level. Right. Thank you. That's, that helps. And so that's the first part. And then the second part about sort of measures and that that will be limited, of course, to kind of what's, what's within the city's control. So just want to clarify, even though we may paint a much broader picture, the measures, what we're looking at is within city's control, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. And then just one final question. So again, if I refer back to that kind of last status update, it's actually each neighborhood broken down by percentage. Um, and I'm just wondering if you'll be kind of keeping that same format because I think there's, uh, you know, like you're not singling out, let's say, specific provider or specific location. It will be just kind of a percentage, give you people a snapshot of like, what's the status, right? That's my understanding of the ask. That's great. Thank you. That, that's all. Ready to close whenever. That concludes the questions. Uh, now to speak. Anyone to speak? Uh, if not, quickly to close, Councillor Ten. Yes, I have two minutes until we take yeah, our break. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess just very quickly, um, you know, a, f a few years ago when I, uh, before the election, when I was with administration, I was part of a, uh, you know, a social innovation initiative focused on the downtown core, and at that time. Um, distribution of housing and social services, et cetera, was very much one of the recommendations that came out. You know, years later, um, I think it's really important to get another pulse check on what is what's what is the status. Um, and that was only one thread that I was a part of very actively, and I'm sure there were many other conversations happening at the city at the time about this about this issue. Um, you know, I think in the last week or so, we've heard from, you know, hundreds of speakers where affordable housing specifically came up. And, you know, beyond just sort of a concentration in the downtown core, I, people kind of spoke outside of that context as well. And I think this um, really responds to that citywide um, landscape and, and kind of trying to understand what is happening. Um, I really appreciate that we have lots and lots of reports coming up on non-market and affordable housing um, in this month and next month and then the months after that. Um, and this does not, you know, um, undermine those work. And I, in fact, I hope, I hope that this could potentially supplement or amplify, you know, the housing conversation to demonstrate to Edmontonians, you know, affordable housing is a huge, huge priority for this council. There is no shortage of um, work so that we can make sure that folks are are housed. So this just adds to that um, repertoire of work to to continue our um, efforts in this realm. So thank you very much for your support. That's it. Thank you, Councilor Tank. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We are at 331. We'll take a break and we'll be back at 345. Until then, we are on recess.
order. And roll call, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cardinal. Hello. Councillor Rice. Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Oh, Councillor Rice is here. And Councillor Jans is here. Okay, the next one is Councillor Rice, seconded by Councillor Principe, subsequent number eight. Make the introduction. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, so, in the new bylaw we just approved, there are two new zones. One is called Labourhood Commercial Use, and one uh, is called Labourhood Mixed Use. Um, as this two new zones approves, uh, it could be. Um, ends up as some like services sites, like com uh, supervised consumption sites or uh, overdose prevention site, uh, could be built and near to, uh, in the neighborhoods, which means, and that's near, near to the school or near to the park. Also at the same time in particular, particularly, uh, their child care facility could be on the same building and with this news only approved. Uh, however, we do not have that uh, land use recreation and uh, specifically to set up the separation distance and between those. Uh, this um, amendment, this subsequent motion, and uh, hopefully uh, could provide the opportunity for city administration to go back to look at a permit with additional recreation and for the development and also provide an opportunity and then for uh, fill that uh, recreation gap and in this development. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Questions, colleagues? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, just a few questions of administration. Um, I know that we've often had challenges with applying um, separation distances in the past and and there have been some unintended consequences from those potentially is that I see some nodding um, and my understanding is that there is a you know very rigorous program in terms of federal licensing for these these types of facilities that would um, you know consider some of the other contextual pieces is that correct Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, and you know, I've been thinking about how how this could work. Um, maybe just another point of clarification. My understanding is that there are currently two supervised consumption sites in in the whole city that are publicly accessible. There's three. Well, three, I believe, is for inpatients at the Royal Alex Hospital, so not necessarily just folks from the community walking up. Okay. So that's two, so if we're talking about separation distances um, from each other, I mean, those are gonna be very significant. Uh, is, that, is that fair? Yes, like uh, if, if we're talking about, you know, what, what exists today um, is, as a representation of what could exist, then yeah, that would be very large separation distances. And if we took another approach, let's say, uh, you know, a restriction per neighborhood, for example, um, you know, I reflect on the fact that, uh, you know, one of the supervised consumption sites that was closed down was the Boyle Street. That was in central McDougal. There's the supervised consumption site in at Radius Health um, in a different neighborhood in Macaulay. So that wouldn't necessarily have prevented those locations from, from both being there. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Um, maybe, too, just in terms of some of the... Um, 
the equity considerations. My, my understanding is that one of the, the key principles that the team took in developing the new zoning bylaw was around ensuring that we were regulating um, use, not user. That's correct. So is there any specific activity that takes place within a supervised consumption site or, or um, uh, overdose prevention services that is markedly different from what what activities may take place in a, in a medical lab or medical clinic, for example? I, I don't know the answer to that, Councillor Stevenson. I, I think that to the extent that the um, Supervised consumption service is part of uh, the healthcare continuum. Like that's mm. that was generally an overriding factor that we considered in terms of, you know, is it part of the health services use? Um, we were advised by colleagues uh, to consider it as part of the healthcare continuum and not to uh, add additional barriers to where that service could be located. Um, and I'm not aware of any specific land use uh, impacts. Um, with this use, but because it's not common, mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna, you know, really confident to speak to that exact question right now. Okay, uh, great. Those are all my, my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cardwell. Great, thank you. It's um, my understanding that there is already a report in the works that talks about limiting distances. That's yeah. for cannabis and liquor stores is uh, on our work plan. Yeah, but, and it does it get into, you know, what are we trying to accomplish with limiting distances and are limiting distances the right tool to accomplish what we might, seems to me we'd had that conversation before, so I'm wondering if this is essentially a continuation of that conversation. Yes, I think so, Councillor. Could some of this be bundled into that work that while we're talking about limiting distances and what they do, what they don't do, are they the right tool for liquor and cannabis? We could also examine, um, I, I think at supervised consumption sites, uh, overdose prevention sites, and maybe shelters. I'm not sure if that's bundled into this or not. I lost track. But. Councillor, I think this is a, a different type of work uh, because right now, how we view supervised consumption sites as part of the health service use, um, which adds a little bit of layer of complexity in terms of trying to tease that out and then provide those separation distances or whatnot in between. Um, and the liquor store and the cannabis ones are, uh, I don't know, I guess we can say a little bit clearer, uh, but they do provide a pathway in terms of how we do regulate a use if we wanted to provide those separation spaces. Well, I wonder if, uh, if that's not a bit of a distraction, frankly. Like, do we, we hear, to some degree anyway, or some of us hear a little bit of, is, is this use, is it right to have this use in close proximity to that use? And so we talk about schools or parks or daycares, uh, and we talk about liquor stores and cannabis stores and perhaps, you know, the supervised consumption sites um, as a general term. So notwithstanding that, yes, there's a teasing out from health services, can we not talk about whether limiting distances are, are even desirable or required or something we should continue to talk about or not? Like it, through a different lens, are limiting distances the things that we want to do? Like I just, I. I think there's a bit of analysis there. We, I, my recollection is when we talked about it from liquor stores is that by having a limiting distance but allowing those stores that are already established to remain established, there was an, an inflated value to those locations that already had the distinction of being established before the limiting distance, right? So that was one aspect that we talked about in terms of limiting distance. Is it really doing what we want it to do? What is it we want to do? The motion doesn't restrict the analysis to limiting distances. It's around options to further regulate. Um, but to your point, I think it also doesn't articulate what we're trying to limit it from. Yeah. So more clarity on that would be helpful. Um, Councillor Rice, when she introduced the motion, she talked about um, new the commercial zone and the neighborhood 
mixed use zone, which isn't referenced here either. So I, I guess maybe some clarity around that if it's, if we're just talking about those zones. And then I'd also suggest that we have um, law weigh in on the, the last part of this motion as well. well part of the, I'll get off the mic right away. Part of the th threat of my questions is, can we build on the work that we're already doing, you know, without too much delay or too much complication? We hadn't contemplated it, that work around supervised yes. consumption sites. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mike. Thank you, Councillor Cartman. Sorry, I forgot to ask. <laughs> the question that I'm supposed to ask on any, any subsequent, is this uh, uh, doable within the existing resources and the timelines and the clarity? So the timelines and the resources are ex okay, acceptable yeah. for administration, but the clarity piece, um, I think we need some further clarity around what are we looking to regulate from or between and then I'll look to law to maybe to comment on the last part of the motion as well. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if I could just weigh in quickly here. The, the notion of having to come back to council for approval before these could proceed when they are when they are permitted use is put in the bylaw is is an illegal delegation. So illegal delegation. Uh, illegal delegation. I would I would much prefer to see the last part of this struck out of there that contemplates having to come to council for approval. Okay. Councillor Rice, are you okay to strike down? The last part. Because, no. or maybe can we can, maybe you can work with the administration to provide. No, can't do that, right? So I think just it's it's already been stated. I think feedback's been provided. I think when legal says that the, there's part of a motion that's invalid, then we have to strike it. Otherwise, I don't think you can call the vote. Okay. Good. Okay, then um, I'll stop here, then I'll follow the order, just told then. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Taggart, please. Yeah, great, thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that was an important piece. And then I guess the other piece I was wondering to the mover, would you contemplate further changes to clarify your intent as per administration's feedback around mixed use or you know, any specific location? Uh, because right now, and the, I did I did the research, and in the Health Canada, and also in the province regulation, and also in the uh, business license application, there is no location and a separation distance recommended even mentioned. And for us, from land use perspective, and specifically gives the fact administration already provided for this type of use, we need additional regulation with permit. And in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood re uh, residential zone and the neighborhood uh, mixed zone. So, so that so, is. So do you want to incorporate that in those that specific zones into? So that just maybe just flag that for. Uh, so that clarity. zone is already. I thought is already in the motion, for that specific zone. Yes. Okay. Well, I think I just specifically heard that it, yeah. it's not specific, and maybe that clarity will be helpful. And okay. then I guess the other question to administration, based on some of the other questions, I feel like when we talk about uses, sometimes you kind of group the ones that are kind of similar together, and when we bundle health service that also has other governmental regulation processes. I just, I, I'm struggling with like bundling together with liquor store or cannabis store that are profit driven businesses where there's a tendency to proliferate whereas health services like this is based on data, based on needs, based on legislation, based on a whole host of factors. And I'm like, does it make, even make sense to kind of see them as the same? category to have a tool to apply to them that hasn't quite proven itself yet. Any feedback on that? Councillor Tang, are you, are you reflecting on uh, Councillor Cartmel's questions about uh, yeah, reporting back? Yeah, a little bit, back? but also just kind of in, in general, like is even distancing like the right, the right avenue here, right? Um, and then we're kind of talking about OPS in the same breath as kind of these businesses, which to me feels really apples to oranges and. Um, I, I, yes, Councillor, I think that the, the um, arguments 
around the issues will differ quite a bit because when you're talking about you know liquor stores and cannabis stores, you are talking about those those market dynamics um, as part of the consideration of whether the separation mm -hmm. distances is the appropriate tool. Whereas in the case of a supervised consumption service, for example, you're talking more about um, what the what the real or perceived uh, impacts around right. that particular service might be. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's the piece I'm, um, I I might take issues with, and you know I I I understand the intent, but I I will worry that we kind of falter to this are we regulating user users uh, debate from earlier. So thank you, thank you for those responses. Thank you, Councilor Tang. Take the chair. No, no, I thought oh. you, you you had you had questions. I I saw you. I know, but Councilor Tang oh, asked them. Oh, I see. Okay. okay yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, can, he, can you take the chair then? Yes, I Thank have the chair. Thank you. So, um, what is the proper term that we have? Like, the, we, like we, we, we don't make any reference to these uses in the, in the bylaw, right? Do we? No, the, 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 they fall under the health services use. And they're so under health services use, what goes under there is determined by the provincial government or or AHS. We have a definition for health services use. Yeah. It, it ranges from doctor's offices, dental offices, therapeutic services, things like that. So it's a range. Okay, but there's no, there's nothing in, I just wanna make sure that I understand correctly, but in the bylaw itself, we don't make any, even under health services, we don't make reference to uh, uh, supervised consumption services or overdose prevention services. That's correct. Okay. okay. Although, uh, just to clarify, there is previous SDAB case law that came out, I believe a year ago, classifying um, safe consumption sites under the current health services use. So okay. I believe that's where we've decided that yeah. it okay. still fits within that umbrella. Okay, got it. Uh, is it also kind of fair, like when I look at the this the the proposed site in uh, in Strathcona, right? It's been almost two years. That process been underway, provincial process. It's it's still not open. It's not open, correct? Right. So there's a very rigorous process that community is required to go through, right? So uh, uh, so if we add more barriers, it'll become more difficult to open these very important health facilities, wouldn't it? Or maybe that's maybe it's the wrong question to ask you. I, I, like more, yeah, more, any more, any more red tape make, means more delay. As a general rule, for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. And at a time when we have high number of Edmontonians dying from Overdoses. So, I, uh, okay. Uh, so, so maybe it's to move her then. Like, what, what do you, what do you intend? Do you want to separate distances from what? Uh, so this. This amendment yeah. and is not limited this to possible use under health services. So the separation distance and then there are actually I'm looking for the um, location restriction and also the separation distance and between the schools, between the child care facility and between the park playground. Uh, the motion changed the very big, just to say separation distance location because could provide that opportunity for administration to look at all possible separation distance. So that is why it's not very specific. But under this new two zone bylaws and what permit is a permit is very clear indicated permit with additional recreation and for this two purpose use. So maybe another question, like how do we, like why wouldn't this restrict Alberta health services 
ability to open up new harm reduction sites or or prevention sites or make delay uh, or not or not make delay and because in the AHS business license process there is no no element requirement to talk about separation distance and the location that is all for under our municipal bylaw land use purpose no, but if we have additional regulations, wouldn't that delay the opening up of these facilities? Will not. You don't see that? Will not. This is only one limited when you choose the location for the land use and you need to follow that separation distance. Okay. That is only, but it will not impact or delay the timeline. And because for the business license requirement, this is not part of that. Okay. okay. Uh, I will take the chair back. So returned. And I'll go to Councilor Neck. Sorry, uh, Mayor Sohi, just I, I've heard from the, our legal and clerks that the motion is worded is out of order right now, so I'm just trying to get confirmation. I'm You're going on to clean it up? Okay, yes. I just wanted we've, to figure out what we're actually debating. Yeah, so we've cleaned it up um, in the dock, and sorry, I don't have, I can't do what Bev does. Oh, so I'm gonna, I'll just pull myself off the list. Yeah, if something's about to be cleaned up, it. I just. Bev will do that. Sorry. Yeah, for sure. So the, the delete, uh, sorry, highlighted part if that is struck down. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if it ends with the words or other tools with a period, then that would be fine. And what is the process to strike that down? It, it has to be struck down or you can't call the vote. So I, as a chair, can I rule that needs to be struck down? Yeah, yeah and if, oh. cal if Councillor Rice doesn't want it to struck down, then you can't vote on it because you can't delegate oh. that authority. You oh, so Councillor Rice, are you okay to strike down that highlighted part in the motion? That's his why I put my name there. I want okay. to ask one more clear question. And Go then, ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, because this um, two new zone, neighborhoods commercial use and neighborhoods mixed use is too long, we don't have equivalence for the current res uh, residential zone to that. That means anything to use in that two zone, they still need rezoning application process, right? That's correct. So once that confirms, for sure we don't need this. Because adding this only uh, based on if, uh, I'm not sure if rezoning application no. is needed, because no. right now rezoning application is 100% is needed, because no equivalence. So, this is new zones. Thank so you. So we are striking down yeah. anything after other tools. Yes, thank you. Okay, yes. good. Okay. All right, so that concludes the questions. Now to speak. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I just wanted to be very brief uh, that I can't, I can't support the motion before us. I think we've learned historically that separation distances can be a tool to regulate the user and not just the use. And uh, as Mayor Sohi pointed out through his line of questioning, we are in an opioid crisis. And this has a lot of regulations at the provincial level. This isn't just a business like a dental office that applies to AHS. This is, these facilities are run by AHS. <laughs> is very, very distinct, or they're, they're contracted out to organizations that have very rigid rules around how they operate. So I feel like there's already enough regulating around this. And, and as was mentioned, there's only two that have public access as it is now. We're not talking about a proliferation or a high concentration of these. So I, at this point, can't, can't support this further regulating what is already highly regulated and does not have a proliferation within community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. With that, Councillor uh, Rice to close. Uh, we'll be very quick. Uh, for the health services uses and in our bylaw, uh, yes, they do have many regulation at health care at level and also provincial level. Um, however, and specifically, and with these two neighborhoods new zone added, and then in our approved new bylaw, and it's stated very clear, any health services 
is probable use is permitted and to be with additional recreations in the residential zones and the neighborhood commercial mixed zones, for example, location and size, uh, size restrictions. And for this uh, amendment, and really specific to these two new zones, and give the uh, factor, and for the um, existing bylaw, we have some separate uh, separation distance for the schools and for the parks and the playground and to me this is a similar feature and for that and specifically right now and the child care could be just built right beside the neighborhood commercial mixed zones and with those health services use and to really consider our child our child safety and it was a similar principle we are used in our city for many years and in the neighborhoods. I think this additional recreation for the location and the separation distance is really needed. So I hope my colleagues will support this. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Councillor Rice. Please Mr. vote. Mayor, before voting, can I make one point of clarification with as a follow-up to a comment I made to Councillor Rice? I had indicated that you would need to rezone to the neighborhood commercial or the neighborhood mixed-use zones. Um, there are equivalencies in those zones, and so I just wanted to be clear that I, because I had said you'd have to rezone. If you're not that zone now, you would have to rezone to become that zone. But these uses, supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services, are considered a healthcare service within the zoning bylaw, is how we've classified them when issuing a permit. So I just wanted to provide that clarification. Thank you. Great, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Next one is Councillor Hamilton, second by Councillor Paquette. Uh, subsequent motion number nine, Councillor Hamilton. Please make the introduction. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll move that, well, I guess I've already moved it. Um, so over the course of the public hearing, we heard from a lot of residents who were concerned about what construction would look like on their block or next door. I think um, given, uh, I wanna say some of the learnings from infill compliance, this uh, motion would allow council to keep a close eye on uh, what is happening with the rollout of the zoning bylaw in neighborhoods and allocate resources, give policy direction, make tweaks as needed. Um, but uh, uh, I think it behooves us to keep a close eye on um, what is happening once the proverbial uh, zoning hits the streets of Edmonton. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Questions, please, colleagues? Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, appreciate the, the intent, certainly. Um, just, I guess, to administration, can you just jog my memory a little bit of the various reports that's related to the construction site report that was at UPC maybe a month or so ago? And there, I remember there was a, a motion that directed something to come back soon. That report was in June at Urban Planning Committee, right. um, construction site safety and accountability. Um, so we thought we would align this piece of work with that report in Q2 of 2024. So we do have capacity and resources to uh, provide this information when that report comes back. So we'll collect that um, as part of one report. I see, so that original report wouldn't have included anything around a compliance and enforcement. I can't remember all the elements of the motion from that okay. uh, June uh, sub motion from Urban Planning Committee, but um, nonetheless, uh, we can we can conduct this work and provide that information. Right, and and I imagine that if if the report recommends additional resource for enforcement, that will probably potentially come back next year as a funding package or something, right? 
likely a fall soba or something like that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Councillor Hamilton, for this motion. Um, to administration, so in, in one of our large uh, projects that uh, the city funded, one of the things that uh, I think was undertaken was um, you know, photographic evidence, you know, an assessment of uh, adjacent properties uh, to the construction so that if there's any insurance concerns, there would be um, this base of knowledge to draw from uh, in order to mitigate disagreements and to ensure accountability. Is this something that you're thinking of pairing up with this motion and with the previous motion? Councillor, I think that uh, we talked a little bit about this during the public hearing around yep. the con continuum of education, compliance and enforcement. Uh, that would fall in the education phases uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, good construction practices are followed and the neighbors adjoining or adjacent to uh, future construction sites know their rights and responsibilities. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, creating some of those educational pieces uh, throughout the throughout the year. Okay. Now, when we say educa educational pieces, how would people know about that? So it could be uh, as simple as uh, we have our development permit signage on site, uh, so they see uh, that a, a future development is coming, uh, and it may direct you to a website uh, in the city that outlines uh, what those responsibilities are, possibly. Okay, um, so any direct communication from uh, potential developers to the adjacent homes to say, hey, something's coming up, we're gonna be building here, here's some information, just, uh, um, and here's the, the city website, like something that uh, is a little bit less passive and more um, direct. Is that something that we would consider as a requirement? We can look at it as an option, um, just in terms of how and, and uh, when we do that possible notification uh, and in conjunction with what, uh, we would have to analyze that. Councillor okay. Paquette, I would just add also, um, as part of applications in our redeveloping communities, um, our builders are requ required to submit the construction site management acknowledgement practices form. Um, so this is another place that we can look at to ensure it flags the importance of talking to, to adjacent property owners. Yeah, just uh, I guess my concern is uh, that legal protection that ensures accountability. And if that's going to be something that we're going to see uh, clearly communicated to the public as a result of these motions or in the unfolding of uh, policy. I think we can come back with that information, include sort of, um, I'm, I'm getting some of the motions mixed up in terms of uh, roles and yeah. responsibilities um, between the city, the, the builder and uh, adjacent property owners. So we can, we can uh, include that kind of type of context in this, in this work. Okay, so basically flag it, put a pin in it, when it all comes back, we can continue the conversation. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Pagas, Councilor Wright. Thank you. Do you have the resources to get the report done in <laughs> in the time allotted? <laughs> yes, we do, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for reminding me that. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> okay. Good. Please. Oh, sorry. That concludes questions. Now to speak. I, I want to speak. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just want to thank Councillor Hamilton for putting this motion forward. I think while we have passed this bylaw, I think one of the biggest concerns we often hear about is, is compliance and those few potentials for some bad actors to create a paint a very bad picture for everyone. So I think that we really do, when we have bylaws, we need to also be able to enforce those bylaws. And so I'm very grateful for uh, Councillor Hamilton bringing this uh, subsequent forward and wholeheartedly support it. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Hamilton to close. Nothing further to add, thank you. Thank you, please vote. We 
call the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And here you go. We are on to subsequent. Oh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. And please, you have two minutes for your introduction, Mayor Sohi. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we heard from a large number of uh, uh, post-secondary students and other students about uh, the, the lack of supply of different choices of housing for them, as well as the affordability of, uh, of student, student housing uh, in, uh, in every part of the uh, of the city and reflecting on this, they're hearing to their conversation, you know, I kind of thought would be a good idea to create a platform for conversations uh, that where administration can engage some post-secondary institutions and housing developers and their stakeholders and students about figuring out how we increase their supply. This bylaw definitely will help, but what more we can do but supply and uh, of and affordability is another challenge. So how do we, how we figure that out? I, that kind of table in my knowledge doesn't exist. So that is the intent behind uh, uh, this subsequent motion to have those initial conversations and uh, and exploring of uh, um, some ideas. If when report comes to council uh, committee, sorry, if this is approved at that time, we can determine what further steps that. Uh, that we can take this. This at this time is a very high-level exploration of uh, options to creating more uh, uh, student housing and also affordable housing for students. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. And to questions, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I think uh, this is a good motion, especially based on I think the the volume of people we heard from on this issue. I'm wondering, however, if there isn't a role for some of our advisory groups on um, our advisory committees on this question, uh, such as youth youth council. I think next gen has been is no longer with us. That sounds grimmer than it needed to be. But do, uh, I guess to the bulk of the question, Mr. Mayor, do you think this is there's a role for youth council in this? I think that's a very good flag, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, we can mm -hmm. identify them as a as a stakeholder uh, if they're not covered under other stakeholders, but because they're always like they would advise us. So I think uh, specifying that is, uh, I would consider that uh, absolutely friendly. All right. Um, perhaps we can work that in uh, in the sort of listing of organizations, the the Edmonton Youth Council. So I'm just hearing adding Edmonton Youth Council uh, into the list of stakeholders and considering that friendly from the assembly. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Is that everything, Councillor Hamilton? Yep. That's all for me. Thanks. Okay. Great. Had no further questions. Anyone to speak to this? Okay, please, uh, Mayor Sohi, do you have any closing? No, no, that's it. Okay, then please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. We'll return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Next is Councillor Cartmel, seconded by Councillor Neck, subsequent motion 11. Councillor Cartmel, go ahead, please. Thank you. So, I need a bit of clarification on this too, but I understand these spaces to be those uh, spaces in the residential small zone that are adjacent to a commercial use already. And so the commercial use is zoned commercial and the spaces on either side, adjacent spaces, can also be used commercially uh, because of their adjacency. And the amount of space that they're allowed to dedicate to a commercial enterprise is 300 square meters, uh, which is a lot. Uh, that's roughly 3,000 square feet, which is uh, 
almost twice the size of a standard single family home's main floor. So that sounded like to me like a pretty big uh, space, which could lead to some pretty significant commercial operations on a place that is not actually zoned commercial. It's adjacent to commercial, but it isn't commercial. Uh, so I'm suggesting we limit that to 100 square feet, 100 square meters, pardon me, which is roughly twice the size of a two-car garage, just to add some perspective. So it's really just about how big that thing can be in the residential small zone next to a commercial space. Otherwise, it begins to look like a commercial strip, even though only one property is zoned commercial. That's it. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. No questions. Councillor Wright. Um, thank you, and thank you for putting into perspective the size of, of, of like the 100 square meters compared to the 300, because I have no relation in that. So, um, but I'm just wondering, like the hallway cafe, I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, you know, it would be nice to have a little neighborhood cafe or something to go to. The hallway cafe, how big would that be? Any? Oh, golly. I'm going to have to do math quick. <laughs> uh, about... 200 square meters, if I'm doing the math right. Maybe a little less. Would it would it men agree? That sounds like a reasonable. Um, I'm guessing 25 guess. feet by 100 feet. Are you all five foot bay, four bays? That's what I'm guessing. I don't know. Okay. Are, and I, I would just add that when we're talking about floor area here, we're also talking about back of house, so like kitchen areas and stuff like that. Okay, and that's what I was wondering too. Okay, um, and so then how was this? How was this 300 meters, square meters determined, I guess, when, when you were looking at the bylaw? Yeah, so there's a couple of points of reference here. One, um, in the, the current RA7 zone, in the current zoning bylaw, allows uh, up to 275 square meters. Um, so that was kind of one point of sort of calibrating this number, um, as well as um, in, in hearing about the, the size uh, requirements for a commercial bay, um, we, we, we heard the number that a single, like the, on the, on, on sort of the low end of a commercial bay can go as low as about 110 square meters, um, two together. So in the case of, um, you know, Duchess Bakery on 124th street, uh, as a point of reference, um, that, you know, that's like two commercial bays together cause they've kind of got it on two sides. So looking at that, you know, like wanting to make sure that if a business like that wanted to establish, um, that there was enough space kind of built in. Um, and thirdly, I would just say that there's, um, you know, it's kind of bridging a gap between the resident, the small scale residential zone and the neighboring commercial zone. So the neighboring commercial zone would allow up to about 500, not about, it would allow up to 500 square meters for a lot of different business types. And so it, we saw it kind of as a stepping stone from the residential to the commercial uh, and, and wanting to make sure that we're allowing that, you know, expansion of the local node um, that the commercial zone would be zoned for. Whoops, sorry. And by, re by reducing the, the, the square, the, the floor area, that would increase the number of commercial units that you could have in that same space, right? Sorry, Councillor, could you rephrase the question? So by reducing the, the, the floor area of each commercial business, that would increase the number of businesses that you would ha could have in that space? Um, no, nope. it, the, the, the number is per individual establishment. Um, so it doesn't change the number uh, of, well, okay, perhaps. Uh, if, you're, if you're saying it's a, fit, a fixed lot size, then yeah, it, it, given that, then yeah, it would potentially. Um, but again, like w the zoning bylaw doesn't set, you know, the requirement for a business to be a certain size. Like if, if it is a small business that takes up a small footprint, then what's proposed uh, in the bylaw now wouldn't prevent that from happening. Okay. I'll, I'll just quickly clarify too, my team gave me the number for that okay. Duchess okay. Uh, is 410 square meters. That's in total for both sides of that operation for those of us that are familiar with it. Okay, <laughs> okay. thank you for that frame of reference. Um, I think that's all I have on scope of writing. Thank you, Constable. Right, Constable Rutherford. Yeah, okay. Um, I am appreciating the, the context, but Duchess is still in a commercial zone. Yep. Not in an RS zone. Correct. Yeah, okay. So 
there was some questions in the council portal specific around the the rationale for the 300 meters in relation to child care spaces would this have any impact on that would this motion potentially have any impact because there's really good rationale for the 300 meters for child care specific facilities facilities the motion before us is uh, refers to commercial establishments so it wouldn't impact child care because um, that's a business use as opposed to a commercial use uh, because it's a community it's a community use oh, under community the zoning use. bylaw okay yeah. so i just want to make sure they're not impacting each other they wouldn't impact child care okay yeah. okay okay and okay so I'm trying sure to contextualize this. So in Calder, there's, uh, there is a neighborhood business. They have a sign. It's like a dog grooming. It's a dog grooming place. They literally have a little sign on in the front of their house. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know that it's a business. It's not adjacent to a commercial zone. What's the allowable space for the home that kind of home business? It's a home-based business that's not next to a commercial zone. That would mean, again, there's a there's a person living in that house. Uh, so it would depend on the, there's not a, a fixed number, but the residential component has to be the um, primary or principal use of the building. Uh, okay. So like 50% is a good guideline. So 50% okay. of, the, of the house could be uh, used for or the or the property I would say could be used for the business. Okay. Okay. This is giving me good context Okay, that's Okay, wait one more question Just so that it's clear because I do I have heard the same apprehensions Apprehension from some of the people that have corresponded with my office in terms of the proliferation of the commercial into the residential um so now you've got the one adjacent, let's say we keep it, it is 300 right now because we just passed that bylaw before this report comes back. So it's 300, the adjacent one, there's no like staggering down, it goes 300 to, to nothing. Essentially it becomes a new home-based business. Correct, any, okay. any additional um, lots further down the block would require rezoning. Yeah, that's Or right. of variance, sorry. But there's a lot of neighborhoods. It's interesting because, again, there's neighborhoods in the city that have most of their commercial on the periphery of the neighborhood. And some neighborhoods that have commercial, I'm thinking, you know, like even like Hazeldean has like a strip or Ritchie, which are more central uh, in their neighborhood. So it wouldn't, so our current policy would potentially have the unintended impact of proliferating commercial more so in certain neighborhoods than others. Am I understanding that correct? At 300 meters, like the size and the scope and the scale. I think that's, pro yeah, that's correct, Councillor. You, you would need, it would need to be adjacent to another non-residential zone. Okay. Councillor, just in terms of the proliferation, I think that's um, a feature, not a bug of the system. Uh -huh. um, okay. Due to the... Uh, the intentions around city plan to mm -hmm. organically grow local nodes um, okay. and have those evolve over time. Okay, I'm just going to listen to the other questions and to, to my colleagues speak to this one. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so, just to the mover, uh, how, just looking for a little bit more of an explanation of how you arrived at the 100 square meters? So I'm thinking of, again, sort of that standard residential lot that might be next door to a commercial space. Uh, and, and just, you know, how much of that property should be permitted to be dedicated to a commercial space before being zoned commercial. So again, you know, the, a, a bungalow, a, a large bungalow is 1,600 square feet. The main floor of a 2,500 square foot house is roughly 1,300 square feet. 300 meters is 3,000 square feet. That, that's a pretty big floor. And, you know, that might lead to a question about, you know, site coverage and those kinds of things, sure. Depends on the lot. I'm kind of thinking of that prototypical uh, residential lot, right? Hmm. Um, so then, if you know, taking that a step further, well, if you had a double or triple garage in the front yard of a typical residential lot, how big would that be? Well, that would be roughly 100 square meters or 1,000 square feet, even a little bit smaller. 
and that to me sounds like the right size of structure dedicated to a commercial use mm -hmm. before actually being zoned commercial, which takes you into a different strata. Okay, because I'm just grappling with like 100 versus 150, 200, yep. right? Like, What's the right number? Yeah, yep. and maybe just going going back to administration, <clears throat> when, when you arrived at the 300 meters squared, I know you referenced that that was, um, you know, it offers a bit of a, a transition um, from the 500 meters squared down into, uh, into neighborhoods where there are local nodes present. Would, like, did you consult with businesses at all to, uh, and, and stakeholders to arrive at the 300 meters squared? I'm just thinking about viability for certain types of businesses. Um, we did, uh, yeah, we did consult with a, um, uh, I'm trying to think how to describe them, with a, a provider of commercial space mm -hmm. um, to get those, it, like I said, that was where the uh, a developer, <laughs> uh, where, where the 110 to 220 kind of numbers came from. Um, so uh, I would say, yes, Councillor, sorry. No, that's, that's helpful. So um, the 300 is based on... Uh, Um, you know, conversations you have had with experts in this space. Yes, and, and the numerous drafts that we've released of the zoning bylaw have had, you know, this number in there for feedback from okay. um, people, and I, I don't know specifically offhand what exact feedback we got sure. on that number, but sure. yeah. Sure, okay. Um, and just for clarity, so the 300 square meters, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be all on one floor. That could be spread across two or three. Correct. Okay. Uh, I had the same question about child care uses, so this would not affect the 300 square meters on that piece, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. That's really helpful. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I've been appreciating this conversation and, just, you know, definitely seeing, seeing both sides. You know, one thing I wanted to confirm is that these buildings would still need to meet all the built form regulations of the RS zone. So site coverage and height would, would be the same <clears throat> as, as a residential development. Correct. So to, to get, so, so 300 square meters, especially if you think of that over two stories, um, you know, you'd either need a consolidated site, a, a larger than standard site to do sort of a single story 300 square meter building and at 45 percent site coverage yeah you're you've got to be have a pretty big lot to be able to get 300 square meters of building footprint okay so I've you know I think <clears throat> I, I've been doing a little bit of grounding as well so you know some some local examples for me you know there's little brick and dog patch which again are not next to commercial they're sort of really in the in the middle of a residential area and those are each about 200 square meters i think you know then thinking about oliver exchange ritchie market those are sort of 800 900 square meters just as a single story i think and both of those are are multi-story so is that are those fair sort of like peggings in terms of scale of commercial yeah i think so counselor okay Okay, well, thank you. I think that clarifies uh, questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Before I go to Councillor Rice, I forgot to ask the question, Kim, on, <laughs> on the resources and, uh, and, and timelines to bring it back and clarity. This works. Good, okay. For administration. All right, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, so, this is talking about the change in the small scale residential zone, right? Based on the wording yes. here. And then if we're going to talk about the, um, the maximum floor area per individual commercial estab establishment change, and to me, this rezoning application is still needed. And because he's changed the zone and from residential zone and to the mixed use zone. Is that, is that correct? Well, no, that's not correct, Councillor. What's being discussed right now is a commercial opportunity uh, that is in the now um, approved zoning bylaw that uh, would allow a commercial development 
um, in the small scale residential zone when directly abutting an, a, a site that's already zoned commercial? Uh, I know that, but from if you look at the zoning scope here, and a small scale residential zone, and it's different from the commercial use because we are we if we are allow the commercial use in the residential area, that needs to go to the neighborhoods, neighborhood mixed use. So that to me, and that equivalence is not there. There, there is this variance. So that's his one ask I want to confirm. That means rezoning still needed. Because one small scale residential zone is, a, is 100% 100 residential zone. Right now we're talking about in the in the residential zone and to make this change for the commercial use. So that's his different zone. The counselor, no. The um, what's what's in the small scale residential? I should say small scale residential zones. Um, would allow for the commercial use again in those select locations without the need for rezoning. So that means they don't need to go to the neighborhood mixed use. They don't need to go to that piece. If if in one of the select locations that are specified in the zone, correct, they wouldn't need to go to the the neighborhood mixed use zone. No matter what their current zone. Um, no, the, it does matter what the current zone is. The the current. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, all right, so uh, I'm just taking a look at these numbers. What sort of, what does it look like if you've got a 300 meter square commercial establishment? This would have to be built. There's nothing, I'm trying to imagine an adjacent, uh, you know, home that could accommodate that. So what would that look like? Councillor, it looks similar to a two-story house um, that's roughly 1,500 square feet per floor. Uh, so you can have multi-story commercial. Um, it would look oh, okay. So if uh, if someone wanted to like have like you know, I don't, I don't know, just some kind of business where uh, they use uh, you know maybe like the main floor of the house, uh, you know, and the garage. That's sort of the idea there. Or something like that, some combination of that? It could be, uh, Councillor. And what we're talking about here in terms of a commercial use, it could also be a purpose built building. Yeah. Um, so if you'll remember um, previous uh, presentations, uh, we, uh, and, and I, you know, it's okay if you don't remember, but we we did provide a an example of uh, a coffee shop in Bonnie Dune called the Columbian and the building and the building there. Um, that whole building. Uh, which is two stories is 540 square meters or about 270 on each floor. So as a point of reference, um, you might imagine, you know, if we're just talking about the ground floor as a single individual um, uh, business, um, it would be about 270. Uh, cur okay. Currently it's split into two businesses, but that's for scale, if that helps you. Yeah, no, it, it does help. Um, I, I, yeah, okay, so... All right, that, that's my only question. I just want to get a, a clearer picture of, of what's at stake here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Can you move the second round, please? Yeah, I move the second round. Second. Se thank you, second by Councillor Rutherford. Can you please, oh, so please vote. Waiting on one vote. Councillor Hamilton. Just you have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
Sorry, Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you. Again, again for frame of reference, um, the woman that came in from Fleisch, Katie Ingram, are you familiar with that property? So would that be something that could be put in in the small scale residential? I'm not super familiar with, with that specific business and how big it was. Um, as a, like, I, I have a general idea. Okay. I think generally probably the answer is yes, but I don't know. Because then you could put eight units, residential units on top of, of the business, correct? You could put residential above, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes the questions on this subsequent at this time. Uh, anyone to speak? Here we go. Councillor Wright to speak. No, that was oh, me from that's before. from previous. Uh, okay. Anyone to speak? One, two, three. Councillor Cartmel to close. Thank you. So just as by way of a reminder, there's a commercial property zone commercial and adjacent to it, a property zone small scale residential can have a commercial enterprise up to 300 square meters without notification, permitted use, no one in the neighborhood knows it's happening. Lots of anecdotes have been offered about, you know, what could be cool. There's a, there's a fellow in uh, the ward I represent that wanted to establish a bakery. Uh, you know, we heard about Duchess. That's great. The question is, should that be a permitted use to that size without notification to anybody else around before that establishment gets to a size where it ought be zoned commercial? Doesn't mean it's a bad use. Doesn't mean that it won't get approved. Doesn't mean that it's the wrong thing to do. But at what point do you hit a threshold where that requires some input from the neighborhood, that requires the opportunity for notification, that allows the opportunity for appeal, uh, commercial enterprise with 3,000 square feet, you know, what, what can be anticipated in terms of disturbance, vehicles, deliveries, people, all of those kinds of things? And the answer is obviously, well, we don't know because there's so many different uses. That's why the question is, should it be permitted and effectively automatically approved without some conversation with the community? Is 100 square meters the right size? I don't know. Is 300 meters squared the right size? I think it's big. The motion says bring back a report with some analysis that talks more about the right size before you get to a threshold of requiring a commercial rezoning. So more information, yes. Happy with those perspectives or those possibilities? No. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We next we go to Okay, next one is Councillor Rutherford, second by Councillor Paquette, subsequent motion 12. We have total 26 and we have quite a way to go yet. So uh, maybe at this time I can ask uh, before I come to you, Councillor Rutherford, if we don't finish today by 9 p.m., what are the options for us to be, uh, uh, what are the, what was the next opportunity to to, uh, discuss the yeah. deal with subsequent that are left. Sophie. So just looking at the agenda forecast, I would suggest that these all be laid over to the November 7th and 8th 
city council meeting, you can't accommodate these on your council agenda tomorrow. No, no, uh, no. November's calendar's already been significantly realigned, so I'd say your next earliest opportunity would be November 7th and 8th. Okay, does, does that re would require that motion or will just carry on to November 7th? What would, what would be required? Yeah, we'll just, yeah, we'll just, work it yeah, we'll postpone them over. So basically any, any, any yeah. work that you haven't completed at the end of the day automatically gets laid over to the next council meeting. Yeah. So since we're going to send this off to November, that'll just take a quick motion. Got it. Okay. All right. Now, Councillor uh, Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah. So, uh, this, the intention of this is we already have a report coming back to urban planning, um, regarding construction safety and accountability and in discussion with administration and in hearing from the public one of the things that I think needs a bit more of an exploration that wouldn't have been covered in this if we didn't give this explicit direction was around considerations for anything that's on the historical inventory so for example how a basement was built in 1920 is very different from how uh, we build them today. And so if we're doing shoring or anything around, you know, be it demolition or be it construction around things on the inventory, how are we making sure, or are we considering if there's any sensitivities or extra things that need to be uh, considered in the issuing of those permits related to that historical, uh, that historically, it, property adjacent to that build. So that's that's really what it is. It's it, it will bundle it with all of the other kind of conversation we're going to have around uh, accountability and, and impacts to neighboring properties and all of those kind of things. So I just felt like it was appropriate more to continue to bundle it in that conversation as opposed to have a separate conversation about it. So that was the intent of this one. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So Kim, clarity, timing, resources. This works for administration, yes. Okay, got it. Uh, questions, colleagues? Well, seeing none, Councillor Rutherford to close. Or anyone to speak? I have nothing else to say to close. Okay, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we are on to Councillor Stevenson, second by Councillor Rutherford, subsequent motion 13. Lucky 13. Um, this, this subsequent, uh, you know, first I want to acknowledge that the, the new zoning bylaw creates a number of new opportunities for child care spaces, which I, which I think is excellent. Um, this motion is simply to ensure that consideration of, um, well, I'll, I'll say, so there's, there's been an expansion of opportunity, but there still are some limitations. Uh, we know our partners at the province have, have a significant mandate to expand and increase the number of child care spaces in uh, our province, including our city as well. So very pleased to see that we have expanded those opportunities in this first iteration of the new zoning bylaw. This subsequent would just ensure that at the one year update, uh, we're looking at what impact um, the remaining restrictions have had on the expansion of other daycare spaces and if any adjustments are needed. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cardwell. Thank you. So I've had a few of these in the word I represent. Uh, historically and the concerns come back to cars uh, morning drop-off afternoon pickup blocked driveways people parking in other people's driveways and all of that so uh, asked earlier last week at some point about nuisance um, at what point would that many vehicles annoying adjacent property owners become a nuisance do we have a sense of that clarity on that I, I just, when these come up, that I know that that's going to be what people say is the reason they don't want, if they don't want, this kind of use in the neighborhood. No, I'm asking, yeah, just what the, on the definition of nuisance. 
I, I mean, it would have to be really site specific, those considerations, Councillor. I don't know if I can give you a good answer right now about, you know, volumes of cars. What I would, would say is that there is, you know, in terms of the drop off spaces, there is a, a minimum number of drop off spaces that are required by the zoning bylaw. And I think that if a variance um, to those that to that number was being pursued like if you needed more than you could accommodate that's probably where the development planner would start to think about the the definition of nuisance and whether that that met but in that situation you would be talking about a discretionary development and you'd have notice and, a, and appeal rights and all that stuff yeah um, if if um, if such a use is established in a property and then questions are raised around a, that a nuisance has been created. Then what? If there if there is a nuisance being created, does that is that is the right to operate that establishment revoked? Uh, is the use changed back? What happens? Could law speak to this, perhaps? Yeah, the uh, the right to operate wouldn't be revoked. I believe assessing whether a nuisance is likely to occur is more of a matter of the development permit stage and the conditions that are imposed on the permit. So if a condition was imposed designed to mitigate a nuisance and someone wasn't complying with that and a nuisance was created, you'd enforce on the permit as per the condition. Otherwise, uh, some other nuisances might be covered off by other bylaws as well, but there's not really a mechanism for that same enforcement through the zoning bylaw in this so, case. So if the potential for nuisance is not identified and there is no conditions put on a permit and then a, and then a nuisance condition uh, is created or happens, there's no going back on that approval? No, not through the zoning bylaw development Not through the permit. zoning bylaw. Through other bylaws? Maybe. Uh, depending on the type of nuisance, perhaps community standards might be appropriate depending on the type of nuisance. Um, yeah. Councilor, the most, the, oh, sorry, Kim, if you want to, the most common nuisance is parking and there yeah. is the parking regulations for that. But otherwise, yeah, you're limited. Well, yes and no, uh, Mr. Johnson. I mean, you know, this is, I'm not going to belabor this, but this is the situation around every school in the ward I represent is, is the traffic nuisance that is, you know, effectively unmanageable and not enforced. So this is what people see you know, they see it at the school, then they see it down their block. And I'm not, I, I'm not necessarily against the motion and the, the intent of the motion, but that's going to be the question that I get asked. Yeah. That's it for me. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to note, Cart Sir Cartmel, that this is something we can um, monitor. Uh, and so that when we come back with our yearly report, uh, we may have more information on some of the, the items that you're highlighting. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. So we're going to stop here. Uh, we will be back at 6 p.m. after dinner, and we'll carry on with the uh, subsequent motion 13.
Okay, we're live from council chambers. Okay, I would like to I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call, Councillor Wright. Good evening. Can you hear me from over here? Yes, we can <laughs> from the far far. Uh, Councillor Knack. Good evening. Mm hmm Councillor Stevenson. Good evening. So Councillor Principe, I missed, sorry. I'm here. Hello. Oh, good. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Good evening. Councillor Tang. Good evening. Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Councillor Rutherford. Good evening. Councillor Salvador. Good evening. Councillor Cartmel. Good evening. Councillor Rice. Good evening. Councillor Jans. Good evening. Okay, we were on number 13, right? And Councillor Tang, you were next for questions. Yes, great, thank you. Um, so just to, so I can understand too, right now day home is allow, you, is, a, is allow use in RF zones. Yes. Right, and then, because um, I think earlier, <laughs> before dinner break, there was a comment around should we kind of check back on, you know, for if, you know, for this motion, if approved, it kind of checks back on the progress of how this, how this provision will work. Um, have we ever done that with kind of the existing? Sorry, I'm just trying to re recollect what exactly was my question prior. Um, I mean, we've always had allowed this use since, I don't know, 60 years ago, is that right? Or more recently? I'm not sure the full history of it, Councillor Tang. Um, it's been around. The, the, the allowance for um, a home-based business to be a day home, yes, it's been around okay. for a while. Have we ever done sort of a similar check-in to be like, how is that provision working out? What kind of unintended consequences has it ever led to? For example, traffic congestion due to pickup drop-off. So to qualify day home is six children or less, and uh, child care would be seven or more and so there is no development permit required and hasn't been at least for as long as I've been working with the city it's been at least 10 years um, so I don't, I, I don't believe we've had ever had analysis on that before right because I do feel like I mean I, I feel like I hear that concern quite a bit and um, even when it even when it comes to day homes um, that are much smaller in scale and this still generates a concern sometimes I do wonder whether it's real or perceived and do we do any kind of analysis on that so I think I, I mean I think this is a good motion and then um, and there is alignment too with our early learning plan that was also recently discussed at committee is that right like kind of what is the city's role when it comes to child care and early learning facilities and this is our a key place where we play a role in terms of how we regulate and permit these type of uses in our city. That's great. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tank. So that concludes the questions on uh, subsequent 13. Uh, to speak, please. Okay, then uh, Councilor Stevenson to close. Uh, no close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I like that. Thank you. Please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Sorry, I forgot to have you no. try to open. I'm almost also yes. I'm a yes as well, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Knack, were you also a yes? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. 
Display the boards, please. That is carried. Okay, number next one is 14. Uh, Councillor Rice and second by Councillor Principe. Go ahead, please. I would like to restate, and because I'm not sure why the due date is not put there, so I would like to restate my motion. That administration provided a report outlining options to regulate the limit of the number of the supportive housing shelters to provide the consumption services and the overdose prevention services that can operate in neighborhood mixed use and the neighborhood com commercial zones through bylaw 2, chat bylaw 20001 or through other tools. Due date, Q1, 2025. Q1, 2025, okay. Uh, go ahead, please, carry on. Um, so we heard from public speaker talk about um, all those so social services and in certain neighborhoods. And we heard the concern about in certain location and a certain neighborhood and they have very um, high density and for the social services. Um, the motion is just to try to say if there a possible way we can uh, limit a certain number and based on our city's population and based on the needs assessment and to really look at for those social services and the rules and land use uh, perspective and with, the t with this two zones. And one is the new zone we just approved is the neighborhood next use. So another zone is the neighborhood's commercial zone. Yeah. Thank you and Kim, uh, on does this require additional resources? Is, uh, is it clear and, uh, uh, and the uh, reporting, uh, the time for uh, when it comes back? Yes to all. Okay, good. Uh, and to clerk, uh, isn't this, uh, uh, is this symbol separate from uh, the previous uh, subsequent other than uh, the support of housing shelters? It's similar, but not the same. It's similar, not the same? Yeah, maybe I can help. So the previous one was talking about separation distance and other tools. Yeah. The similarity comes in that some of this would be, you could consider other tools. But of course, you've added supportive housing shelters to this one. Um, okay. I, I think it's different enough. To That's fine. Proceed. Okay, got it. Good. Okay, questions, colleague? Councillor Wright. Oh, sir, Councillor Tang, you're first. No, it's okay. I'm trying to delete myself. I okay, think you just answered Wright. my question. Uh, I guess to the mover, um, why are you trying to regulate and limit these services? So it's not about the limit of the services. It's a limit of the number of how many services in, this, in the neighborhood. And I think this is related to the land use. And then that is also reflect and for the land use perspective, like how many percentage of land use and it could be this type of social services. So it's not a limit. I want to be very clear. And it's not limited to social services. It's limited the lumber. And then pro in order for us to provide the proper capacity and to support those so social services. So one's OK and two's not? Or I, I, And I mean. It would be up to the, the housing providers to make sure that they have those supportive wraparound services available for, like for instance, for the supportive housing shelters. Uh, it's a similar principle and when we put this 16% of the affordable housing and to the land use. And it is not up upon to the property owners say how many we want. I think it's upon and for the city to look at the needs and look at the capacity, existing capacity already, and then look at the existing social services already, and to get that really good balance, and from equity lenses. Lens. 
and I, I guess to administration then, the regulation of the supervised consumption sites and overdose prevention services, that is the responsibility of the province and they do thorough consultation in that? Yes, that's our position on that, yeah. Okay. So then is, is that the only option to regulate or is there something within the, the zoning bylaw that could supplement that? You could regulate this from a land use perspective as well if you want to you know, do things like separation distances, you could and that wouldn't be infringing on the provincial jurisdiction. Okay. Um, okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson? Yes, thank you. You know, I think uh, this is certainly a, a concern that we heard. Um, just wondering, again, I think I think there there was the other subsequent which passed just in terms of uh, regulations around congregate shelter spaces. Um, does that does that address some of the some of the content of this motion? Is it to me? Yes, yeah, to the mover. Uh, to the mover. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, no, it's not, because there's a different intention here. And then... Uh, okay, so maybe I could just clarify. So one, one thing that I'm not clear on is, um, you know, I think for me there's two categories. There's sort of supportive housing, and then there's also emergency shelters. So I wasn't clear what supportive housing shelters are, like what your intent there is? Uh, I think for me, mm -hmm. I, mean, is, I try to get some right terms. So I, I was expecting uh, administration could help me for these terms, how we use uh, certain terms for the social services. Uh, the term may not be 100% uh, refract what it is, but it is overall from strategic level is the social services we provide and to the people who need it. So you, you intend for that to be quite broad, so including both affordable housing and yes. emergency shelters? Yeah, like the shelter, yes. And it could be broad and then Give the current situation we already know for certain social services existing in our city's um, certain area. Uh, that's his intention, try to get how we address the concern we heard and from those neighborhoods, those areas. Okay, and I also just want to clarify, so you know, supervised consumption services are very, you know, specific healthcare provision. Overdose prevention services, I mean, that could be handing out naloxone on, on a, uh, the bus or a street or within a housing project. So could you help me understand that piece a bit more in terms of what, what you intend by overdose prevention services? Uh, so like I, I mentioned in the previous motion, at, I talked, the research I have done and then from federal level and the provincial level. And we are actually under different authority and jurisdiction. And from provincial level, they're focused on the nonsense business nonsense application requirements. But during that regulation, there is no non-use purpose and to be incorporated. The non-use purpose and for those services, social services sites is under our city's bylaw. And then I had, I had sp spoken and to the city administration about the gap and in our city's bylaw in terms of certain non-use purpose for the social services. And that gap is identified. And Okay, and then just recognizing yeah. too, I think there is another report, there was an inquiry in terms of the number of social service agencies in, in certain areas. So again, is that information that you feel we need in advance of, of this? Uh, so I'm, I'm not talk about the increased services. I'm not talk about all the services itself right now. From that perspective, I'm looking at it from land use perspective. Is there any opportunity and for our city to look at what existing services already and in certain nights and what 
the services needed in the different line. And I just looking for the information sorry, for the, the, for the report. Sorry, I just didn't catch different, that. Different Wait. line, different line, and like different sites or different oh, reports. Okay. And I'm looking for the information. This Hopefully this report could provide that options come back, give some analysis for the current states we have, and then what's this two new zones could open the door and for the other type of opportunities to achieve that outcome our social services will provide it. Okay, thanks. No further question. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, um, I guess to the clerk, I, I want to challenge you that this is not the same as Motion 8. The title on Motion 8 said options to regulate supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services and talks about regulations, including land use and other tools. And like, this is very similar. So I, I, my thought is for this not to be out of order, should it not strike supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services since we've already debated and made a decision on that? Yep, you, you can. Okay, I would like to move to do that, please. Okay, I um, absolutely, I, uh, okay, that is uh, amendment, yeah, okay, please, uh, any questions on the amendment? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I need a second. I can't sign on right now. I'm sorry? I did have a question. Just hold on, just hold on, Councillor Prince Bay. Uh, I need a second around the amendment. Second. Okay. All right, so now Councillor Paquette, questions on the amendment? Uh, yeah, what is the amendment exactly? It's to strike down what we discussed earlier on, which was supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services, because we already had a previous motion uh, 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 subsequent on it, which was defeated by council. Right. Okay. And, uh, what so we will be just focusing on support of housing shelters. Oh, okay, I see. So, yeah, okay, I got it. Yep, okay. uh, no, that's it, my question on the amendment. Okay, Councillor Salvador, questions on the amendment? No. Uh, Councillor Principe, you have questions on the amendment? Uh, not now, I don't, it's okay, thanks. Okay, Councillor Rice, questions on the amendment? Uh, yes, so I just, I, I just want, uh, to ask mover and for this amendment. And then uh, there is a difference and between this motion and then earlier motion we discussed because earlier motion we talk about separation distance and this motion talk about the quantity of social services. That is a two different category and how this could be the same. If we move this, that means this motion, the scope is changed only focus on the supportive housing shelter is not focused on the number of the services in for supervised consumption services and overdose prevention services provided. So that to me, this is um, two different things. I think we're going to agree to disagree on this one because when I read the previous motion eight, when it talks about further regulate, that could include uh, location, that would include the number and quantity within that. And I think we're splitting hairs, but I feel like, again, we have a lot of motions to go through. And so I'm just trying to be a bit clear that like, to me, we've already debated that council's already made a decision, but we haven't debated um, what was the other one? Perm supportive, uh, housing. supportive housing and shelters. shelters. So that to me is, is fair because we haven't had that debate, but to me, the intent between what this would do and what the other would do, which was essentially generate reports for how we can limit a service, we've already debated. So that's why I made the amendment. Okay, my yeah, thank you, Councillor Rice. So please vote on the amendment. Oh, you want to close, Councillor Rutherford? Sorry. 
no okay okay please vote councillor principe is a no thank you councillor principe i think i misvoted i should be a yes okay can we recall one. the vote i'm sorry recall the vote please vote again Councillor Prince do you wish to remain a no? Yes, I wish to remain a no. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. That's carried, sorry. Now we're back to original motion, which is just focus on supportive housing and shelters. Uh, questions were, I think, Councillor Paquette, do you have questions on that, right? Please go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, so. Uh, to administration, well, it's a little bit of a different motion now, so my questions might, uh, you know what, because I had questions on the other aspects, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Councilor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to the mover, what is the land use impact for trying to regulate and limit for supportive housing? Uh, can you repeat it one more time? Yep. Yeah, what is the land use impact that you're trying to regulate and limit for supportive housing? Uh, this is depends on which neighborhoods and it's up to the each neighborhood because each neighborhood we have different lines. And then for well, the- Well, let for, me, but we're talking about the, like supportive housing is the one that you're concerned about, right? I, I have, I lost support, support housing is one of this, but that's not only limited to this one. Okay, okay, well, I'm, I, my questions are on the supportive housing piece and like what what impacts associated with supportive housing are you trying to or, or are you looking to get options for how to regulate and limit like uh, I'm looking I'm looking for similar concepts to be used as this and be inconsistent with a policy city has been used for the long time 16 percent and for the affordable housing and in the land use perspective. And if we could use that certain percentage for that concept and in the neighborhoods, I, I, I do not see any barrier or reason we cannot use a similar concept to us to okay, and supportive housing. Okay, maybe just like to further clarify, like uh, in the previous, previous subsequent, I think an example of uh, land use impact was, you know, increased parking in the neighborhood. Like I'm just trying to understand what land use impact you're you're primarily concerned about for supportive housing. So how we can be the balance, the social services land use and across the entire city, and instead of the, is it concentrated in one neighborhood or two neighborhoods? Okay, I'm just I'm really just not hearing the land use impact, but I'll I'll end my questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. So that concludes the questions on this. Now to speak. Well, actually, Mr. Mayor, now that uh, I've had time to look at the revised motion, I do have a question for administration. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and, and quickly, so I, I, I'm just thinking of this, and I, I'm just trying to figure out like the uh, how this comes up. Maybe. Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, um, do you see any problems with this motion? Uh, Councillor, I think it's a valid motion that's been put before you. I, yeah. I, I think you're, we may see that the report, if this is passed, it would come back, would, would possibly struggle with distinguishing land use of supportive housing and shelters from maybe some other things. But I would leave that to, to that report. I don't really want to weigh in on this at this point. Right, right. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying because I'm feeling it too. Okay, so, um, all right. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it for me. Thank you, Councilor. Um, what, what zone is being affected by this motion? Can you repeat your question again? Sorry, Councilor Baker. What zone is being affected by this motion? The neighborhood mixed use zone and the neighborhood commercial zone, those are two uh, distinct zones. 
Yeah. Can maybe administration give me some clarity on that, how that would work? Um, we consider, so supportive housing, so these are two, two different things, supportive housing and shelters. So supportive housing is under the residential use. Um, so we would have to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, consider uh, through that lens and shelter is under the community uh, services use. Um, so we would have to look at, at that. I, I don't know how yeah. to answer the question, sorry. Okay. And can we limit supportive housing without impacting other uses? Probably not, Councillor. Um, I, I just I think that we would have to dig into this further to understand how we would go about analyzing it. Okay. All right. Uh, to the mover, do you think that this motion is ready to for council to vote on? Uh, in certain <laughs> yes, and I can explain why if you if you like. Uh, well, I, I'm sure you're going to have a closing argument. Okay. Um, I, I will not editorialize. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. So that concludes the questions on this subsequent now to speak. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. You know, I, I, I have view, I, I have deep concerns about this uh, subsequent. Uh, we've been in this office, some of us longer than two years, uh, majority of us here have been for two years, and uh, from the day until now, we have been strongly advocating to the provincial government that we need more supportive housing, that we need more shelter capacity to provide shelter and housing to more than 3,000 people who are struggling on our streets. Finally, we're getting traction from the federal government. We finally we're getting traction from the provincial government. And the last thing we want to do is create more red tape in creating housing options and creating shelter options for people who are struggling. This goes against our efforts on, on, on intergovernmental advocacy. And this will not be seen in a, and this will be seen as us as a municipality creating more barriers to housing and creating more barrier, barriers to, uh, uh, to creating more shelters. And that will uh, probably hurt our advocacy efforts with both the provincial government and with the federal government. And I hope that council does not support this. With that, I will take the chair back. Returned. Anyone else to speak before I go to Councillor uh, Rice to close? Councillor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, from what I heard and from uh, my colleague's comments and the mayor, so he's... I I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't click on to speak to this. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. No worries, I'll uh, uh, Councilor Rice, just wait. I'll go to Councilor Principe to speak. Oh, oh yeah, Councilor sure. Principe, please go ahead. Thank you for that. Sorry about that. I couldn't click on to speak. I just want to say that uh, I am going to support this motion and, not, and because I, I realize that we do need these services, they're very important. But we also talked at this council, the importance of decentralizing these services. And that's how I read this motion. It's about decentralizing to make sure that we have resources across the city to help people across the city, not just in certain areas. So that's why I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principe. Now, Councilor Rice to close. Go ahead, please. Yeah. May I have my time restarted? Yeah, we will we'll start again. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, uh, here we go. Uh, thank you, everyone, and for your comments, including Mayor's comments. Uh, but I, I do feel struggling and discouraged and by misunderstanding and misinterpret by this motion. So this motion has no intention to limit it our city's social services provide and to the population who need those help. And it's about the, our resources 
and where those resources be located, where those resources be provided, and in the way, in the effective, responsible way, and then the people actually really need those social services. Social services could receive these services, and in the way, and it's convenient for them. And right now, if you look at across our city, and we do not have that analysis come back to our city council say, where are those services located? How their effectiveness look like? And then for my motion, I want to, be, I want to clarify one more time again, even I said from this afternoon to now, over and over, the motion is not create barriers to stop us to provide services or create or create barriers to limit the services. And then is actually the motion is response to the concerns we heard for so many years. And how that decentralized services. And look at our Chinatown. And right now our Chinatown's business is struggling to survive. And look at our entire Chinese community, even we couldn't find opportunity or we feel we couldn't find that, feel safe to go to Chalata. We do need to look at the services and we can provide it in the way and the people feel comfortable to receive them. And also people feel comfortable to go them. And this motion is just from land use perspective. And can we look at the options? And for those type of services, and can provide the way, and everyone feels safe to accept it. And another point I want to say, for the amendment for this motion, actually totally changed the intention of the motion. And one comment I heard is about how the impact for the zones. Because the orange motion is refracted in these two zones. But right now, when the amendment, the change, support, supportive housing shelters only, only refract, only refract residential zones. Of course, it's, it looks right now, the, the entire motion, and it looks is not in alignment and with what we're talking about between the land use impact and this specific context here. So even though I feel uncomfortable for this um, change, but I respect the process. But I do encourage my colleagues to think about everything we are doing here with a great intention to want to make our city to the, to the place everybody can call the home, and everybody can feel safe. Everybody can have opportunity to improve their quality of life by supporting their local neighborhoods and is by supporting their local business. And so I encourage my colleagues to support this. And I looking forward, in this motion passed, I looking forward to the opportunity to work with administration and to make the wording and the scope and then match what we're talking here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Next, we go to 15. Uh, Councillor Nack, uh, seconded by Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, we talked about it uh, during sort of the motion to uh, refer back, and, and we've heard about it throughout the entire conversation. We've heard about it over the years. Um, the heritage management inventory work uh, has been identified by the city auditors, work that needs to be done for us to actually 
more meaningfully address heritage preservation in the city. Um, this motion just creates the unfunded service package, but but I think realistically, you know, at this point, we've, we've talked about it a lot and, and, you know, if there's not a desire to do it, then I think we should just say no. But my hope is that at this point, I appreciate there's a lot of priorities, but um, this is, I think, one of the only outstanding audit recommendations, at least with regards to point one, uh, that is not currently set for action. And I, and I heard in questions to administration that they'll be able to do some work that, that helps uh, I guess, check the box of the recommendation achieved, but I think it's still um, it's still not really fulfilling the the intent and the the overall vision. So I think we need to get this done um, if we actually do want to try to address heritage preservation. Um, Bullet point two and three uh, would allow for some more detailed work happening within communities. Um, you know, I don't want to hide the fact point two is similar but still a different piece to some work that had been previously started and then stopped in Glenora. And that's uh, this work, uh, the addition is specifically to make sure that we're incorporating the district plan requirements within that. Um, and uh, point three would begin to start work in other parts of the city. I think, uh, again, I'll probably debate it if, it if it makes it through and makes it to budget, but I think we heard from Dr. Summers even uh, a proponent of the zoning bylaw renewal, a supporter of it, saying that there might be a case where a small percentage of land across the city makes sense to have some type of heritage zoning. And I think it's, uh, I think we need to get this work uh, done throughout the city. We, we've talked about it a lot. I think now it's time to take the action on it. Thank you, Councillor Nack. I see no questions on this. Or are there any questions on this? Sorry. Any questions? Seeing none, you want to say something to close, Councillor Nag? No. Okay, please vote. Thank you. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now to uh, Councillor Cartmel, seconded by Councillor Rice, subsequent motion 16. Thank you, Marcelli. Uh I did uh, have a chat with uh, city administration that clarified this for me a little bit, so I'd like to withdraw this motion. Okay. Uh, everyone okay with drawing? Uh, okay, nobody raising any questions. Okay, good. All right, it's withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, over to Councillor Jans and second by Councillor Rutherford, subsequent motion 17. Yeah, thank you. As written, this was following up on the, um, the pieces around landscaping and uh, some of the climate action highlighted by speakers from the Skona district as well as others. Okay, uh, questions on this? Councillor Tang, go ahead please. Yeah, maybe a question to clerk, or to I guess to administration, it doesn't matter. Um, wouldn't the one earlier, uh, amendment number five, cover what is outlined here? I don't know, clerical administration, that doesn't matter. There could be some similarities, um, but we we can support this work th with existing resources and in the time that's noted. Um, the intent here is that it is a reflection of the, in our one year update since the bylaw is approved. Mm, yeah, so the timeline will be different from the previous one. Is that kind of what you're saying then? Yes, because the timeline on the first one is the uh, climate planning and development framework, which is just the is the work plan, and this is um, right. looking in more detail on the landscaping. All right, there's enough difference. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, okay, Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sovi. Yeah, just just following up. So uh, I heard the mover introduce this with uh, sort of the recommendations that we heard from the uh, Scona. Uh, community council group. So 
to administration just confirming essentially they, they provided some very detailed recommendations and and i'm there's some i really like there's some i have questions on would you essentially be taking their body of work and and doing an analysis along with whatever else you you feel is is relevant at a, at a high level i think that's a good starting point counselor okay great and this one because it's a bit longer of a timeline um does is there work that you would do with that group and others around sort of digging into some of those specifics? Uh, I, I just wanted to get a sense of of what that that body of work looks like for this particular one. Uh, we've already received feedback from that group and have done analysis on it, and that's why we have proposed some. We had proposed some changes uh, with a, with a bylaw that was before you. Uh, last week and this week, but we will, as Trevor noted, have it as a starting point again, and then review all the landscaping regulations provisions as part of our reporting back next year. Okay. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Nack. And before I go to Councillor Rice, I just got to repeat the question again. Uh, 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 Within budget, uh, sorry, within existing resources, clarity and the uh, uh, and the time. Yes, to all. Oh, yes, to all. Okay, good. Okay, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. I uh, just want to follow up on um, Councillor Rack's question on to the mover. And because in they approved the new bylaw for the landscaping, and we do have that uh, specific percentage and build in. And is this motion uh, to looking for to change that percentage? What is specific? And because we received from public hearing and we received many specific items there, but I didn't see this specific item. Just want to get the intention. What what is looking for for this one? Uh, I would I would uh, defer to administration. But as I wrote it, it was designed to be as open ended as possible to allow for consideration of 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 that as well as many other factors. I would just add, Councillor Rice, that the motion is uh, related to landscaping. We wouldn't necessarily be looking at uh, site coverage, which was part of the feedback when it came to landscaping from some. And we have 30%, like 30% that are specific lumber and in the new bylaw. And so I, I, I really try to figure out what this is looking for to, to address what problem. And because we heard the specific, um, some suggestion and how to address this, and but. Uh, to me, this is not clear. I think the 30% is one of the things we would definitely like to, to take a look at and keep an eye on, particularly from an enforcement perspective. How is it working out? Um, th to me, this motion is sort of um, capturing some work that we would probably be doing already, which is to monitor and report back on the effectiveness of our regulations. And so I wouldn't necessarily limit it um, to a few key points, but um, you know, as we were saying, I think going back to um, the, uh, the the speakers that were referred to from the Scona district and taking another look at their at their input for some of those key highlights is definitely a thing we can do. Um, all, you know, being mindful that we d we did receive much of that feedback already um, and have incorporated you know parts of it through into this zoning bylaw as it uh, was passed. So what I hear here, what I heard here, and is that work is already underway and already, and then incorporate some of them, and then is this redundant work to do that? Uh, and to me, it's so vague. As part of our one-year review, we will be reviewing the landscaping regulations, so that is something uh, we are committed to doing. Um, we are also, also anticipating through the Climate Resilience Planning and Development Framework, there may be some recommendations for, for some further changes of the landscaping regulations. So that means other type of work is already on the way. That's okay. right. That's Thank correct. you very much. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. I just want to confirm to administration that in reading this subsequent, you are also thinking about... Uh, what, what has been also brought up during the public hearing around the diversity of our landscaping, native species, and those kind of things. That's correct. Okay, that was, I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions. Anyone to speak?
Seeing none, Councillor Jans to close. Nothing further. So please vote. Councillor Principe is yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, okay, carrying on. That was number 17, number 18. Councillor Stevenson, second by Councillor Knack. Subsequent motion 18. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in, in the previous zoning bylaw, uh, there had been a requirement introduced in the mature neighborhoods to ensure that uh, ground floor dwellings in multi-unit buildings had uh, direct street access. <clears throat> so it sounds very technical. It sounds like a small design detail. But for me, it's a really imperative part of uh, uh, good city building and, and good urban design. Uh, the, the outcome of requiring those ground floor units to have street access is sort of... Um, a, a greater connection to the street, more overlook, uh, more neighborliness, um, and just just a better interaction between buildings and and the street. <clears throat> Again, it seems like a small thing, um, but I think has a really huge impact in how how our cities are designed. I think about one project in particular, one block in my neighborhood. On one side, you have a thirty meter uh, long building that does have that frontage that does have those uh, front doors on the sidewalk um, and across the street it, it doesn't it's a long building uh, with with very little interaction with the street so I'd really love to um, see those regulations that were in the previous bylaw carried forward um, there is a requirement in the new bylaw if your building is greater than 30 meters in length that you need to have that I just think that that um, should be shorter so the 10 meter distance again I think this helps um, in, in all scales of development, whether it is in low scale areas, you get more of that same feel of, of being on a, a residential street with people's front doors. Uh, in a high density scenario, it really helps reduce uh, the sense of an imposing building on top. It creates a much more friendly environment at street level. Uh, so I'll leave it there. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Constance Stevenson. So Kim, uh... Uh, on clarity uh, within existing resources and the timing for coming back? Uh, the motion is clear. I uh, do uh, wonder if uh, a report might be helpful uh, rather than advancing amendments. So I'll just flag that for perhaps Councillor Stevenson so, to comment Because on. amendments uh, would come to Council, a report will go to committee? Correct. Okay. Um, and then the third would be, uh, so we can do this within re with existing resources. I would just be mindful if perhaps uh, maybe a Q4, Q uh, aligning this work uh, with the 2025 one-year update. Um, it, is, it is under Q2 2025 at the bottom. Oh, this, the motion on my screen, on the screen says third quarter of 2024. No, it, it isn't it Q2, Q2, Urban Planning Committee, new oh. date, come back with one year, Q2 2025. So that's helpful, but I'm uh, maybe... Um, I, that, that was not a friendly amendment for me in terms of the, the date change, but oh, happy I to speak to that when it's my turn. Okay, so provide a report to outlining amendments. You're okay with that, Coster Stevenson? Pardon me? Are you okay with more clarity in the, in the motion instead of just going to amendments, but providing a report outlining amendments so it comes to Urban Planning Committee? Um, well, I think maybe I could use a bit of clarification from administration on that one, um, given that it, it has been an existing regulation. So just wondering what, you know, what, what additional analysis that report may have. Likely uh, similar to what we have in uh, the, cr the previous zoning bylaw. Um, we were just looking at aligning our work plan here with other, uh, some of these other motions that are advancing at the same time. So just being able to collect the work. Um, but if, if your um, intent is to just uh, prepare those amendments direct to a public hearing, uh, appreciate that we can do that. And uh, we, the council report would include information in terms of an analysis in that. 
Sure. And, well, and I would just maybe flag one other, sorry to interrupt, would just yeah. be, um, there would be limited engagement in terms of uh, conducting this work. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely fine, again, given that it was, was existing previously. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the alignment with the work uh, flow, um, would it be fair to assume that uh, that the team may be coming forward with with maybe like an omnibus housekeeping amendment within the first quarter or two of the year? Um, just wondering if maybe that's the opportunity for alignment that that this come forward with the first um, you know zoning bylaw update amendment. If, if it's a straight amendment, that's possible. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if you're sort of thinking that um, you wanted to change the due date from the third quarter of 2024 to the first or second quarter of 2024. We had contemplated the omnibus in March or April. Yeah, that would be, that would be great if that aligns with, with your work schedule. Can, can I suggest maybe a second quarter uh, due date? And if we can bring it sooner, we will. Perfect. That sounds okay. great. Thank, Thank you. you. So again, it's clarity, is it a, a report being generated or directly amendments being brought forward as part of the omnibus? That's my understanding to prepare amendments as part of the omnibus. Got it, okay. Okay, Councillor Paquette, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, to administration, what was the rationale for not having that requirement? Councillor, it was to provide um, more uh, flexibility for different types and arrangements of multi-unit housing. Um, those, we, we, when we looked at, you know, what's the correct threshold, um, we didn't feel that, you know, below 30 meters, um, you know, we didn't feel that it had the same potential for a long uninterrupted uh, building wall as say a larger building would. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's generally why. Okay, I see. And um, so, I, I do want more information on this before making a decision. So I'm wondering if it would be appropriate for me to move a amendment that this comes back as a report. You can make the amendment. Um, Second. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. That's, yeah, that's everything for me, Mr. Okay, Mayor. Now questions on the amendment. Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Questions on the amendment. Thank you. Maybe to administration. Um, I, I know in previous omnibus uh, type amendments that have come to council, there are, it has been possible to have, let's say, an attachment that, that outlines the rationale or the consideration um, for a proposed amendment. Would it be possible to include that information uh, with, with this approach? I, I think so, Councillor. Um, I would also possibly consider, depending on what else comes out of these subsequents, um, whether we need to split out the omnibus into two bylaws, um, one for administrative amendments and one for something like this that might be a little bit more involved. Yeah, and I think that format has worked well in the past. So I think it, it sort of meets meets the, the needs that Councillor Paquette was referencing in terms of having that clarity while also, um, you know, just allowing it to... Uh, to move forward in, a, in an efficient way. Um, okay, that, so, so I, I, I think I understand the intent of the proposed amendment. Um, I, I don't think I would support it because uh, it, it generates another report and it generates additional work, whereas the information that's being requested could be provided as part of the, Sorry, you're the speaking, amendment report. Sorry, you're speaking to it now, Councillor. Uh, okay. So, okay, all right, so, okay, we have a amendment on the floor. Anyone to speak? I'll just close. Uh, I just, just, you know, just, I understand the uh, the Councilor desire Pickett, to move. Councillor Paquette, just oh. hold on, just hold on. Sorry. Okay. Oh, there is someone speak, let, to let speak me, to it. Let me come to you. No, no one is assigned to speak. Now I'll come to you to close. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. The only reason I'm, I'm putting this forward is because, I, I, as I said, I, does, I understand the desire to move uh, more quickly and sort of get rid of some of that red tape and decision making, but um, I would really like to have a report and be able to consider it 
um, before then being faced immediately with the decision on whether or not to vote on those amendments or not. Um, and so out of that report might come a completely different uh, amendment, which one could argue, okay, well, if that's the case, that could happen anyway, sure. But just for clarity and for you know a, a clear path, um, as far as governance, I would prefer to go with the report and then uh, the debate and decisions rather than here's what you're going to be debating and deciding on right in front of you. By the way, there's a report with it too. So that's just sort of my rationale. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. So please vote on the amendment. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, amendment is carried. Now we're back at the uh, uh, main subsequent. Uh, all the questions have been concluded. On that, anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Stevenson to close. No, thank you. Appreciate the conversation. Always, always good to um, uh, learn more. So look forward. Uh, I, I hope my colleagues will support this and we'll have some further information uh, via report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So please vote. We're just getting that loaded. Here we go, now vote please. We have all the votes. Display the votes please. That is carried. Okay, now carrying on is next one is Councillor Rutherford, second by Councillor Nack, subsequent motion 19. Yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. May I introduce? Absolutely. Yeah, so before we approved Charter Bylaw 2001, we actually had the requirement for two trees and four shrubs on lots within this site width. And, um, you know, we've talked a lot about climate, and I, I just don't understand why we went back in this one. I know that during the council portal, questions that that one was asked and the rationale within the question was simply that you know through feedback people have stated it's or feedback uh, engagement that it's been stated that it was hard to to meet that requirement a again I recently uh, have a house where I had to do this landscaping. I'm in this uh, site width of under the less than eight meters and I did not find it hard. Plus I worry about the unintended consequences of only one tree because right now uh, with the, the handy information guide that I was mailed out uh, <laughs> to, to give me information about my landscaping, you know, it really talked about the need for one coniferous tree and one deciduous tree as well as some examples of varieties. And so I worry if we go from one tree to, to down to one tree as we have, that there's gonna be uh, more desirable for the, con for the deciduous than the coniferous varieties. Um, that being said, the reason I was also very clear to not make this a report is because to me, this is a very straightforward amendment. It is basically saying, let's keep it the way that it was before with this specific, uh, regulation and so that is why I did not feel like we needed to have a discussion about it happy to hear what my colleagues think but that was the intent for why it is uh, prepare amendments as opposed to a report thank you thank you Councillor Rutherford questions colleagues one two three 
No more, no questions. Counselor Rutherford to close. I, I don't have anything further to add. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Let's play the votes, please. That is carried. Now, down on to 20. Councillor Knack, second by Councillor Cartmill, subsequent motion 20. Councillor Knack, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, yeah, this is about looking at uh, potentially reintroducing the requirement that we have in our, I guess, technically still current zoning bylaw until January 1st, which would state uh, if you are building something that is permitted under the rules, you still have to send out a letter notification um, to the abutting property owner. Um, uh, so this doesn't immediately reintroduce that. It will give us uh, a better understanding of some of the new changes we're making, including the opportunity to uh, essentially you know, sign up for notifications for thinking things happening in your community beside your home. Uh, but I, I do still think there's a, uh, a population that might not be able to use those tools uh, as much as we might as, as much as we might want. Um, I think having that letter is still important. I think it's it's good information to know when something has been approved beside you, even if you have no right of appeal because it's following the rules. It's still nice to get that information um, that allows you to make you know preparations around construction that might occur, demolition. Uh, the last thing we want to see is folks sort of surprised by someone showing up and uh, and suddenly some work happening without maybe getting any preparation. Uh, in advance, um, as we're looking to make sure we're trying to do everything possible to protect homes that are uh, dealing with construction next door, being able to be notified so you can take pictures and all that is valuable. So uh, this will come back in a report and, and the intent, I mean, just to be very frank, would be that, uh, to reintroduce that that mail out requirements. And, and my hope is that uh, over the next couple of months before this comes back is that we'll have a um, uh, we'll be able to see how technology can maybe help us further automate uh, the, a mail out system because right now it's a little bit more complicated than than I would have expected having learned the specifics of it. Um, I, I think I think we have the technology and and it'd be great to put it to use. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Uh, questions, colleagues. Oh, uh, sorry, Kim. Uh, timing wise, clarity, resources. Yes, to all. Oh, Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Questions, colleagues? Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Um, just on that resourcing piece, um, so my understanding is that you have enough, you can do this report within the existing resource, but suppose it passes and we start to generate, or you know, depending on what the outcome at that time, and we do provide notification in the future to adjacent neighbors, that would mean additional resource because we're talk talking about printing, delivery, all of that, right? That's correct. Um, the last time we costed this out was about in 2018 and it was only around $10,000 per year. Okay. That's just specific for the mail outs, but not uh, the time it takes for development planners uh, to respond to inquiries around that class A notice. Gotcha. Okay, That's, that actually is very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I was looking, uh, actually, I was looking for, I'm going to say more um, uh, to add an appeals piece to this to understand how much things are, are going to, are, are being appealed, but I don't think it's a fit for this rereading through the motion. So perhaps I'll, I'll move that at a different time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, just briefly to the mover. So you, you referenced this a bit, but just wondering how you would see this interacting with some of the new technologies that are coming out uh, potentially in terms of um, uh, you know, being able to opt in for development permit notifications. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm hoping we can maybe figure out how that technology is, is working and, and use something in a similar way to help 
uh, expedite the process for city staff. I appreciate it's only 10 grand, but there is some staff time of like actually typing it on the letter. Um, uh, gosh, I hope there's some technology, some, maybe chat GPT can help us out of saying, hey, if, if you've approved a permit, something triggers somewhere else and it just automates a, a letter, prints it out, and the, and the most we have to do is put it in an envelope and, and send it away. And, and so I, I'd love to use that technology if we can to help um, still allow this and expand on it. Well, and sorry, I guess my, my clarification that is actually the other way around that that residents would have the opportunity to opt in the notification. Um, was that your thinking as well in terms of? I, I mean, that's happening regardless at this point. I, my, my concern is is more for those that might not um, be relying on on the tool, the online tool uh, that, that might not have be as comfortable with signing up for those. So uh, yeah. I think it's going to be great that we're moving to that opt-in. I know I'm going to sign up for those, but but I, I don't know if everyone has that uh, that technological uh, experience and, and would feel comfortable signing up for those and relying on that to be their source of information. Yeah. You know, I think, again, I, I, I like the idea of more information sharing. I think development permit notification signs have been, have been really effective for that. I guess that's sort of what I, I'm not sure I understand is what what part of the information you would get back would would let you know that this is effective that that people appreciate these notices that they are achieving achieving the outcomes that they're intended to uh, again i think there's challenges i know in terms of if it's going to the people living in the unit or if it's the owners who maybe don't live in the city like how do we evaluate if this is an effective method of of notification I think there's a, and it's tough. You're right. I don't know if there's a perfect measurement for this, um, but I, I think there are certain things that part of why we did that is is a bit of a, hey, infill has been approved next door to you. Here are some steps you might want to take to prepare yourself for that. So you know, do we have so? But I don't know how you'd measure the preparedness of landowners adjacent to infill construction. If did they take pictures of their foundation before construction started? I, I, you know, I don't want us to do that, but but I think that's that's the the overall intent of making sure we're providing as much information as give give everyone a chance to prepare. Okay, and so maybe maybe just to administration, what what led to this practice being retired? What sort of of feedback or analysis led to that decision? So this is this is. Um you know, these notices go out for permitted development. And uh, so the fact that, you know, if somebody receives such a letter that they wouldn't necessarily be able to um, have a reasonable, uh, you know, appeal opportunity for any of those, as well as the fact that um, the amount of uh, back and forth that tends to happen as a result of these letters being sent out and the amount of, um, you know, education, the, the time spent educating the uh, surrounding neighbors that's required um, is is a, uh, a staff resourcing uh, co uh, constraint. Okay, no, I appreciate that. And yeah, I'm, I'm torn because again, I think even if it takes a bit of staff time, if it, if it can help share information and it can be successful in helping people, um, you know, sort of understand what's happening. Is that is that sort of the outcome that we were seeing, or or were the frustrations sort of still there at the end of it? I, I do think, and this is anecdotal, uh, counselor. Um, in talking to some of our our colleagues, um, I do think that there was often some frustration that resulted from those types of discussions. People asking things like, "Well, why are you going to why are you sending me a letter if I can't appeal it?" Um, I, I can't say that that's the only. Um, the only consideration, but I'll pass it on to my colleague here to finish the answer. A uh, bit of a jurisdictional scan as well that uh, reaching out to other jurisdictions, they don't do this um, uh, for a variety of different reasons. So this is something that, uh, and I think we also presented this as part of an omnibus previously and said it would be covered off under the zoning bylaw renewal initiative. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks so Thank much. you, Okay. All right. So Okay, Councilor Wright, can you move? No? Okay, got it. No? Okay, so that concludes the questions. Anyone to speak?
no one to speak. Councilor Nack to close. Just very quickly on that last point that was raised in that series of questions is that I'd appreciate there will be sometimes, and and we've all probably experienced it where we've had some constituents that will contact us and we get them in touch with somebody who is uh, more of an expert and, and they share information. And, and sometimes that will generate in frustration. Some people will want the opportunity to continue to appeal certain things that are approved. Um, I found far more often than not though, people have just appreciated the fact that they've been able to get have those conversations. And I know that uses staff time, um, but I, I also think that's that's not an area I'm, I'm, I'm really willing to, to see, to cut back on. I think if people have questions about what what development means in their neighborhood, what will be happening next door to them. I think that is um, well worth the the time being used by city staff to help make sure folks are educated and informed and, and have a better understanding of what can happen in the community. Thank you. Thank you. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And next, we are on to 21. Councillor Rice, second by Councillor Principe, subsequent motion 21. Go ahead, please. Uh, so this motion, um, uh, the intended to looking for the information and for the past two years, and when city changed the bylaw to remove the parking minimal requirements and for the development. Um, in the past two years, not only and from public hearing, I heard lots of concerns and regarding the neighborhood parking. Um, I, I also heard our city administration say we have surplus. But uh, however, we heard from public m members and then residents say, always concern about not enough parking and including downtown area. So I'm looking for uh, our city administration and take the deep look and for the outcomes of that change by law and back to 2020. And also with that information to explore options, how we can address those concerns we heard. And so that's his uh, basic intention and for this. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So uh, what do you come uh, on clarity on uh, within existing resources and the uh, due date is not there yet? Due date, I, I have, I had original is Q3 2024. I'm sorry. Q3 original, I put Q3 2024, but uh, I am open and for the administration for their capacity to determine the time. Okay. Uh, so we do not have capacity to undertake this work um, and would suggest we'd need a service package to be able to conduct um, the analysis and the engagement that was completed. Um, given that open option parking was only recently approved in 2020, we don't anticipate there has been a lot of change yet as of yet. Um, we know that parking spaces are still being provided, but I recognize there are some areas in the city that are experiencing some challenges, um, but we would, we would need to reframe this to, to uh, uh, receive some budget to be able to conduct this work. It's like the one previously passed on the uh, heritage properties that, uh, so yes. it needs to be, a certain unfunded service package needs to come to budget for consideration by council before this work can be undertaken. So council Rice, I know if you wanna wanna withdraw it, reinstate it or make a subsequent, or make it as a notice of motion uh, to generate a, uh, a service package, unfunded service package. So council Rice, over to you. I just want, wanna, wanna know how you wanna proceed with this. Uh, I I do not say that the unfunded package is needed. And the administration is saying that they need more resources to do this work. And because I'm not request the new frame for framework to be developed, I just looking for the information to do the analysis for the outcome with that change. And then 
if we have team could do that framework and that as a reporting requirements, I think there is no reason to request additional funding to do just to do the information for the analysis on the outcome for that change. So I, I do not see that. Uh, so I do not see that on funding, we need additional funding to, because I'm not requesting to develop the new framework for the parking requirements. This is a significant body of work, um, particularly to do the analysis um, and with our resources focused on many of the other motions that are before us here and have been approved along with implementing the zoning bylaw, uh, we, we do need additional resources to yeah. be able to conduct this. Got it. Okay, got it. Administration needs resources. Mover feels no. Council has to decide what path to take. Uh, Councilor Salvador, questions? No, please? I'm okay. No questions. I shouldn't okay. be on the board. Okay, any more questions on this? See none. Councilor Rice to close. Um, just very quick. Uh, yes, we changed that bylaw back to two years ago. However, in the past two years, we still heard the concern and from our residents. And plus, during this new bylaw approved for the implementation um, with the entire city, cross the entire city, and we're up, we are up zoning and then requirements for the parking, specifically in the area, our public transit, Cannot, cannot reach. Because right now, you cannot guarantee entire city everywhere we have public transit. That services if is not provided for those neighborhoods. And when the development happened, we do need to provide the parking for people to use their car to even meet their basic life needs. So that is this motion once looking for the information to provide that evidence data to say how we can provide that public transit services, not only public transit services, we can provide support to those neighborhoods where is a lack of public transit services for people to have the place to park their car, to use their car for their basic, basic daily life, go to work, go to school, and support their kids. So that is this basic motion for this. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Please vote. I mean, yes. Thank you, Councilor Rice. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Uh, next one is Councilor Rutherford, second by Councilor Salvador, subsequent motion 22. Yes, thank you, Mayor Zohi. And, um, you know, this, I know that we just talked about a public, a tr private tree bylaw. And I felt like that was more the stick in this, you know, that we talked about. And in that report, it highlighted that incentives were important and what administration recommended. And one thing I've been really grappling with in this bylaw 2001 is very skeptical that the incentives that are in there are actually going to achieve any results, especially within the RS zone, since landscaping isn't the requirement of the builder. So I really don't see that connect with, with having any kind of, it, it creating that kind of incentive. So the intent of this uh, subsequent motion, and, and if it's too wordy with, ex with explore opportunities on private land, I mean, you could really strike out that entire section in between the commas. And I think it would get more to the heart of the intent, which is I really want administration to come back with further ways to enhance retention incentivization within specifically bylaw 2001. Um, and I'm open to the due date being a little bit longer if we wanted to wait a year to see how that's working. But I mean, from the conversation we've had with administration, they've 
they've clearly said, and even in the council question and answer portal, that they do not foresee this incentive really helping in the RS zone, but helping in the medium and high de density zones more so. So I think we already know that that there's can be more to be done in the RS zone around incentivizing the mature tree and, and protecting our mature trees from being lost. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. So striking that part is already, I think it's in the uh, administration had uh, highlighted that. So is everyone okay with striking down on private land to continue the advance of achieving city's tree canopy goal? If anybody has any concerns, I, nobody's raising hands for concerns. Okay, that'll be struck down. And on the uh, resources, clarity, and the timing, Kim? Yes, this works. Uh, the intent with the third quarter uh, timeline, I think works as well, because we were going to align this report back with the um, report that's coming in September of 2024 that is an update from the city trees, city plan urban trees report that outlines the roadmap of our programs and projects and initiatives to support uh, additional planting and maintenance and retention of trees on public and private property. Great, okay. Questions, colleagues? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Rutherford to close. Nothing further. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, now, carrying on, next one is Councillor Rice, second by Councillor Wright, subsequent motion 23. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. So, uh, this motion is specific, lo looking for some information as part of the cannabis re uh, retail store and liquid store separation system review reports and to really look into the separation distance between child care and the cannabis store. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So, Kim, on clarity, uh, resources, and the timing. Yes to all, um, and this would align with the, the work plan that we had related to separation distances for liquor stores and cannabis as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions, colleagues? I had, <clears throat> sorry, I had asked to get on the list, but I don't oh, know. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, okay. please, Councillor. Um, okay, that's one thing that I, I wanted to ask about with the, the the, the distance review report, and that is coming at the same time as this Q1 2025, is that right? Yes. I think um, we're, we're coming to Urban Planning Committee in Q1 of 24 with our work plan, uh, so I recognize we're going to have to look at when all the things are due and, and prioritize, but the intention would be to bring um, the review we were doing on cannabis and liquor stores in first quarter of 2025 and align this motion with that work as well. Okay, and, and right now there are separation distances as required provincially, but not from childcare services, from That's schools correct. and- Yeah, there's no separation distances in the bylaw related to childcare services. Okay, and no provincial requirement to do that. That's correct. Okay, so then I guess to the mover, child, What's the concern with childcare services? Like a four-year-old that's in a day home, daycare is not gonna walk over to the cannabis store or the liquor store. I would hope not, because I hope they'd have better care of the child. Uh, it's, a, it's the same reason why we have the separate, uh, separate, separate distance and with the school and the playground. That's his requirement. And then if we require for the schools and for the school and the playground, and why we cannot consider to require but that's to align with the province's requirements for the school's uh, separation distance. They, I mean, the province doesn't even see a need for childcare services, a separation distance. 
like I said, and for the school and for child when they go to school when they when they go to the playground, and then it's the same reason. And then they have they have the parents with them. And why we need the separate uh, separation distance for them, not separating this for the child care. Because it's required by the province. Okay, yeah, that's I, all I have. I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm not voting in favor. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Similar lines of question, maybe just to administration. Um, I believe that when the cannabis separation rules were being put in place, uh, you know, there was consideration of of child care services, but that um, the fact that children are necessarily supervised and with an adult at all times going to and from child care services, that that, that was a, a factor in that decision to not include the separation distances. Yes, that's correct, Councillor. Um, in addition, the the fact that child care services are generally less permanent in nature than something like a school or a park. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, that's a good point. Um, and then just, you know, whether, whether intentional or not, um, I'm assuming that these would be reciprocal separation distances. So if a cannabis retail store existed in the location, that would limit the opportunity for a child care service to move in within that separation distance? Yes, Councillor, that, that would be a potential consequence. Okay, and, and that in turn would, would decrease the, the availability of child care, of sites that would be um, uh, available for child care services. Yes. Sorry, okay. just a minor correction there. Um, depending on how it's worded, that may not necessarily be the reciprocal effect. It could just be that it would affect the non-conforming status of the existing campus retail store. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I think, I mean, I think it could be written that way, but it would be, it would be logically inconsistent, I think, to, to do so. But appreciate, appreciate the clarification that we could write it that way, but then, so, so that I'm clear, a child care service could move in and then make the cannabis store legally non-conforming effectively. Yes, essentially. Yeah. Okay. And that 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 does not. Uh, I see a fairness issue there. Okay. I'll I'll wrap it up there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor, I see you have questions to the administration, right? Uh, yes, I do. Go ahead, please. Uh, I just have a very quick question. So, no matter this motion is in place or not in place, but that uh, uh, review work and it was still going on, right? Yes, although it wouldn't have been specific to child care services, it would be related to the separation distances within the bylaw. So uh, child, child care, uh, this one piece services will be not included in that re review work? We don't have a separation distance now, so it, no, it would not be something we would consider in the review of separation distances. Okay, uh, thank you, that's my question. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Tang. Um, I guess first to administration. I think we talked about this before, but just to confirm, but we're one of the only municipalities that have a separation distance policy for cannabis stores in general, in Canada at least. Or, 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 or do we know if we are? Uh, there is a uh, cannabis regulation that, uh, provincial regulation that has separation distances. And so uh, each municipality in Alberta can do engagement. And then we had the opportunity to um, incorporate Correct. those yeah. uh, separation distances or we could change them. And so some of ours don't quite align with what the provincial regulations are at this moment. They go beyond what the provincial regulations are. And this is one of the reasons why we want to review the separation distances for cannabis retail stores. I thought in the past when it came up, um, you know, I, I thought we were doing something that no other jurisdictions are, are kind of doing on the separation piece. But maybe I misunderstood that. Maybe because we ha are, have gone beyond what the provincial gotcha. regulations are. Okay, so we, so we are one of the jurisdictions that have gone above and beyond those. Oops, sorry. Yeah, for clarity, Councillor Tang, um, we have separation distances between cannabis stores, between school and public libraries, uh, recreation facilities, healthcare facilities, and school or lands that are designated school or municipal reserve. Um, and there's different separation distances for each of those. The provincial regulations are a 100 meter buffer 
I might need help with from what though? Um, from uh, from other cannabis or from like, you know, the public library, the recreation facility, public lands, but some of ours are 200 meters. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, and then do you know of any other jurisdiction that have the particular provision related to childcare? At this moment, no. Okay, so it's, there's nothing we can kind of look to to, to build from. Um, yeah, okay. And, okay, you know what, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just uh, gaming this out a little bit, uh, just uh, in my ward, I know that uh, in, in one of our retail areas, we've got um, a daycare, uh, we've got a liquor store, and then we've got a cannabis store. And they all are open and work together. We've got a medical office, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and as far as I know, it's been working pretty good. But if we then introduce separation distances, what happens in that scenario? They would be legally, they would be non-conforming in the existing situation. Um, and in the future, it wouldn't be allowed, the thing you're describing. So which would go, which would have to go? go. It would uh, depend again on how the regulation was drafted, but presumably no one has to go, you're legally non-conforming, but you can't expand your business. Okay, um, so I get it. Consequences for the cannabis business. Okay, so it would not make any difference to existing businesses. Councillor, it's uh, Jamie Johnson. You're not unless they wish to redevelop. They wouldn't be able to. Right. That's, okay. That's the real limitation. Okay. So it does affect financings and stuff once in a while. Lenders sometimes get worried about that. Okay. Um, have we had a lot of problems with uh, cannabis stores in relation to daycares? Not that we're aware of. Have we had any problems? We haven't looked no. into it, Councillor Paquette. So um, just anecdotally between the team here, we're not thinking of instances where we've been, uh, have highlighted concerns from, from the communities, but uh, that would be something we would explore through this motion. Okay, I just, through my personal experience, which is not data, but then also through the fact that we don't have any red flags of data going up, it seems like we're just sort of creating a potential problem where there actually is none. We're trying to create a solution where there are no you, problems. So you speak I'm, to I'm speaking to it, I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Okay, so that concludes the questions on this. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Rice to close. Uh, I, I, I heard uh, Councillor Prakat asking the day that you may not get that data until and we implement the new bylaw. And because the new bylaw, we introduced the new neighborhoods mixed use, commercial use. And with that new zone, and so the situation and in the neighborhood, <laughs> specifically inside the neighborhood, and because before, cannabis, cannabis store and it, uh, only, uh, only permitted, and then outside the neighborhood and in the street mall, and but right now, and hopefully I use the proper term, uh, right now with the uh, neighborhood commercial zone and then this could be uh, go inside the neighborhood so that to me and as uh, it best give this new situation and to review this distance i'm not for this one i'm not ask you set up the separation distance right away i'm asking uh, city administration to provide information along with their review for the one year review work and to provide back for us to make that final decision. So I encourage my colleagues to support this and because also they, they will support the review work and the city administration is going to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So please vote. Just waiting on one vote. 
I got timed out there. I'm a no. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Next, we go to Councillor Stevenson, seconded by Councillor Rutherford, subsequent motion 24. Councillor Stevenson, please go ahead. Uh, introduce and Councillor Rutherford, can you take the chair? I've got to step out for a few minutes. Yes, thank I have you. the chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so this, this is definitely on the more technical side of things. Uh, what, what this amendment relates to is the requirement for uh, in mixed use buildings for commercial and residential to have separate waste collection facilities. Um, this may seem like a small matter, uh, but it can create a really significant footprint on, on buildings that are, you know, trying to be compact, trying to meet that mixed use objective of our city plan vision. Um, the other uh, piece too is that it can create real constraints um, for adaptive reuse of buildings. So what, what this, uh, what the first part of this motion does would be to remove that specific requirement for this for the separated storage areas from the zoning bylaw um, and then the second part um, oh, but those requirements would still stay within waste management guidelines in order to meet meet the objectives of our, our waste utility uh, and the services they provide and then the second part of the motion is just some additional information about how we can reduce um, the sweep paths for for um, uh, waste vehicles on sites. So again, not only do the two separate storage areas, um, those footprints are maybe inevitable. You need to have separate uh, waste receptacle bins for, for both the residential and the commercial. Um, but the access to those storage areas, the sweet paths of um, waste vehicles, given that they are so large, again, can really eat up a lot of that really important footprint. So that is a long introduction. Happy to take any questions. Uh, really appreciate uh, the collaboration with administration to you to bring this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. And so my questions to administration will be the same as the mayor has asked around resource timeline capacity all things. Yes to all, and I'll just note that De Dennis Dubinvale is here if there's any questions for waste services. Okay, any questions, colleagues? I see Councillor Tang, please go ahead. Um, maybe I'll start with the mover, j just so I can better understand. Um, so you're saying that currently there is not adequate separate facility or pathway to get to the storage or facility. Is that right? Uh, no, uh, the concern is that the new zoning bylaw requires a separate storage area for residential and commercial waste. Um, so they, they can't be co-located uh, as the zoning bylaw is currently written. Um, Waste management has uh, guidelines and service standards where some of these requirements can be outlined, but having it in the zoning bylaw just restricts the flexibility that that waste uh, waste services can can provide um, in in the development permit process. So your so this motion would offer more of that restriction. Nope, this so motion would delete the requirement for the separate storage areas for the residential okay. and the commercial waste. Okay, great. And then to Mr. Jubinville, any, would this be doable easy, or you know, easier and fr um, from a practical perspective? So our recommendation, sorry, our recommendation is to maintain uh, it in the bylaw, and just for um, just a, uh, a I guess it's not a correction, but a little bit of a greater explanation. In the prior requirements, there used to have to be a physical barrier separa uh, separating the two, and uh, under this current drafting, it says a separate space. Now, a separate space could be within the same area, but just separated in a way uh, through 
through work with the developers uh, to determine whether or not a screen or a lock or something just to separate the two. And the reason being is it's two separate sources of waste. Ratepayers pay for residential, uh, commercial tenants pay for their commercial, keep that separate uh, to keep the streams clean. Uh, with EPR currently coming in, producers are only responsible for residential, not commercial. So there's a lot of reasons as to why uh, we believe a separation and we were careful to change the wording from a physical barrier to a separate space. Um, so that is the reason why we uh, we had it introduced into the bylaw and our preference for it being in the bylaw. And uh, how does, and the, sorry, I don't know how to quite word this, my question, but uh, you know, with this, with a three stream collection, now that we're moving also multi-unit residential to that, have any impact? Yeah, I think so. That's specifically why this is in the bylaw, uh, because the, um, what we're starting to see is more prevalence of having mixed use as Councillor Stevenson has introduced. And so with that, um, having it in the bylaw, recognizing that we'll have condominiums and apartments above uh, retail or commercial space, uh, it allows for that separation, but doesn't have the same prohibition that we used to have where there was a physical barrier required. And I think sometimes that results in what Councillor Stevenson is bringing forward to us that it created different pathways uh, for different types of trucks to get in, whether it's the commercial trucks or our residential uh, waste collection trucks. And as you note, that's uh, three streams that are gonna be introduced here in the next little while. Hmm. Um, okay. And then just back to the mover, can you just explain to me the problem then again that, that you're hoping this motion would, would solve? I'm so sorry, would you mind repeating the question? Can you just clarify for me one more time from your perspective, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, it's just in terms of reducing the footprint requirement for, uh, for the developments and the amount of uh, footprint that needs to be devoted to um uh these the separate storage areas so appreciate some of the clarifications being provided um i the the bylaw wording seemed uh inflexible to me in terms of having to have that that separation um but that's the overall intent is just to reduce the footprint that's required okay thank you thank you councillor tang councillor wright thank you Mr. Jubinville, I'm just wondering the three stream, the three stream waste collection um, for these um, units. That's going to take up more space, right? Yeah, correct. Um, it will it will require, uh, I guess, collection in three different ways. Whereas previously, for seventy percent of the city, it was two, which is just recycling and waste. And now we also require four organics. So that means the building owners in that are going to. They're going to need to find more space. So I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm ag agreeing with Councillor Stevenson's uh, the first part of the motion there to to remove that so that they can sort of manage the space that they've got for all their different collections, whether it be residential or commercial. Councillor Travis Pollock here, yeah. uh, just to clarify in terms of how we regulate this through the development process, um, if this line item were deleted uh, because the zoning bylaw is silent, but we still have our waste services guidelines. Uh, it would kick over to that document, uh, which still recommends uh, the separate streams, uh, but it allows, uh, what I think I'm getting, I understand from the motion is that it will allow some flexibility in that evolution of the waste guidelines uh, to happen without having then to come back and amend the zoning bylaw itself for that one regulation. If, if this 4.1.4 is removed? Correct. Okay. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, um, just really simply, uh, Mr. Juvenville, does this make waste collection in the future easier for you to have this, uh, this subsection deleted? Or does it make it more difficult? Or does it have absolutely no material difference whatsoever? I think what it does is it creates, it creates, uh, I guess it just, it doesn't, it, it, it will put it down into our development standards as to what is or isn't uh, required rather than it being in the bylaw. And so it, it then gets to the standard level. Um, 
in a bylaw, it in essence uh, will make it that both are separate, uh, that they're in different spaces. Uh, whereas if it's in the standard, then it's not as firm. Now we do know that there's, um, you know, from whether it's you know waste reduction or ensuring we don't commingle, and then also with uh, extended producer responsibility coming, there's significant reason why we'd want the two streams separated, notwithstanding the fact um, that we're trying to reduce waste and um, you know have the residents not pay for commercial waste. Uh, so there's many reasons why we'd want it separated, and having it in the bylaw would make that more distinct and and more difficult to uh, get past. Okay. But if you're looking for flexibility. Uh, the standard would enable more flexibility, but it likely wouldn't be our recommendation. Okay, so what I'm hearing is it's a little bit of uh, trying to find the balance between flexibility for the developer, but surety for the city in order to actually implement what council has already directed the city to do as far as waste collection. Correct. Okay. Um, all right, good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Anyone else with questions to um, administration? Anyone to speak to this? Councillor Stevenson, would you like to close? Yeah, just very briefly to say, appreciate the conversation. I know this seems like a, a small thing. I know that in Apology, some projects- uh, My deep apologies, I was oh. on the board to speak there. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Councillor Paquette. I thought you were still on uh, from questions. I apologize. Please. Oh, no, no, that's and I should have spoke up a little bit quicker. That's all. That's on me. Um, that's OK. So, so sorry, Councillor Stevenson. We'll come to you in just a moment. OK, so I feel a little bit like a bad guy because I'm not going to support this um, simply because I think that uh, I'm going to speak like an old guy here. The, the 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 great battles of 2017 to 2021 uh, about waste collection and uh, the dire straits we found ourselves in at the beginning of the term and uh, all the work that we had to do to get into source separation and the whole nine yards. It was an enormous amount of work. Um, and I'm a little bit worried about weakening um, the city's ability to ensure that work continues. Here's, and this, uh, it's a fascinating question. I'm actually really glad it was brought up because it's it's where our policy uh, in one area is sort of bumping up against uh, you know a bylaw in another area. And in this case, it might be a little bit um, harder for folks who, well, let's just put it this way. It might be just harder in order to implement our, our waste strategy. Um, if we if we don't have these things separated is what I'm hearing from administration and, and I agree from 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 what I've uh, learned to date in utilities. So while I totally understand where this is coming from, I'd rather again I, at this point I would vote against it. If I had a report that could really clearly show me what the issues are and how we can navigate around them in a way that we can still um, get our waste strategy uh, implemented as cleanly as possible and provide that flexibility to developers. That would be the best of all worlds. But in the moment, I just, I think I still have nightmares about uh, all the work that we had to do to get to where we are right now with waste. And I don't want to um, in any way sort of bypass that or to cause problems uh, unintended problems with that uh, in the future. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. And I now see Councillor Tang on the board to speak. Yeah, I guess just very quickly, um, I'm inclined to agree with much of what Councillor Paquette has mentioned. Appreciate the, you know, the, the, the intent here. And I do know that there is a second part that talks about a bit of, it's a, it's a memo, maybe not a report. Um, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into a bit of that detail. I'm, I am mindful, especially of the comment around there are other regulatory uh, initiatives coming this year from other orders of government as we try to roll out, which is not our own three stream, uh, you know, our own waste initiatives um, and not even completely. We're only in very early stage of phase one. Um, and I feel, you know, I, I think the timing of this feels very rushed um, and I'm not entirely comfortable with supporting this at this time. Thank you, Councillor Tang. 
And now I will go to you, Councillor Stevenson. I apologize for cutting you off. Oh, right no, there. no, that's just fine. There, there are no bad guys in this conversation. And, you know, I really appreciate the, the discussion uh, from my colleagues. Uh, ensuring the efficacy of our waste management program is, is paramount um, and certainly a really important consideration. Um, I think for me, uh, this amendment was really seeking to strike the balance so that we did have more flexibility to respond to unique sites um, that, you know, adaptive reuse of buildings, uh, new mixed use buildings going up that again, I think are really well aligned with our, our city building goals. Um, but appreciate that there's, there's ways, um, you know, if this amendment were to fail, other ways to continue this conversation. Um, I think Council Paquette had a great point around quantifying some of the challenges or pinch points that this can create. Uh, I do still think it's it's worth doing. I would encourage my colleagues to support it, but appreciate the conversation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Stevenson, we have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is defeated. Okay, we are moving on to uh, my motion next. So I'm going to have, is, is, Amber, is the mayor back? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay, so then it would go to Councillor Prince Pay. Are you available to take the chair? I am. I have the chair. Oh, my apologies. Oh. The mayor has just returned. Oh, perfect. All right, back. Sorry, you're back then. Sorry, <laughs> Councillor Prince Pay. Okay. All right. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yes. So this motion is really uh, not changing anything. This is more related to the implementation of the bylaw. So one of the things that in discussion with administration that came up, because I was really compelled actually at the urban planning committee with some of the speakers that spoke about accessibility and the built form. And if our intention is to have a built form that allows a, an envelope and then flexibility within that envelope, you know, why were we allowing or disallowing career attached to garages? And through the discussion with administration, uh, I understood that it is discretionary so that it can allow for things such as accessibility factors to be taken into consideration. So that if somebody can't get to a rear attached garage due to mobility, that there is options for them. But I also flagged with administration that I was concerned that even though it is discretionary, it's not obvious within the bylaw and how variances work. So this is really about uh, providing educational tools to the public on when they're, how they are able to uh, develop a rear attached garages within the zoning bylaw and when that discretion would be used and what kind of conditions would be needed. So it's really about uh, that information, uh, not changing anything that's already a regulation in our bylaws as we approved today. Thank you. Okay, to administration uh, is the uh, subsequent clear and be done within the existing resources and the uh, and the timeline for uh, bringing it back yes to all okay thank you uh, questions colleagues seeing oh sorry Councillor Salvador go ahead please yeah thanks um, just briefly uh, I guess I see are there opportunities where this can apply to other other potential variances like it just seems specific to rear attached garages um maybe to the mover uh totally totally support the idea of providing you know more resources and opportunities to to share that type of information um but why specifically the rear attached garages and are there like other other things that could be included in i don't know like a how to navigate variances type resource And you're muted. Thank you. 
So I, I don't disagree with you. And I think administration is already doing that work. The reason I was conspe- compelled specifically with the attached garages piece is, is around the accessibility argument and the inclusivity. I think the way you know, the bylaw is written is, is great and it's a lot more accessible, but there's still spaces that I can imagine someone who uh, recently has mobility need changes wouldn't necessarily be able to navigate. So I was just really compelled by that. Uh, those speakers at Urban Planning Committee, uh, it would definitely not be limited to, and I'm sure there's other variances that administration would identify in the same way, but I felt like this was an important one um, because I don't, I don't want folks to to not be able to understand that there's an opportunity um, from an accessibility perspective to have that option. Okay, okay that's helpful. Um, and maybe just to administration, uh, if this were to to pass, um, would this be coming back as a report then to Urban Planning Committee? I'm just trying to understand what what form this would take. No, that's not the intent. Um, this would be to provide some resources on online or wherever the case might be. Uh, and we can close the loop, so to speak, with uh, council through a memo, perhaps, would be my suggestion. It looks like Councillor okay. Rutherford's agreeable. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I actually was confused about the due date as well. So the memo works for, would be, sorry, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Um, no, that's, that makes sense um and i yeah i just i would hope that that can maybe take the form of like a resource bank or some sort of guide that's available online so i'm sure there are other things that um will be added to that in the future thanks okay thank you council salvador so instead of urban planning will be a memo okay okay any other questions colleagues seeing none uh anyone to speak Councilor Rutherford to close. Mr. Mayor, before you do that, could we just have the motion updated so it doesn't say that it's returning to Urban Planning Committee? Uh, I think that part was taken out. We'll remove it from the record. Oh, it's still there? There you go. It's been removed. Good. All right. Okay. Now, uh, Councilor Rutherford to close. Nothing further. Okay. Please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. We have all the votes. Oh. I just need to recall the There you go. Now you can. Yeah. yeah. Everyone? Now we have all the votes. Okay, display the votes, please. All right, that is carried. Okay, now we are on to uh, Councillor Rice, seconded by Councillor Cartmel, subsequent motion 26. Um, thanks. So um, this motion is to, uh, is not to make any change for the bylaw itself. Uh, is actually to looking for the information to s- support the implementation of approved bylaw, and it's specifically to respond to the um, questions and concerns we heard and uh, during the public hearing. And in terms of when the infill development happened in the mature neighborhood and what is our current mature neighborhood compa- infrastructure capacity, including like drainage system, including water system, and including sewage system, and to get that ready and take, uh, get that ready and to support uh, the implementation of bylaw. And because I think with this information provided to council, we will have, based on this information, we can take that proactive approach to really look at our city's current situation across the entire city for the infrastructure capacity services level. And then for us to better prepare for any future and development in the neighborhood. Uh, I think that is a 
just a mo just intention for this motion. And uh, do we know the due date? Oh, the date uh, original I had is Q3 2024. And because by that way, and we will almost close to one year to know the information and to support um, okay. what's the needs okay. accommodated to the Thank development. You. Thank you. And to administration from um, uh, clarity, resources required, and uh, uh, due date. Any? Mr. Mayor, uh, just in terms of the motion, uh, I think we just got provided some additional context around uh, what is meant by infrastructure, uh, which is water, sewer, stormwater. Uh, and to that, I would just like to make a note uh, that during the public hearing, questions of administration, uh, Susan Ansel, the director of One Water from EPCOR, noted uh, that infrastructure improvements wouldn't be required to support ZBR uh, and its approval. Uh, and that work was done through the analysis to support the bylaw, and then that in January of this of 2024, at utility committee, they'll be bringing forward a um, annual operating report, which includes the modernization of their standards, which is being undertaken to support zoning bylaw renewal. So, um, I guess to the mover, I guess is that sufficient information, or are we looking for more? Councilor Rice, does uh, what has been shared by the administration does that satisfy? This, because this, according to them, infrastructure improvements are not required. Uh, I understand that, like drainage, water, and sewer system is under APCO. APCO has some like plan to do it, but for the community roadways, and but that is our cities, right? Correct. So for the, the roads itself, yeah. um, as the city redevelops and develops over time. Uh, those requirements are attached to development permissions or their development approvals, uh, which will require upgrades uh, depending on the scope and scale of the project uh, being proposed. And f in addition to that, there is, uh, Ken can add some context around uh, growth management and our infrastructure capacity and how we supply that through our achievement or our marching towards city plans goals. Um, so Kent, I don't know if you want to add to that. Um, so, and if that's his case, I, th I think this motion look, look at a different angle. It's just uh, look at the information about that. We can base on app course work. We can base on cities uh, for the for community those ways work and to, the, to do the planning. So this is a uh, look at a different angle. Can we plan proactively? and say, uh, is there any infrastructure improvement needed? And what's the cost? What's the preparation we need it? And for all the development, is that, is that working? So, Councillor, that, that work is undergoing um, right now, like the proactive planning is part of the growth management framework work. Um, so the, the, the zoning bylaw that's, that's been adopted um, doesn't require any infrastructure upgrades, but you're right in terms of the city administration is looking at proactive. What do we need in the future to grow? Um, and so the work is starting in the nodes and corridors identified in the city plan, and that'll be reflected then through district plans as well. So, so that work is, is occurring. Okay, so what I hear from administration that this work, this motion, subsequent motion is redundant. Correct, uh, in the overall uh, implementation of city plan and uh, it. having it described, the, the planning system might be uh, Got it. Yeah, redundant. So, Councillor Rice, you want to debate this or you want to withdraw it? What do, you, what do you desire? I, I, <clears throat> I, I don't know. And then because I still feel there's some gap information there, and but in, if we can get all this information by court three, 2024, uh, is that because other work and even for the strategic planning for other work, and then we will not get this info. I just need simple answer. You want to debate it or you want to withdraw it? We debate it, we'll go to the next process step. I, I will I will debate. Okay, good. All right. So we have a motion on the floor on the on the due date. Is you okay? Could I due date? Uh, would the um, would be, would it be 
be open to being uh, converted to a memo where we could um, list that. That might okay. be a yeah. memo. Memo okay. is okay. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay. All right. So, any questions, colleagues? Any questions, Councillor Paquette? Go ahead, please. Yeah, I just want to clarify. The uh, it's now a memo, and uh, how does that work? I'm just curious how to plan infrastructure improvements that will be needed as a result of implementation when this is going to be headed by EPCOR. Is that the administration council? Yes, I think you're the only ones who can answer that. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of components that are uh, city driven as well. Um, and we'll work with EPCOR to include any of the pertinent information that's required um, in, in that memo. Okay, um, all right. Any, any changes I would make would just be being picky about language, so I'll leave it. Um, as a memo, um, I believe it's in order, otherwise I would have said something else. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Any more questions? Okay, uh, now Councilor is to close. Nothing to hide. Okay, so please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Okay, now we are on to uh, Councillor Stevenson, second by Councillor Principe, subsequent motion 27. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, yes, our very last one of the night. Thank you all so much uh, for, for the robust discussion. Um, you know, we were speaking earlier about uh, maybe some concerns that, that the number of dwellings is, is uh, too many. I actually worry that it's too few. Um, there was a similar restriction on the maximum number of dwelling units in, in the old RF3 zone. And it created a number of challenges uh, when there were larger sites or, again, with sort of unique housing configurations. So, you know, again, I want to give the new bylaw time to, to see how it performs. So this isn't proposing any immediate changes whatsoever. It's just asking administration when they do come back with their planned one-year review report uh, to include an analysis of the eight dwelling maximum to the RS small-scale residential zone. Um, and if required, if uh, you know there, we're seeing a lot of variances or we're seeing a lot of projects not be viable as a result, um, or if there are special considerations that need to be considered uh, for, for larger sites, uh, that that would come back to us in the one-year report. Happy for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Any questions? Seeing none, anyone to speak? No, oh, sorry, Councillor Rice, you have questions? Go ahead, please. Uh, so the new bylaw will be implemented start uh, January 2024. And then for the one year report, so just want to get, get clarification. So for the one year review, only review this one pieces or we have overall review for the entire bylaw? It's the entire bylaw and we'll of course be looking at certain aspects of the bylaw as well. So that review will be one year overall review for the bylaw, for the new bylaw implementation. That's correct. We will be looking at things like variances, um, maybe SDAB appeals uh, where uh, applicants are letting us know parts of the bylaws not working, things like that. Okay, uh, then the next question to the mover. Uh, why we are looking for the one year right now and we are, so to me this, this motion is planning for the future. And then why we only pick up this eight, the willing maximum in RS? Uh, 
That's the, uh, to the best of my understanding, it's the only zone where that eight dwelling maximum uh, applies. Okay, so the intention is to give the wording here and is to remove this recreation or expand the recreation. So the two possible potential options here based on this review and we'll come back to QT 2025. Yeah, so, so um, you know, the, the motion does say if required. So it could be that the analysis comes back and says, actually, you know, the eight dwelling maximum is working very well. We're not seeing any issues. We recommend keeping it in place, in which case that would that would be fine. Um, uh, this just suggests that if there, there are barriers or there are issues that are being created, that there would be options um, to either remove or, or expand it as necessary. Okay, so then my next question go back to administration. If, if administration has a plan and to do the overall review, and then this motion and could be one piece of that, right? And why we need a separate motion for that? The motion's helpful to provide clarity that there's an interest in this particular topic, but the one-year overview will look at um, how the bylaw's working, where maybe common amendments or uh, common variances might be needed, or what might be what feedback we might be hearing from community. Um, so uh, we can accommodate this uh, in the time that's noted here. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Principal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a question, I guess, probably for the mover and administration. The way uh, now that I read this uh, subsequent, it's not suggesting that there may possibly fewer, like a smaller maximum. Is it just about increasing the maximum? Yeah, so um, that is a, an amendment that could be made to this in terms of looking at options to uh, uh, decrease, remove, or expand the regulation if required. Um, that's not my interest, uh, to be honest. So, um, but, but that would be a more fulsome approach if you were interested in potentially reducing that number as well. I would be interested in that just in order to have just a more rounded report, just to get a better understanding. Yeah, perhaps the easiest way would just be to say and provide options for amendments if required. So we could delete to remove or expand this regulation. That would uh, be good with me. I could support it then. Yeah. Sure, sure that sounds good to me. Uh, I would consider that friendly if the rest of the assembly does. So just deleting um to remove or expand this regulation yeah before i do that i want to get a sense from uh, jamie because we did defeat a motion a subsequent motion earlier that would have actually reduced the number of units to right so if this is a is no would that be would this be in order Yeah, we're feeling up here that that's probably too similar. Too similar? So you can't, yeah, so you can't ask for in this as the for reduction of... Yeah, Mr. Mayor, at least when it was an expansion, it was the other direction and actually a different motion. If now it's just simply to amend it, you really are starting to overlap what was originally done, already decided by council. Yeah, so if you want to explore reducing, then... Uh, that will be problematic. That was already a part of it. That yes. already, because that yes, part sir. is already defeated. So we can't do that, sorry. It'll be out of order. Councilor Principe, that'll be out of order. Uh, yeah, thank you, I heard, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Seeing none, uh, anyone to speak? Councillor Stevenson to close. No, thank you. Okay, please vote.
Sorry, we're just trying to get the vote loaded. Give us one moment. There we go. Please vote now. I mean, yes. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Prince do you have your uh, subsequent ready? Uh, I, thanks for asking. Yeah, no, I do not. Uh, I was in conversation with administration and I am not comfortable of making it at this time. Okay, no worries. All right, so that is it for all the subsequent. Uh, I don't... Can I get, get my yellow page? <laughs> Sorry, I put it somewhere. <laughs> Still. Okay. Uh, note some motions or motions without customary notice. See it? No? Uh, we are adjourned at 8.16 after six days of this probably be the, other than a budget uh, council meeting, this probably be the longest uh, meeting yeah, that we had. Yeah. Up there, okay. Are we adjourned? Yeah, we are adjourned. Yeah, we are adjourned. Yeah. And once again, administration to everyone, thank you so much.